Before you watch this exclusive interview with Andrew Tate, there are a few things you need to know. Andrew is taking a massive risk agreeing to do this five hour and 20 minute interview because he is still under house arrest and under investigation, which means anything he says can and will be held against him. Now, what did we talk about in this interview? We talked about his experience in jail with Tristan. Untold stories, religion, how this impacted his life, how emotional was it, was he scared? You're going to see a side of him you've never seen before. We definitely talked about BBC. BBC is not going to like this interview for many reasons. You'll see why. It's a total of 15 hours that we spend with Andrew and Tristan at his compound, so a lot was covered. Having said that, there's about 45 minutes of this interview that will be censored due to the topic of discussion being around his investigation and Romania. So if you want to see that 45 minute portion, you will need to text the word Tate to 310-340-1132 or click on a link below to subscribe to an email for that to be sent to you after his investigation or indictment is public. Having said that, brace for impact. You're about to be valued by the one and only Andrew Tate. I'm winning too well. I'm scared by the incompetence of these clowns. If this guy is so innocent, how can they get you to go to the dungeon for 92 days? How can they put you on house arrest? How can they do all this stuff? They could do this to you. They could do this to anyone. They do it to you or you or me or any man watching this. Any man watching this. I wake up instinctually at 5 a.m. Because that's when they raid your house. I wake up at like 4.59. I just fucking shoot up. Empires have fallen so many times it's true. because they thought they could get away with murder. And then eventually people said, listen, stop. You're not going to do this to me anymore. We're not, we're not going to take a stand. When I destroyed the BBC, my brother was celebrating. I knew. I was like, Tristan, no. You don't beat the British Broadcasting Corporation to make fools of them like this without some new bullshit. This is where their argument has leaks in it. I'm genuinely looking for guidance here. Am I supposed to roll over and fucking lose? You sincerely don't know what the right thing is. I sincerely have decided that the best thing I can do is stay true to my faith and stay true to God and tell the truth and fight. So a lot has changed since the last time we sat down with Andrew Tate. Last time we sat down with him, uh, you were the most uh, Googled man on earth. Uh, today, effective last two days, you are now the most Googled woman on earth. Correct. According to your Twitter profile. Correct. And uh, uh, we wanted to make sure after the BBC interview, you made certain requests. Yeah. You said you want moving forward there to be a $50,000 fee when people sit down to do an interview. So we wanted to make sure the ESG score for this interview would be very high. We got you a $50,000 Target gift card. I appreciate that very much. For people Thank in you. America will appreciate Perfect. I need that. A whole new wardrobe and then now. you also said cookies. So Adam got you some taste cookies Amazing. to make sure yes. we match that. And then we, we one did, for your brother as well. We I did bring a Bud Light, yes. but unfortunately, Vinny finished it on the way here. Vinny, you know we we. Uh, I'm already a girl. I don't need Bud Light. Yeah. So we respect that. So, but anyways, look. Uh, a lot's obviously changed from last time to this time. Last time we sat down was around nine months ago. Yeah. You had, at the time, been uh, deplatformed from every social media platform. We came out here, we sat down, we spoke. The Matrix was attacking you. You were saying, Matrix attacking me, Matrix attacking me. Yeah. From then on, uh, uh, Musk buys Twitter in October. Yep. He then reinstates you. Correct. In one day, I believe you get a million followers on Twitter. You're upwards of a seven million today. Yep. Every other account's taken down. I think even Tristan was taken down off of Instagram. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, the arrest comes, the lover boy, all these articles. Yeah. And Vice releases the hit piece uh, on you guys. You know, they're saying what they're saying, and I'm sure we're going to get some comments on that. Yeah. The initial 30-day lockup was extended twice, 92 days in the dungeon. Yeah. Uh, we had a chance to speak with one of your lawyers, Tina uh, Glandian, on February 24th. It was a great conversation we had with her. Then eventually you're released, you and your brother come out and you specifically make it clear that you did 7,417 push-ups. Correct. Very impressive. You received letters from uh, thousands of fans, you read the Quran on a daily basis. Yep. At no point was any charges, uh, uh, anything official charge, it was all allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Yep. And while you were away, a new star was born, Dylan Mulvaney, which I'm sure you're familiar with. 
from there on, a lot of comments were made. Uh, comments of people that supported you, comments of people that didn't support you. Yeah. Logan Paul said by 2023, he will not have a sliver of relevance, is what he said. KSI said Andrew Tate snitched on himself after getting racial by Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Destiny said Andrew Tate has been arrested for rape charges in a, a country he specifically lives in to avoid rape charges because he was uh, beefing with a autistic child on the internet. I think he's referencing uh, the great Greta. Yeah. Matt Bernstein advocated to get you kicked off of Instagram. I'm sure. And uh, he's part of the Blue Pill community, a big famous makeup artist. Yeah. Ethan Klein said, uh, and that's why I call him Andrew, the human trafficker, he sent me a cease and desist threatening to sue me for defamation for saying he's a human trafficker. Yeah. What else am I supposed to call someone that buys and sells human beings after their will? Tate, the human trafficker. NBC in January 2023 said Andrew Tate said he broke a woman's jaw and that his business was a scam ahead of Romanian charges. Yeah. Rolling Stone said uh, meet Andrew Tate, ex-kickboxer, red-pilling the angry young men of America. These are people that didn't support you. Now, these are the people that supported you. Tucker Carlson, he comes out and he says on Full Send Podcast, first of all, he's really smart. Yeah. The spirit that animates Andrew Tate is very clear and very obvious, and it's not a malicious spirit at all. Andrew Tate's core message is respect for yourself. Act like you're worth something. Yep. Achieve something. Do something. Get the fuck off the couch. Put down the porn. Go do something with your life. That's the greatest message that anyone could give. It tells you everything about the people in charge who say, uh, who say that's threatening. What is that threatening? The same people who live on the pedo island with Epstein and the same people that were friends with Harvey Weinstein were claiming to protect women by rebuking Tate. Yep. That's Tucker Carlson. Yep. Pierce Morgan, who originally when he went on, it was very combative. Correct. It was a very good interview, entertaining, but always, it was also interesting to see him trying to push you. And then he flips and he says, this is getting ridiculous. Romanian authorities must either charge him yep. and his brother if they have actual evidence of crimes or release them. Musk obviously supported by releasing, restoring your account like this. Jake Shields said people are freaking out about young boys looking up to Andrew Tate, but totally fine with young girls looking up to Cardi B and the Kardashians. And obviously, Aiden Ross, Red Bull community, Joe Rogan. I can go on and on and on yep. about a lot of things that's being said. We watched the BBC interview. And we'll talk about BBC here in a minute because I have some questions on that as well. But the first thing I want to ask you is, you know, nine months, where we were at then, September, to where we are today, a lot's changed. How do you feel with everything that's going on? And tell us a little bit about your current state today. Yeah, there's a very strange sense of terror that comes from knowing exactly what's going to happen to you. There's a strange sense of calm that comes from it also, but in the middle of the night when you can't sleep, sometimes you feel happy knowing what they're trying to do to you and sometimes you feel terrified knowing what they're trying to do to you. I think I'm very happy every single podcast I did previous to this, I hammered the point home and I made it very clear that they had the intention of trying to put me in jail. I said, there's three lives. They try and cancel you and slander you and destroy your name. They don't just want you to disappear from the internet. They want you to disappear from the internet in a cloud of shame. They have to shame you which is why they chose the crimes they did for me and it's why they usually choose the crimes they choose because it's heinous. They want to shame you and they want you to disappear with your head facing the ground and never pop up again. Obviously they attempted to cancel me and I became more famous than ever before. I even said to you on your podcast and I said on other podcasts, I said I think they made a mistake. I think when you have power and you overuse it, you, what happens is a rebellion. That's how a revolution starts. When you have power, you have to be very, very careful with how you use that power. The second you overuse it, there's a re revolution, like, and we're in Romania, so they know all about that. That's exactly what happens. And I, I said at the time, I think I was a mistake. I think they made a big mistake canceling me the way they did. And then the second time, the second life, which I described is they try and put you in jail for no reason. Here we are in the current scenario. I knew it was gonna happen. And the third one is they put a bullet in your head. So we're gonna have to see how the second life plays out. And yeah, I mean, when this is all over and I win the court case and I get the not guilty, I, I won't be smiling. I'll be walking out the courtroom with my head on a swivel. <laughs> That's the kind of life I'm living now. I'm going to be thinking, oh, okay, so their second attempt failed. Now what? Like, do I want to fly private anymore? <laughs> do I want to go that place anymore? Do I, you start to think about yeah. these things. Like, do I want to do these things? A lot of billionaires die, dying in plane crashes. It's strange. So it's scary regardless of how it plays out. And I guess you just have to go with the punches and, and, and see where it lands. And God has a plan for, for me and for all of us. And we're just going to see how it ends up. Full disclosure, you don't have any suicidal thoughts. I want to make it very clear. And I make it clear on absolutely every single podcast. I would never kill myself. I don't care what they say. I don't care what video they show you. 
Never under any circumstance would I kill myself. It's haram. Never. I don't care if they put me in back in the dungeon, solitary confinement by myself for the rest of my human years. I would never kill myself ever, ever. So if that ever happens, God forbid, do not believe whatever garbage they tell you. The chance of me killing myself is precisely zero. And you had this complete level of certainty that this is exactly how it would play out. You've said this on umpteen podcasts that yeah. this is what how this is their this is their agenda. They have to damage my influence. They have to damage my influence. They can't sit there and let me be influential because I'm saying things that they don't like me saying. And there are people sitting around going, he's saying things counter to our message and counter to our narrative. Get rid of it. And they have a pretty standardized playbook. And this is probably one of the first times in history where their playbook just isn't working. Cancel him. Well, he's still around. Oh, well, lie about him in the news. Just say he touches mm -hmm. chicks. Well, no one believes it. Oh, all the comments are on his side. Everyone's calling us liars. Okay, then do it again. Then do it again. Make up a new girl. Then do it again. Find someone else. Yeah. And they keep attacking me with the same weapons, but the bullets are bouncing off. And that doesn't give me a sense of calm. That doesn't make me think, ha, 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 I'm invincible. It makes me think, uh-oh. <laughs> it makes me think, uh-oh, because human life is cheap at the top. It's very cheap. Does it make you want to sit on the sidelines and be quiet and just kind of live a life with your family, your kids? Does it make you want to do that? Maybe, maybe all these attention is actually not a good thing. It's interesting because sometimes I analyze myself and think, why don't I just do that? Why don't I just disappear? You know, I don't need money. I don't need fame. Why don't I just disappear? And then you have to, I was saying this to my brother and he was like, well, Genghis Khan didn't need Vienna. Some people are just wired that way. <laughs> like Vienna's a long way from Kathmandu. Sometimes that's just uh, the way it is, or Ulaanbaatar, I apologize, the capital of Mongolia. That's just the way some people are. If I see injustice, and if I see things which I believe to be false, I feel like I am obligated to say the truth. I can't explain why, even if at my own detriment. What am I doing this for? Like, it's, it's to the detriment of my life. And I've had these conversations at length with the people close to me, and, and, and we're all saying the same thing. It's always been the same way. Humanity's always been the same way. There's been a select, fault, small, few good men up against evil, and evil always outnumbers you. Evil always has more money than you. They always have more power and more influence than you. If you look at, if you play any video game, when you get to the end boss, he always has more life than you. He always has more hit points, but you're the good guy. And it's kind of like, it's, it's never been any different at any point in human history. There's been the good guys up against the forces of evil, whatever they were of the time. And you've always been outnumbered and you've always been supposed to lose. So you consider yourself the good guy in this situation? I think that truth is instilled by God in all of us. And I think if you tell the truth, you're a good person. So who do you think is the bad guy? You know, everyone uses they, them, them, they're after me. Who's they? Who's the bad guy? Well, instead of saying who, I will say, what I will start by saying is what they do. And what they do is they control information. And we now live in an information society. And by controlling information, they control how people think and act and react to things. That's all they have to do. They have to control information. And they have to be very selective with what they allow you to talk about and what they allow you to discuss and what they don't. And once they can do that, they can keep you bickering about garbage. And they can control the sensitive information. And then they run the world. So having all the information controlled and having this hard barrier on what can be discussed that's how they can purport absolute fallacies. I think now it's been a couple of years, we can probably talk about it. They psyoped the world into believing they should be afraid of the common cold. They, they psyoped the world into this. And if you think about how difficult that would be to do, how difficult would it be to psyop the entire population of Earth? Well, what you do is you just lie on repeat and you don't allow anyone to say anything counter to it without hurting them the same way I've been hurt. And you just psyop them. It's actually amazing because now I use that exact same psyop on people. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So when I sit with someone who's not matrix-minded, when I sit with someone who is matrix-minded, like when the BBC walked in here, I'm like, do you all have your vaccinations? Social, <laughs> <laughs> Social distancing. Did you actually ask? 100%. <laughs> Social distancing, please. <laughs> and they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, how am I crazy? Two years ago, you were telling me to do this. Now when I repeat your own worldview to you, I'm crazy. Well, if I'm crazy, guess what? You're a fucking liar because you lied the whole time. So either you're a liar or I'm not. You know, how could I be nuts? Put your fucking mask on. If I ever talk to any of these clowns again, they're going to be fully masked up. And I, and I refuse. I don't care if you've had two booster jabs. No, I want all six. All six injections. I want paperwork. Or get oh, fucked. Oh, you're not coming in the house. <laughs> I'm scared of COVID. It's dangerous. I believe the mainstream media. I'm scared. Th this word you keep using, PSYOP, I've never heard this. What, it's short for psychological operations? Correct. Break that down. What, what exactly is a PSYOP? Yeah, a PSYOP is, is, is the matrix as a whole. 
It's like psychological, psychological operations are constant. They constantly decide how they want you to think and what they can do to make you believe that, right? And there's a whole bunch of them they do. But it starts with tolerance. That's what I don't like about this whole guise of tolerance. It's not that I'm an intolerant person. It's not that I'm a bad person. It's not that I want to hurt other people. But when they keep pushing tolerance, what they're trying to say is have no standards or barriers or parameters for anything. That's what they want. You have to be tolerant. Tolerant of what? Tolerant of having your shop set on fire. Tolerant of your kids being taught things you don't want. Tolerant of crime. Tolerant of your house being broken. Like, tolerant of what? You're not allowed any hard barrier or any hard parameters as a man anymore. That's why they push tolerance. That's the beginning of it. That's the first stage. Once you accept absolute tolerance, well, then it's the end, isn't it? I'm tolerant of everything. I'll eat the bugs. Sure. You'll tolerate everything. I'll tolerate everything. I'm tolerant. Sure. So when I, I say things like I'm intolerant of certain things and people think that's bad, no, you need to have standards and parameters. And that's one of the reasons they also attack me. I, I say that men should be allowed to have standards and parameters in a relationship and in their lives. We should be allowed to decide who we dis want to marry and we should have standards for her. They have standards for us, we should allow ourselves to have standards for her. We should have standards in what we'll accept from a government and standards in what we'll accept from a police force. We should have standards as men, but they're trying to erode all of that because once that's gone, then your brain is completely empty. And then once your brain's empty, they can just plug in the slave program and then, then it's over, right? You're, to you're a tolerant person. You're a tolerant person. Good. You're a good slave. Slaves are exceptionally tolerant. So the shirt you wear is what, escape the slave mind? Resist the slave mind. Resist the slave mind. Resist. What does that mean it's exactly? A, it's, a, it's a better word. Resist. Resist. Right? But I, I want to do this before we get into because we got we got five hours. Ago. We got plenty of time to get into a lot of different topics. So one, I do want to talk about BBC. Yep. Uh, the handling of the interview, I want to get your thoughts on it. I know there's been reactions, but I want to go a little bit deeper into it yep. because I want to compare how your start with the interview with BBC started versus Philip Schofield versus, versus Musk. I got all the first questions, we'll cover that. Yeah. I want to talk about media, I want to talk about your evolution of your faith, yeah. atheist, Christian, Muslim, yeah. and then some of the things that's going on with politics right now, you know, maybe a little bit of Romania, you know, Trump, we'll, we'll cover what you're talking about with different things. It's funny you're saying uh, monopoly on power, monopoly on power, if you abuse it, now YouTube's turning around and saying, hey, you can talk about the election. We're no longer gonna give the strike. So that doesn't work forever. Yeah. First thing I wanna talk about, I think the audience would like to know, for you and Tristan, 92 days in the dungeon, you know, you're in jail, yeah. your, your experience in there, we keep hearing about it, we read about it, but what was it like for you guys being in there? So I'll start by saying, and I have to make this clear, that the staff in the jail were exceptionally nice to me. Um, they were very apologetic. The, the vibe was apologetic. Nobody was really treating me like a criminal. There were a few guys who were icy cold, I guess you could call them. They liked to think of themselves as professional, but they were just inhuman. But over time, they warmed up, and I was exceptionally nice also to all the staff. Jail was terrible. I'm gonna start by saying jail was terrible, and I was miserable inside of the jail cell. It's a good thing depression isn't real, because I would have been depressed. But I think in life that you get what you give, and I wanted to feel happier, so I tried my very best to make people happy. So when the old lady would bring me my food, I would sit and say, oh, this is the best food I've ever had. I've never had food this good. Did you cook this? I thought yesterday was the best, but you managed to surpass it again. How'd you do it? What's the magic ingredient? And I ended up making friends with them. Like, like I had grandmas in there, the old ladies cooking the food. And by trying to make people happy and smile all the time, I started to feel a lot happier. But it's kind of scary. And I think the scariest thing about jail was the uncertainty of it all. If they would have said to me, you're in jail for 92 days, or even five years, you got five years, cool, I do my time. But when you're nabbed and thrown in a cell without charge, you're like, well, how long, am I, is this my life? Is this it now? Is this the end of the story? I'm just in this cell. And I was picked up on 29th of December. I went through this quick court case. Like I said, I'm inside of the, the jurisdiction of Romania, so I have to be very careful with what I say because the case is ongoing and we're in Romania and I can't leave Romania. But obviously Romanian court is in Romanian by law. So you're marched into this room, everyone speaks a language you don't understand for 15 minutes, and then you're marched off to jail. You're like, what even happened? What, what even happened to me? And they said, oh, here's the paper that explains it. I was like, that's in Romanian. And they said, oh, don't worry, you'll get a translation to English by law. I was like, okay, that's fine. But because I was picked up on the 29th of December and there was New Year's Eve and holidays, that I, it was two weeks before I even knew why I was in jail. Two solid weeks I'm in jail. I, no one told me in English why I'm in jail. I had no idea what the- Can they do that? By law, you get it on the piece of paper in English, but it's translation, it's holiday, we need to find a translator, right. there's a delay. And you speak zero Romanian. Zero. So they said, oh yeah, human trafficking. I'm like, what, what do you mean human trafficking? Who? When? 
What? What is, what is this? It took, took two weeks before I finally got a piece of paper and then I realized what garbage it truly was. I mean, I knew it was garbage, but I was like, this is complete garbage. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I have endless stories from jail. It was, it was certainly... It, I, think, I don't think jail teaches you much new. What it does is confirm everything you already know. It confirms everything you know about the reality of the outside world, that you need to be physically strong so that you're not attacked by others and mentally strong so you're not attacked by yourself. You need to, you learn who's on your side and who isn't. You learn who's a coward and who's not. You learn who's an opportunist and who isn't. Your, your circle, you certainly learn a lot about the people around you when you go to a jail cell, that's for sure. But I remember it was New Year's Eve. When I, when I was first picked up on the 29th of December, I was very sure I'd be out in 24 hours. I was like, there's no way they're gonna keep me. For, for what? Like, this, there's not, this doesn't make sense. So finally New Year's Eve rolls around and uh, I'm sitting in the, in the jail cell by myself. And in Romanian jail, you don't leave the room. It's not like an American jail where there's a yard or anything. You're stuck in the room. It's three by four and that's your existence. You just stay in the room. Are you by yourself? 24 or you hours a day. At the beginning, I was by myself. Um, and you're stuck in this room and I'm sitting there. It's New Year's Eve. And there's a very faint speaker, maybe way down the hallway. The guards must have been having a little party for New Year's Eve. And there's this awful song. It's called, it's called the Ketchup Song. I don't know if you know what it is. I don't want to sing it, but it goes, ah, hey, aha, ah, hey, ah, did, 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 that yes. super annoying song. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and I, I know it's New Year's Eve because the fireworks start going off. And I'm looking out my tiny window, and I can just hear in the, the very long distance from the end of the hallway, ah, hey, aha, ah, hey. <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking out the window like, this can't be it. This can't be the end of my life. Even the cockroaches all over the walls didn't celebrate. There was maybe, there was maybe 15 cockroaches on the walls, right? And when, when it struck 12 and the fireworks went off, I kind of like, well, who's my friends in here? The cockroaches. I looked at them, even they didn't move. I was like, well, that's New Year's. It's funny because before that, a couple days before that, me and Tristan were discussing, do we want to do New Year's in Dubai? Do we want to go Courcheval? Shall we go Miami? We're all arguing. Oh, that will be boring. No, that's too far. We had all these grandeur plans. Oh, finally we decided to go to Dubai. We were in Czech Republic at the time and we decided to go to Dubai and I said, let's stop in Romania so I can repack a suitcase. So that's jet, it, that's the only reason. That's the only reason. So Jet left Prague, landed in Romania. My jet was still on the runway. Came here overnight to pack a suitcase, spent the night, spoke to Greta with the pizza box and it's 5 a.m. they got me before I flew back to Dubai. So that was my- The amazing. infamous Greta pizza box situation. Greta pizza box. How yeah. much you think it, there, there's anything linked to Greta? Is there anything, uh, because the timing of it, yeah, I don't think she specifically said that. Of course. Me, but there are certainly people within the Matrix machine that you can't attack without catching flack for. There are certain, there's certainly protected people. It's absolutely not really a club. And you're either in the club or you're outside of the club. She's certainly in the club, right? So if, you're, if, you, are, if you say certain things about certain people or you get a beef with X amount of people or you discredit a certain person, they're going to try very hard to teach you a lesson for doing that. And you can see very clearly who's in the club and who isn't by the, the Philip Schofield situation. This is a man who has groomed boys and had sex with them, but he's in the club. All of the media headlines after two days are, let's have compassion, feel sorry for him, uh, his mother's upset. They've attacked me for 14 months, day after day after day, and they relentlessly attack me. Nobody talks about my mental health, nobody gives a shit how I feel. I, did, I didn't do any of the things he did. He's actually done things. I haven't done anything. But when you're in the club, you're protected by the media. And when you're not in the club, you're attacked by the media. And that's how it simply works. You're either on our side or you're not. But to join their side, you have to sell your soul. Your sanity has a price. You have to, your sanity is for sale. You have to sell it. You have to come along with your sanity, take out your mind and say, here you go. Take my sanity. I'll take 35 million. Yes, that is a woman. Yes, protect me. It's insane. And the reason these people join these clubs is because they know they're doing bad things and they feel like they need protection. The reason I stand up and argue against all this shit is because I know I, have, I don't have skeletons in my closet. You think I'd be on the internet talking like I talk and fighting the Matrix if I had skeletons in my closet if I was actually a bad person? I've been investigated as deeply as a person can be investigated by multiple federal agencies for 14 months. I was locked in a jail cell and 2,000 people I know was called. My barber, my old housekeeper from when I lived in England nine years ago, my, my gardener I used to have in another country I lived in. Everybody was called and people were offered bribes effectively. The media are calling girls saying, if you have a bad story to tell about Andrew, we, we can pay you $30,000 if you have a bad story. That's a bribe, that's a bribe. And they still couldn't find anyone. Still, 
I've been investigated to a deeper level than 99.9% .9 of people you cross on the street. And they're saying I'm guilty and I'm a bad person? You put, you go get 20 men off the street and put them through what I've been through. You'll find more crimes than you've ever found with me. Absolute clown world, it's insane. And if I was part of the club, none of this would be happening. The media would be on my side, they wouldn't be hitting me this hard, they wouldn't be lying about me. All I had to do was sell my soul and sell my sanity and I refused and they're trying to punish me for it. That's what's happening. It's funny you say this. Uh, um, when uh, we watched the BBC interview with uh, Musk, right? And he goes up and the guy opens up the question with, why'd you agree to do this interview? He says, well, I don't know, what's the name of the BBC? And he's trying to mock them and all this stuff. And there's a part of it where, you know, he calls them out for the mistakes they made. Yeah. And if you go to the bottom of the interview on BBC, you'll see comment sections saying, why'd you cut that out? Because yeah. Musk puts it on Twitter, but they didn't put it in the interview. Yeah. Then you watch the interview with, the, uh, 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 with you. The first question they asked you was, uh, uh, what's the first question? Hey, you've been accused of serious uh, crimes. rape or something like that. Uh, uh, you know, right off the bat, they ask that question of you. And then you see the interview, Lucy Williamson, I believe her first question was, you're facing some very serious allegations. Have you raped anybody? That's the open question that they ask you. And the video they put up, the first one, they take it down. The second video they put up, that's 12 minutes, like the highlight one. They turn, uh, the comment section is open. There's 80,000 plus comments there. Then you look at Philip Schofield. Yeah. You just brought up Philip Schofield. For people that don't know who Philip Schofield, do you mind explaining to people who he is? Yeah, he was a TV presenter in England. He was very famous. He ran the morning show and he was grooming children for a very long time and all the staff knew about it. And the people who worked on the show with them were being groomed by him and everybody knew and it was all a big ha 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 joke. And now he's come out saying, oh, please don't pick on me. I feel sad. And the media is saying, I'll leave the guy alone. He, he, he is, uh, when you go look up his Wikipedia, it says he rose to prominence as children's BBC continuity presenter from 85 to 87. Yep. Then went on to do programs on BBC and ITV for going live this morning, dancing on ice, all star Mr. and Mrs., the cube and a bunch of other things. And they interview him. Okay. While he's going through the mess, uh, 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 you know, after 27 years of being married, this one guy that he groomed since 10 years old, his name is uh, McGreevy, I want to say, something McGreevy, yep. uh, that he's uh, uh, going through the process. Matthew McGreevy, they met at 10 years old at a theater group. At 15 years old, Philip follows him on Twitter. Yep. While the kid is 15, he follows him on Twitter. Yep. The guy celebrates it. Long story short, L Ruth Langsford, they work together with. She files a complaint. Then right after filing the complaint, he, uh, McGreevy gets fired. Then he has to take a break. Then he comes out after 27 years telling his wife, you know, and hey, I'm, I'm gay, I'm coming out of the closet. He's got two daughters. But there's a part of it where Matthew calls his wife and says, hey, yeah. your husband and I had an affair together when I was 19 the first time and 20 and all. Yeah. Nobody knows if it was before or not. The interesting thing about him is his brother, Timothy Schofield, I don't know if you know about his brother. Oh, what, the one who's in jail for being a pedophile? was convicted of 11 sexual offenses involving a child between October 2016 and 2019, including two sexual activity with a child. Here's how the interview started. First question, the guy asked him. He says, you've had quite a week. How are you? Opening question. Unbelievable. Versus the question they ask you on the opening, right? And then he turns around and says, the media's interest in the affair was motivated partly because of my homo, because of homophobia, homophobia, alleging that an affair with a much younger woman would have not generated such a scandal. So he gets protected, yep. and he says, "All those people who write those uh, write, write those stuff, do they ever think that there's actually a person on the other end?" Right? This is proven. By the way, this is the part where even when somebody's watching you and saying, "Why are they taking him to court? Maybe he did something." Why are they taking Trump to court? Maybe he did something. Why are they taking this guy? He must have done something. There must have been something there, right? It's stuff like this BBC does. If BBC are watching this, right? I want to kind of remind you of your mission statement that you have on your website. We're going to put the link below to your mission statement. You can go find it. Here's what your mission statement is, BBC. This is why you've lost some credibility the last couple of years. To act in public interest, serving all audiences through the provision of impartial, keyword impartial, high quality and distinctive output and services which inform, educate, and entertain. You say you inform, educate, you entertain, yet you conceal, misinform, and your content's quite frankly boring. You're cherry picking on people that you're talking to. So a message like that gets the average person to say, everything with you is allegedly, everything he did is proven, his brother is proven, yet let's leave him alone, poor guy, let's target him. This is where their argument has 
leaks in it. And oh, somebody I, like you can tear it up. Absolutely. Philip is part of the club, and I'm not. And, and this is the thing. I'm a mentally resilient person, right? 14 months they've attacked me. I'm not going to sit and complain about that because that's not how I operate as a man. 14 months they've complained about me. If you look in, if you type Romania, human trafficking, you type in any of these things, my name comes up, my face, I'm a bad person. I've lost all my bank accounts. I've lost all my social media accounts. I've been vilified all across the matrix in every single possible way. They print my face every single day with something negative next to it daily. Nobody gives a shit about my mental health, right? Because I'm the enemy. And what's scary about this is Lucy Williamson herself, she was begging me for an interview. The BBC were begging me for an interview. I don't need any of these people. The only reason I even sat down with the BBC is because they were begging me. I can go and just say my own words and get plenty of views, right? But the whole time I was in jail, they're begging me for an interview. Can we speak to them on the phone? Maybe we can give an interview from jail. Can we have an interview? Please, 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 please. And I was saying, why do I want to talk to the BBC? And the BBC were saying, no, we don't want to do a hit piece. We want to come across and we want to be impartial. This is what they're telling This is what they're telling me. We want to be impartial. We believe there's a side of the story that hasn't been told. We're really interesting and we're really interested in some of the, uh, let's say, what's the word? I don't want to get this wrong. Inconsistencies in the Romanian justice system. We're very interested in his side of the story. There's been enough hit pieces. We want to tell the other side. We want to hear Andrew Tate's story. And I said, no, on repeat. Then they sent me a list of questions. I didn't even ask for a list of questions. That's not who I am. I don't have to script. I never ask for a list of questions. They sent me a list of questions. Here's what we're going to ask. It's about his mental health. It's about the Romanian justice system. It's about the fact he hasn't been charged. His liberty has been deprived. All this stuff. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe it's a bit interesting. And the Matrix is obviously printing lies about me. And these are some interesting questions from the Matrix for the first time ever. OK. They walk in here all smiles and happy, all smiley faces trying to take me off guard. I already have my list of questions, right? It's all going to be nice and easy. I sit down and they instantly attack me. They put the cameras on first and they attack me, expecting mm. me to stutter and make a fool of myself. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, they tried to sucker punch me. I'm in the club and they're my friends shaking my hand and they tried to hit, hit me and knock me out. And this is the thing that's so amazing about it. Yes, I destroyed the BBC. But of course I did because I'm smarter than all of them. But why should I have to rely on my wit and intellect to destroy BBC with their research team and their plan? Their deliberate plan to try and annihilate my, not only my credibility, but my life. They are trying to put me back in jail, these people. They're not, they're not dishonest. They're genuinely evil. And they don't give a shit. And so why should I even sit there and entertain them? I believe I could slip every single sucker punch they throw at me for the rest of human time. I could sit with any of these clowns. And no matter who they sit with, with their mm -hmm. research team, whatever garbage they come up with, I'll make a fool of all of them. But why am I even entertaining them anymore? What's the point? That was the last chance I gave mainstream media. They lied for months to get that interview with me. Completely dishonest, head to toe. And like you said, they sit with Philip. Are you okay? Are you okay? We heard your mom's upset, that poor old lady. Maybe everyone should stop talking about it because his mom's upset. Let's not talk about it anymore because his mother's old. You're either part of the club or you're not. You have to sell your sanity nowadays. If you sell your sanity, you're afforded protections. That's the reality of it because if you're a sane thinking person, you don't buy their bullshit. And that's what upsets them. They don't want anybody who thinks for themselves. They need you to not, they want you to believe exactly what's on the television screen. Believe in COVID. It's COVID now. It's COVID now. Oh, Putin's invaded Ukraine. Putin's cured COVID now. Now it's Ukraine. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. Till the next thing comes. It, it, it's absolutely asinine. Did any of the questions that they sent you ahead of time? Zero. Oh, by the way, we didn't, there was no. No, that's not how that we operate. Us ahead of time of what, whatsoever. Did they ask you any of the questions they Zero. said they were going to ask you? Zero. They start with an attack and it yeah. became a battle instantly. Did they ask you at any point what jail was like, Zero. what your mental health was like? Zero. Uh, how, like, you completely missed the mark when everyone wants to know what was jail like. Well, but and they don't even ask you that question. But this is what's so interesting about it. These people are so detached from reality because they are genuinely detached from reality. They think that finding a video I made eight years ago, a four hour speech I made eight years ago and finding one line of it without context that can be misconstrued. They think that sitting down with me and, and saying that to me is an aha moment. Nobody cares mm -hmm. because you're taking out of context one. And I said, you're taking things out of context because I'm not taking it out of context. I said, if you're presenting it without context, that's taking it out of context. That's what it is. You're lying by omission. I said that to her after the camera's off and she looked at me because she didn't understand. When you omit details, when you refuse to put in all of the details, you can lie by including one detail which may happen to be true. You can tell the truth and miss all the details around the truth and you are lying by omission. You're lying by omission. And you're sitting here saying, oh, you said this eight years ago. Nobody cares because they know me and they know I didn't mean it in that way and they know it's taken out of context 
and they know that it's an old video on the internet, and it's not even an aha moment they think it is. But they just want to sit with you for an hour, attack you and attack you and attack you, wait for you to make one mistake. If I would have stuttered or made a single mistake, that's the only three minutes they would have shown. That's all they want. They want that one hour, then they take the little bit. With me, they cut it down to 12 minutes, they look terrible in all of it. But if I would have made a single mistake, it would have been the only bit they shown. That's all they care about. Fake news. Did you tell them, did you say, I'm only doing this if I'm able to record as well? I said Because I know that's what happened with Trump as well a couple of years ago. I didn't even tell them, I just recorded it. Okay, so they didn't know you were recording. They didn't know I was recording until afterwards, and then I said, that was dishonest, I'm going to release the whole video. You told them before you released I it. I told them. There is no contract or agreement with BBC. No. Nothing was signed, it was just simply a, yeah. a, an interview. Okay. Because I think that was very important when you released it, for people to see what fully was said, Versus, and by the way, you know the Philip Schofield interview that they put up, the 12 minute one that just came out? You know the comments are turned off. Of course they are. The comments are turned off, of yours are turned on, his is turned off. Of course. Uh, and, and who knows many reasons why they would do that. But going back, going back to BBC. So, okay, they come, they want to ask the questions of you. For some of the people that maybe aren't following the story closely, but they know who you are. We're, we're in the car, we're driving, yeah. and a lot of people are asking questions. There's, we ask the drivers, like, hey, are you going to Tate's place? How do you know we're going to Tate's place? And he says, well, who's Tate? Oh, Andrew Tate. Oh, tell us about Andrew Tate. Well, this is, okay. What kind of a guy is he? He says, I actually really like him. I said, why do you think he's going through what he's going through right now? Oh, it's, because, it's always because of money. Okay, so we're at a different restaurant. So tell us, why are you going through this? Why is he going, everybody's saying a similar thing about this, right? But for those who don't know, there's three different camps. Yeah. The camp that already sees you guilty it doesn't matter what they read. So for example, this story here, you know, from BBC came out just last night, 10.30. Andrew Tate choked me until I passed that UK woman claims, right? This is Alice, another anonymous name, just like Sophie, right? Yeah. But there's three camps. There's those that say, well, look, I'm already thinking he's guilty. I don't like him anyways. I need anything to get me to think he's guilty. Yeah. Whatever it takes. I don't, have to, I don't have to do my own due diligence. I just have to hear anything. Then there's a camp that's a diehard fan. There's nothing you can do that they did wrong. You yeah. can, you know, in their eyes, going to be wrong. Then you have the people in the middle that are the reasonable ones yeah. that are saying, you know what? Let me look at this. Yeah. What about this? What about that? The people in the middle may say the following question. They may say, and I may have asked this question from you last time as well. They may say, Andrew, okay, if this guy is so innocent, how can they get you to go to the dungeon for 92 days? How can they put you on house arrest? How can they do all this stuff? Yeah. If you're somebody that was born in the US, you lived in UK, how come somebody else isn't coming to bail you out? You got different lawyers. How is it that they can keep doing this to you if you're not guilty? What do you say to those people? Yeah, and once again, I have to be careful what I say because of the court case, but Romania has a law, or the law in Romania is basically, if you can prove to a judge that it might have happened, they're allowed to hold you up to six months during the investigation stage. If I was guilty of anything, I would have been charged long ago. And we're going to talk about charges soon because I, I still believe they're going to attempt to charge me. But we're now approaching the end of the six months they can keep me under a form of arrest for without charge. Typically in Romania, when I was first arrested, the guard said, ah, within two weeks, you'll have your indictment. I was like, two weeks? He goes, yeah, everyone gets charged quickly. It, nobody waits six months for a charge. If they arrest you, they charge you, like, like every other country, right? The fact they've waited six months and gone into my entire life and attempted to, to find something shows they don't have a case. Why I believe it happened is because they didn't have a case when they were trying to hit me with this garbage and they thought, you know what? If we put him all over the news, if we slander his name completely, if we, there was a hotline set up. If you're a girl who's been hurt by Andrew Tate, call this number mm -hmm. in the UK, a hotline. So they were attempting to use the media to find what they wanted. Months go by, months go by, months go by, case file's empty, nothing's happening. My lawyer's saying, when are we gonna close this case file? Like, yeah, we're just waiting for some papers, we're gonna close it, we're gonna close it, we're gonna close it. Around the time I was canceled, things started appearing in the case file again. They start spying on me again. Very interesting that it happened around that time. I don't know if they understood that I didn't have, I wasn't protected by the political class of the USA. I don't know what happened. They started to build this case and they spied on me for all of these months, spending millions of euros spying on me everywhere I went, trying to find evidence of a crime. Eventually they get to the end of their legal limit to spy on me and they don't have any crime. They don't have anything. 
So in my current court case, we have two Americans who lied, the ones who we have the conversations between them saying they're going to get an Oscar for lying to the mm -hmm. police. We have the CCTV of them coming and going. We have their Uber records showing they can travel the country freely. We have their phone calls with their mother where they're saying, yeah, he didn't hurt me, and my boyfriend caught me. We have all of it. We have all the evidence. We have those two. And then there's nobody else who could possibly even take the stand. I don't believe, as, as, as high level as this matrix attack is, I still don't believe a Romanian judge is going to put me in jail with, with the dossiers. I've seen it. It's garbage. I don't think I'm going to end up in jail. But it's just taking years of my life, damaging my influence, having bad things to say about me, keeping me under control, keeping me locked in a, in a house. That's, that's all they want to do. They have no interest in the truth. There's no victims. There's no one to take the stand. Do you know who Sophie is or Alice is or no? Yeah, so the BBC, Allie. that's really interesting. So then the BBC says, well, we found victims because the BBC have done enough investigative journalism to understand that the case is garbage and they have, there's no victims. So they say, well, we found victims. They found one called Sophie first. Mm -hmm. That was a few months ago. I think I was still in jail when Sophie appeared. Is that her real name? No, that's her fake name. So they have a girl with a fake name called Sophie. They don't show her face. They, they ask me, what do you think about Sophie? How can I comment on Sophie when Sophie isn't real? First, firstly, you've made her up. Secondly, I don't know who you're talking about. You're saying that nine years ago, I was emotionally controlling? That is the most subjective garbage accusation. What does that mean? Nine years ago, I said you shouldn't party with those guys in the club. Is that what I said? I don't know what I said. I don't know who she is, if she exists at all. And they're saying nine years ago, you were emotionally controlling. Sophie said so. Who's Sophie? We're not telling you. What's emotionally controlling mean? We're not telling you. What, do you, what comment do you want me to If this person even exists, which they don't, then I destroy the BBC, make it very clear to them that Sophie doesn't exist, on repeat, because she doesn't. And two days later, Alice appears. What's interesting about this is that DCOP, the federal agency inside of Romania, along with help from international partners, have tried so hard, spending millions of euros with federal level tools to find a victim so they can put me in jail. And they can't find anyone. But the BBC just pulls them up whenever they want. The BBC does. Where do these people come from? And I say this every single time. If anybody believes they've been wronged, male or female, by me, go to the police. Go to the police. I encourage you to go to the police. All these people say, we don't want to go to the police. We just want to stay on the news. What, is that because you're not real? Is that why? <laughs> That's pretty convenient. I mean, I thought I was a bad person. Why don't you go to the cops? Oh, because you have no evidence and it doesn't exist? That's why. Are all these accusers in the UK, not even in Romania? Not even in Romania. So Sophie and Alice are supposedly both from the UK. And Alice's story is- To correct, it's not Alice. I said Alice, it's Evie. Evie or Evie or something like that. E-V-I-E. -E. It's, yeah. it's, it's all made up names. It's all made up names. So Evie- We could call whatever name we want, but- Yeah, Evie is saying 13 years ago, I, I choked her or something. Yeah. By the way, when is the six month time limit? End of this month. Okay. And can we reference the tweet you just posted a couple days ago? I, I want to stay on the sure. show. commenting on Evie. Sure. You were going to say something about Evie. Uh, what she said 10 so she's claiming 10 years ago or 13 years ago you guys had the consensual sex the first time she comes back for the second time around according to the story she says she was being uh, 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 your hand was on her throat strangled me she was passed out for a minute and then she came back and she said I did not approve of the second time having sex after she was passed out so these stories they're making you know and then she says the guy asked a question saying, how come you didn't do any police report back then? She says, well, because it's not fully rape and it's not that because it was consensual and I kind of wanted to be there and I didn't tell anybody about it six years later. There's way too many things that doesn't give it credibility for somebody to say, I didn't do anything about it then, but six years later I told my friends, three or six years later. Yeah, and this is the thing that's scary. If you say to any red-blooded male, 13 years ago you had sex with a woman consensually and she's now unhappy about how that sex happened. You can get, any man on earth can get screwed with that. If this person exists at all. And like you said, she refused to go to the police if she exists. And she's saying it was consensual. I think last night they aired it on Newsnight and she literally, they said, why are you coming forward now? And I think she, this actor, the person literally said, because now he's rich and famous. They literally said those words. That's, that's what they said. Oh, well, because now he's rich and famous. I think it's unfair. To, it's, 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 it's asinine. I don't understand genuinely how a man can protect himself in the Western world anymore. How can you even exist anymore? If this is what they're going to hit you with as soon as you get to a certain level of influence, there's no man on earth who's safe from this. I said this to my judges. The, I had a few male judges. I said, they could do this to you. They could do this to anyone. 
They can do it to you or you or me or any man watching this. Any man watching this. They can put in the BBC, nine years ago you did something. They won't tell you her name. They won't give you any chance to defend yourself because you have no idea what they're fucking talking about. And they will print it on repeat until you lose your job no. and lose your bank and lose your social media. And then you're going to sit there bankrupt and depressed. And then they're just going to move on from you. And if you don't die, if you're like me, a cockroach who refuses to die, if you sit around and refuse to go away, they're going to make up a new one. It's, it's crazy. And it's genuinely scary. And you're not safe from it anywhere anymore. I will say right now on this podcast, I encourage absolutely anybody who believes I've harmed them, male or female, to go to the police with evidence and we'll go to court. Let's do it. I don't harm people. If I was harming people, I wouldn't be out here as open as I was. The biggest criminals and the biggest gangsters and the most heinous people on earth don't have social media. <laughs> you know this. Do I see a guy with an Instagram pretending he's a gangster? He's not a gangster. The real gangster hasn't got Instagram. <laughs> But that's the reality of it. You think I'm gonna become the most Google man in the world if I've been running around hurting people? It's absolutely insane. And I think there has been a shift in the consciousness. I think, especially because of COVID and a few other things, people are starting to understand that all these people do is lie. I think people are starting to understand that. And the harder they try and hurt me with these lies, the less people believe it, which is scary for me. Like I said earlier, it's scary. They keep coming up with more garbage. The bullets keep bouncing off. So now they're sitting around going, we can't convince the world this person is a bad person. How do we get rid of him? That's the scary part. You were going to say something. Yeah, the, follow up the, 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 the six there. months, uh, you know, it's six coming, months said, coming up right now. It's coming up yeah. June 29th, I believe. Correct. OK, you put out a tweet recently. You said the six month time limit is running out. Yeah. Right. There's zero evidence against me unless they invent something against me. Right. Yeah. And then you ask a poll. You said if they charge me with an empty bullet and it still takes a year to beat it and it allows them to save face, they're hoping that the world will basically forget about all this. Yeah. What do you think they will do? And you gave people three options. Option yeah. one, let me go. Option two, charge me with no evidence. Option three, invent and frame attempt. The results were 38% let me go, yep. right? 35% invent and frame attempt. And option two, in third place, charge me with no evidence, 27%. So 38%, 35%, 27%. So basically, it's, 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 pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty even. The th so what do you think is going to yeah, happen the, the, the people, the 38% of people who think they're going to let me go, I think are extremely naive. I go to sleep every night, every morning. I wake up instinctually at 5 a.m. Because that's when they raid your house. I wake up at like 4.59, I just fucking shoot up. Because they, they bust in my house three times now. It's not nice to have a bunch of men with guns bust in your house. It's not a nice experience. So every single morning I wake up expecting them to just turn up again with something else and drag me back to a prison cell. Who knows what? They'll just make it up. But the fact they made up this particular crime is because it's a hit piece and it's a slander on my reputation. If they would have done the same thing, let's say for tax evasion, would anyone care? No. Oh, rich guy didn't pay a piece of paper. No, no one cares. We have to hurt his name. Human trafficking. Think about, think about that. I said this to, to the judge. How does it make sense a man with no criminal record who is financially successful decides to begin to human traffic at 35 years of age. I have no financial motivation. It's clearly not my personality profile. I don't need money. Why have I begun to human traffic from nowhere? It doesn't even make any sense from a pure logical perspective. There's no motive to the crime. Who have I human trafficked? Who is the victim? There's no victims and there's no motive. And here I am on house arrest. It's insane. So yeah, I'm, I'm, it's genuinely intimidating. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next. I believe they're going to try, they're going to try and charge me with the garbage they have. And I think what they're trying to do is just hang it over my head and keep me afraid. Do you think uh, of the, the idea of trying to either silence you or make you irrelevant is working? Meaning, do you think you're more relevant today than you were on September 1st? Is that strategy they're uh, implementing uh, working? No, they're failing. And the reason they're failing is because God's put me in a position where I have to lead from the front. I, I think that in the days of old, when politics used to mean something, politics, I believe in politics as long as the leader of the country charges on his horse at the enemy at the front. Then you're allowed to be king. Then I'll listen to your laws. That's politics. When you send other people's kids to die in a war and you sit on your ass, that's not politics to me. But now I'm in a position where I'm spearheading, by God's plan, the rights of basically every man on earth. They could do this to anybody. So I think any man with a brain who's thinking is looking at my position and going, they could hit me or, or my friends or my son or my dad the same way they're hitting this guy. And that, that builds a degree of affinity amongst my audience. So no, they failed. They failed and they made a hero out of me, which is what I'm actually scared of. 
I'm, I am scared by the incompetence of my enemy. I am scared by the fact that they are failing so monumentally. If they had been half successful with the cancellation, none of this would have happened. If the cancellation made me an obscure internet personality, it'd be over. If I would have just allowed them to beat me, none of this would have happened. But I beat them. And that's the problem. Now I'm sitting here going, okay, well, well, after I beat you, the BBC, after I destroyed the BBC, Tristan gave me a high five. He's like, oh, you wrecked them. They're gonna look so stupid. I said, bro, we've sunk the HMS Hood. HMS Hood in World War II, HMS Hood was the British battleship. It was the, the, the flagship of the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy was obviously renowned. It has been for hundreds of years. It was the best battleship. And it was up against German battlecruiser, the Bismarck. And the Hood should have outgunned the Bismarck. And it was the best German ship against the best British ship. By absolute fluke, the Bismarck, on its first volley or second volley, landed a shell perfectly through the top of the hood and blew up the ammo magazine. And like in the first shot, within minutes, destroyed the entire HMS hood. Killed like, I think it was like 3,000 people, two survivors. You can find the video on YouTube, the hood blow into pieces. When Churchill found out the hood was sunk, he said, sink the Bismarck, don't care what it costs. He sent every ship, every plane, every sub diverted from every other mission. Doesn't care if we lose every plane we have, don't care if we lose the RAF. We cannot lose the hood without him losing the Bismarck. Sink the Bismarck. When the Bismarck sunk the hood, all of the crew were celebrating except the captain. The captain updated his will. He updated his will and telegraphed home to his wife and said goodbye because he knew. When I destroyed the BBC, my brother was celebrating. I knew. I said, Tristan, no. You don't beat the British Broadcasting Corporation to make fools of them like this without some new bullshit. We sunk the hood. And he's like, oh, we'll see. Oh, who's this, Evie? Evie. Evie. I fucking knew it. I'm winning too well. I'm scared by the incompetence of these clowns. <laughs> but I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to lose? I, 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 I'm genuinely looking for guidance here. Am I supposed to roll over and fucking lose when they're lying about me and slandering my name and trying to put me back in a fucking dungeon? Back with the cockroaches? All I could do is protest my innocence, but they're such idiots. I make them look so stupid. And then there's egos involved. You think, the, you, think the, you think Lucy Williamson hasn't been called into a meeting room with some BBC producer saying, you made a fool of us? Yes, she has. There's egos involved. Big, big businessmen with business interests have ego investment in hurting me now. And I keep winning. So I don't know. I'm in a very precarious scenario. Do I continue to win? Do I, do I let them win a bit? Do I just roll over and shut up? What am I supposed to do? I don't know what the right move is. It's difficult. So you, I, you sincerely don't know what the right move is. I sincerely have decided that the best thing I can do is stay true to my faith and stay true to God and tell the truth and fight. The right move for me, I believe, is to fight and, and fight to the end because I think that suicide is always the wrong option. I believe if you're put in a bad position, the best thing you should possibly do is fight to the best of your ability, which is what I'm going to do. However, if I was looking at it purely logically without any kind of ideological motivations, perhaps if I would have shut, shut up when they wanted me to, I wouldn't be in this scenario. But that's just not who I am. You know, Alexander the Great didn't have to keep conquering. <laughs> Genghis Khan didn't need to take Vienna. He could have just chilled. He, he kept going. So I feel like when I'm in a position where I don't know what I'm supposed to do, the best thing I can do is just look to God and tell the truth. And, just, and that's what I'm doing. I want to ask you one more question regarding human trafficking, because this is a heinous charge, or Absolutely. allegedly. Absolutely. I mean, this is, not any, this is not lightweight stuff. You famously ran a webcam business, Correct. perfectly legal, yep. nothing wrong with that. I mean, yep. I can't tell you how many women are doing OnlyFans these days, yep. webcam business. Yep. How much of a reason was that a correlation for the, the human trafficking, the sex trafficking, the webcam business? How much did they correlate yeah, that to, well, he must be human trafficking, he's running a webcam they, business. They, There's they, no correlation. Zero correlation. So they haven't even charged any of the webcam business zero. for any of this. Zero. And what's crazy is, it's crazy. is people assume that, right? It's crazy because one, it's not illegal. And two, you can go drive down the high street of Romania. There's webcam studios on, it's one of the most popular businesses in, in the country. It's not even illegal. And, and that was a past life. You're talking about something that happened 10 years ago. It was it's, that long ago. It was about 10 years ago, yeah. It was at the very wow. beginning of it. The very beginning of the whole idea of this, this, that industry. Minect is an application which allows you to take a minute to connect with influencers from all around the world. My name is Andrew Tate, and I'm available to speak directly to you on Minect. I think it's just perception. I understand I have this perception. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people who are also dislike me, a lot of the reason they dislike me so much is my perception. I've, I've had people who say, I hate what you say. I say, what do I say? And after talking to them a while, they say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Of course. It's the perception of aggression. It's the perception of masculinity that they're afraid of. It's not even the words. But they might like the words. Mm -hmm. It's my delivery. So I understand perception can be reality to a degree. 
I accepted that maybe the first month I was in jail. I understand when you have a message which is complicated and masculinity as a whole is a very complicated tapestry that the best way to instill it and teach it is to break it down to its three core, break it down to its core beliefs. So I've evolved way beyond Lamborghinis and chicks, right? But masculinity as a whole is a very complicated tapestry. You need to have the emotionality. You need to have the times you feel like crying and you don't. You need to have the times you can be aggressive. You need to have the times that you can be violent to protect your family. It's very complicated. And you can't teach that, especially to the young generation, in, 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 in spite of the constant propaganda they have coming in their ears very easily. So I break it down to a very core message. And the core message is that I have financial freedom, so it's hard to tell me what to do. And I have sexual access because I'm respected by women. And I have a good network because I'm respected by men. I break it down to those core things. And those core things are what I build my, that's how you build the tapestry of masculinity. Because if you don't have those three core things, you can never build the rest of it. That's the beginning of it. If you don't have those three things, it's hard to build the rest. So anybody who doesn't look into my message properly, I mean, I'm sure these people who are after me have never listened to me speak at length, ever. Ever. They just look at a picture. He's on a boat. There's three girls on the boat. There's no way those girls are happy with that because my wife hates me. And there's three of them. So he, so he has to go to jail. And that's what's happening. It's, it's that baseline. I truly believe it's that baseline. But how else can I teach my message as complicated as it is without first breaking down and proving you have success in the most core levels of it, right? Before you learn to box, you jab and you cross before you do all the complicated stuff, you do the basic stuff. So a lot of it is people looking at my message, not understanding how detailed it is, not understanding how positive it is, looking at the baseline instincts which I teach and which I use to advertise my success as a whole to people to show and say, look, I clearly know what I'm talking about to a degree because I have things that you want. And you're a man, so you can't tell me you don't want them. Every man wants this. Every man wants one of these. And they take all this and they try and weaponize it and use it against me. And you're right. It's, it's, it's feminism as a whole that has this idea that if a man is a man unapologetically and he doesn't apologize for being a man, that he's a bad person. Which we've discussed at length and I've discussed a bunch of times, but it's truly the most crazy thing about all of this is when shit hits the fan, it's exactly the kind of men they hate that they want. Every single time. Every single time. You can go out to a bar in America and you can stand there and argue with a feminist and argue with her to the end of time. And if someone ran in there with a gun, she would say, hey, you, you go. You're the misogynist. You go protect me. The feminist guy who's on my team, mm -hmm. I don't want him to go. I want you to go, please. We don't want Dylan Mulvaney on the front lines. Of course not. And, and, and it's hypocritical. And it's hypocritical and it's done on purpose. It's purported by the matrix. It's done to attack the baseline masculinity of men because they don't want men to be masculine because when you're masculine, you say no to things. I saw a really interesting study once that was test it had testosterone level and it was linked to your capability to disagree with people. The higher your testosterone level, the more likely you are to disagree because at a baseline level, back before we were more civilized than we are today, if you disagreed with someone, you had to fight him. Interesting. You had to fight that yeah. man. But you just sit and say, you are wrong. There had to be a possibility of violence. If you didn't have the capability for violence, you didn't say they're not, you didn't say they were wrong. You just agreed with stuff, right? So they don't want men who are standing up and saying, I don't believe in X. They want to reduce, reduce our testosterone levels to our eunuchs so that we sit and say, well, I may not agree with it, but what can I really do about it? It is what it is. And then they have absolute control. Do you think history favors that ideology? Or history, eventually, a group of men stand up and say, yeah, listen, we've had enough. This is not going to be happening. I, I do believe that in history, it's always been the same. I believe it's always been a select group of good men who are up against evil. And I think they've always been outnumbered and it's always been difficult and they've always suffered. All of them. When I was in jail, the amount of letters I got from people and it was just names of, and I'm not comparing myself to these people. This is the letters I got of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, da -da. everyone who was unjustly imprisoned. Everyone's gone to jail. Because when you stand up for something, they end up trying to put you in jail. When you're a good person trying to do good, the evil, the matrix as a whole is going to try and throw you in jail. That's what they do. That's the punishment for it. And history's always been the same. It's always been a small group of outgunned people who stand up, who are to the detriment of themselves, too principled to allow injustice and evil to, to thrive. And they stand up and they're outgunned and they're outnumbered, but they're like, no, I have to tell the mm -hmm. truth. If you play a video game and you're the good guy, when you get to the boss at the end, he has more life than you. He has more hit points and he moves faster and he's a, he's a cheater. He cheats. He cheats. The bad guy cheats. But you still win because you're good. And that's how, that's how the battle's always been. I would love for the world to be another way, but I don't think it's ever been that way. I think if you find any time in history, it's always been the same story. And now I'm in the position where, like I said earlier, what am I supposed to do? Am I, have I 
Do I have a life path in which I can genuinely help people? And do I have a life path in which I can genuinely do some damage to the evil to the world? <clears throat> or am I just going to disappear like a coward and let them lie about me and do my time and shut up and delete my Twitter account and just go away? You know, you know how sometimes, like, uh, 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 I've, I've been in sales for quite a while. If a guy who doesn't have any responsibilities and he's single, he has a $30,000 a month, boom, he's going to Vegas, having a good time. Yeah. And then he doesn't work as hard until he runs out of his 30,000. Three months later, I gotta go make the 30,000 again. Oh my God, panic, I gotta pay my bills, I'm behind on the phone, yeah. let me buy this watch and make 40 grand, I'm going out again. So it's very inconsistent, right? And then as you're in sales longer, you're like, okay, the profile of somebody that's gonna be more consistent is not a single guy, it's a guy that's married, kids, homeowner, and all those three are signs of what? Married, commitment. Yep. Uh, homeowner, commitment, responsibility. Kids, commitment, responsibility. Yep. Last time we didn't talk about your kids. Yep. At this point, I think it's public, video, your daughter running to me, give daddy a kiss, all this stuff. Everybody knows at this point. Yep. Do you, when you're in, in jail, sometimes I, I, I sit there and I got books on my desk. I'm like, I'm like 50 books behind. And I, I like to read. I know you don't yeah. talk about reading a lot, but I like to. I'm like, I'm 50 books behind. But I bet if you're in a place where you're in jail, you're forced to think. You're forced to, Andrew, you don't have the phone. You don't have the computer. There is no emergency podcast. Yeah. Go away and think. You're sitting there, you're like, okay, family, yeah. kids, yeah. you know, what it's really all about. Yeah. Those decisions, when you think about your kids, does it influence you to say, oh, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing this? You know, why, why, are you, why are you going through all this stuff? Maybe you gotta make some changes in, in your lifestyle. Yeah. And if yes, in what areas? Yeah. Or does it say, no, double down even more because I'm fighting for them? And that's a really interesting question. I'll start by saying how thoughts in jail are different than thoughts in the outside world because this is actually an observation I had. In the outside world, I don't think you carry a thought for very long that you don't want to carry. You can sit and think about something if you want to. But if you don't want to think about something, you just get your phone out. Something pops in your head, oh, I don't do it. You get your phone out and distract yourself. Or you get in your laptop, or you call someone, or you do something, right? It's not very often in the real world. Point. It's not very often yep. in the real world you have a thought you don't want in your head, and you have nothing to take it away. You have no phone, you have no outside interaction, you have nowhere to go. What a perspective. Nothing. You're just stuck with yeah. it. You're stuck with Makes that sense. thought. So there were times in jail where for the first time, like I have a lot of mental control, but there was the first time ever I'm battling with my own mind saying, I don't want to think about this. And I, I, I put another thought in the way. It kept, it was on the door. It was knocking on the door all the time. And this is for weeks. Cause there's no, it never, every day is the same. You never get the inter outside interaction. And you also, what made it worse is you never get the answer. You know, like the open loop. If you ever say to somebody, I'm gonna tell you something, ah, I'll tell you later. And it bothers them. That's what jail's like, because you might think of something, it doesn't matter what it is, I won't say what my thought was, but I'll give you an example. Let's say I, I thought, when did Constantinople fall? What year? I can't just Google it. I don't know. So it's stuck in your head, right? So if you have this negative thought, <laughs> you don't know the answer. Normally in life, when you want to know something, you find out. But in jail, you don't. <laughs> so you're like, I don't know. I, you got this in your head and you're like, I can't get this out of my head. So when you have a negative thought, yeah. especially if there's an open loop to it, you need to know something or you want to know something. You can't get it out of your mind. I would, I would sit there for hours just meditating, trying to just keep the door closed on negative thoughts. It's really difficult. It's a really strange experience. And maybe in normal jail in, in Western countries where you get to go and interact with people, you can distract yourself. But I was stuck in a room for 93 days in one room. I did not leave, that was where I was. I was allowed to go to the fridge once a day, which is a three meter walk and back, that is it in my room. You and T Tristan are in the same room or no? At the beginning we weren't, but then we ended up in the same room. Got it, okay. Yeah. So yeah, the thoughts in jail are very pervasive and it's also a long time, maybe never, maybe never, in the outside world where I had a thought in my head for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. You just satisfy the problem. You fix the issue in the real world. In jail, you can't do that. So yeah, family and kids, and those are the positive things that you do think about. But it's difficult because I think of children, I think of legacy. And then if you're gonna think of your legacy via your children, you have to think of your legacy via your actions. And then you have to sit and by extension go, well, truly, truly on my deathbed, truly, will I be happier if I gave up or if I continue to tell the truth? I'm scared of the regret of thinking, you know what, I was the most famous man in the world and every man on earth was listening to me and I was really making a difference, but I got scared. I don't think I can live with that. I don't think I can live as a coward. I don't, I feel, I'd feel like a pussy. I just feel like a wimp. And sometimes 
inside of men, that's all it takes for us to do the most st stupid things there is. The idea of feeling like a coward. A man will run into a burning building to not be a coward. If the, if the firefighter, they go, there's children in there. And the whole building's on fire. It's like, well, I can't be a coward. I'll oh, fuck it. And you'll risk your life. It's something that's built inside of us, honor and pride. It's something that should be. It's what they're trying to take away from us. But it's what used to be built inside of men. And I just feel like I can't give up. I know what I'm doing is good. I know what I'm teaching is good. I know that people don't like it, but I know I'm not teaching anything that's bad. And yeah, I want my children to be happy, but I have daughters too. And how do you make sure that your daughters are secure and have a good future? Well, I think you do that by building good men. How else do you do it? My, my daughter is mine now, but she won't be mine forever. She's going to marry somebody. I like the idea of her marrying a good man with honor and principle, a man like me. I don't want to marry some idiot. So they call me a misogynist and I'm anti-woman. I'm pro-woman. The, the best way you can improve the lives of women is, is make men better men, better at being men. Because when a man is a good man, he's good for all of society, including women. He's good for everyone around him when he's good at being a man. So I feel like I'm helping them as well by extension. And it's difficult. And yeah, I... I I, I can't say with honesty that I strongly considered giving up. It never crossed my mind. It, 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 it was there for a second. Do I need to do this? And after like half a second, it was like, yeah, I do. I, I don't know why. I can't. I, it doesn't make logical sense. So kids didn't influence it one way or another? Kids, That's kids, what I want. Kids, kids made me want to do it more. Kids made you want to do it kids more? Kids made me want to do it more. Got it. I, I, I look up to my father as a hero, and I would hate for my sons to look up at me and not see me as a hero because that's how I believe you should see your dad, as a hero. And I feel like I've, and you're not a hero without an enemy, and you're not a hero without a fight. Did, did they ever try to, uh, uh, and by the way, I don't see this working effectively at all, but did they at all try to come in between you and Tristan, or you and the two girls, or the two of you and them? Was there any manipulation and divisiveness, uh, divisiveness going on there? What, what about these stories that came <clears throat> out that you've got cancer and lung cancer, and then you were poisoned and these matrix attacks? Yeah, so the Are you planting these stories? No. Are they making these things no, up? No, so the cancer thing is interesting because by Romanian law, every 30 days to extend the arrest, there has to be new information. They can't extend the arrest based on the previous information. So they put together all this garbage case and they arrested me for 30 days. To keep me another 30 days, they have to find something during that 30 day arrest period to keep me for the second month. But of course there's nothing to find. So when I was having uh, medical scans in Dubai, a scar, a dark spot was identified on my lung and I had follow-up tests booked for February. So when after the first 30 days, I called up my PA and she said, are you coming to Dubai? I said, well, yeah, if they let me go at the end of these 30 days, I'll come to Dubai for my medical tests. They took that conversation and shown it and used it in court saying, I'm trying to flee the country and trying to escape the judicial system as motivation for the second month's arrest. And the judge agreed and locked me in jail because I said that I would go to a medical appointment if I was free. And they used that as proof I'm trying to run because they had nothing else and the judge agreed it for some reason and kept me in jail. Then everything in Romania leaks. So it leaked that I had this medical thing in Dubai, I had a problem with my lungs. And then there's a hospital here and I decided to go to the hospital here and have it looked at because although I was not concerned, I thought, you know what? Although it's difficult to do procedures in jail, I have time for once in my life. So I decided to go to the hospital here in Romania, and Romania does have some private health care, which is actually very high quality. It's not as poor as people think it is. And I went to a private hospital, and I knew it wasn't cancer. I knew it wasn't. I sat down with the doctor and said, we're really concerned about this dark spot in your lung. I said, it's not cancer. He said, how do you know? I said, that's just not my life path. It's not my story. You told him that? Yeah. <laughs> the doctor was like, okay, but we have to investigate. He said, like, we can investigate, but it's just not my story. It's not cancer. I have 0%. When BBC came... Did, did you have guys like watching every move they were making? You had to almost feel like one-on-one, -on -one, right? Somebody's watching everything they're yeah, doing. Everything. You have to do it, right? Yeah. You can't be, yeah. you have to be overly paranoid and skeptical with these If they guys. want to hear about, you know, Ricky Tang's crime lord, if they want to hear more about the crime syndicate <laughs> in Hong Kong, I can tell them all about it, because Carter and Lee's going to get it under control. But, but um, yeah, I, I mean, this is the thing. This is actually a really interesting point, which I'll go into before I finish the lung story. So I went to the doctors here. In Romania, everything leaks. It leaked out to the press. I had this mark on my lungs. I was supposed to go to Dubai. They denied me going to Dubai. They said that's enough reason to hold me and keep me in jail, which is absolutely insane, all because I also had a phone call about a medical procedure. It's crazy. But they were always going to keep me anyway and find some reason. I went there. I had a bronchioscopy. Have you ever had one of them? <sighs> Bro. I wouldn't call it painful, but it's certainly horrible. 
So they put a camera in your lung. So it's not that, it's down your throat, but it's in your lung. It's not down your throat, it's into the airway. So you're trying to vomit and you're trying to cough and you can barely do either. And they're moving this camera around inside. It's extremely unpleasant. Even it sucks. I had it three years ago in Dallas for the whole allergy thing. That Did I you have wanted. a bronchioscopy? Yeah, they had to knock you out. It's terrible. Yeah. You've had the yeah, same absolutely. procedure. Were you awake or asleep? No, they gave me anesthesia. So I was, uh, I was asleep. Oh, bro, here. What I was, were you? I was awake. Yeah. Wide awake. Yeah. Oh, I was wide awake. Sounds exciting. Yeah. yeah. It was, they gave me this. Uh, uh, they, they tried to numb your throat a bit. And then they gave it to me. And the doctor's all around me. It's kind of interesting because when something is in your mouth and you're choking, you want to grab it, right? So you're on a chair and you're, cha you're like tied to the chair. So you can't move your hands. So you're like tied to the chair and you're like this. And they put this thing down your throat, this camera. And you're trying to vomit and you're trying to cough. But they can't move the camera when you're coughing. So even the guard, the armed guard who took me, the police officer, the guy, he was in the corner of the room. And even he was, I could see on his face. He was like, fucking hell. And I've, I don't even want to reenact it because it's, it's probably so horrible to look at. But you're, you're just... Like, like you're trying to vomit, you're trying to cough, you're like, your face is bright red, you can't breathe. And they're like, stop coughing, stop coughing, stop coughing. And you have to try and stop coughing for like two seconds so they can adjust the camera a bit. It's the worst 20 minutes of my life, it was horrible. They finish that and they go, okay, well the good news is there's precisely zero smoking damage on your lungs and your lungs are perfect. But the lesion, whatever it is, is on the outside of your lungs. It's not on the inside of your lungs. We you couldn't see anything. So I completed that procedure, went back to jail. That was a nice evening, um, horrible. Anyone has a bronchioscopy, yeah, go to sleep. Don't stay awake. Horrible. Um, then they said, we have to find it. We have to, put a, we have to get a biopsy from the outside of your lungs. So we have to put a needle through your back, a needle like this long, through your back, through your rib cage, to your lung, a CT guided biopsy it's called, and take a piece of it and then pull the needle back out and then do a biopsy on the piece. Now, they're like, this is an operation. Do you want to have it while you're in jail? Because I'm, the bronchioscopy wasn't much to recover from. I had a really sore throat, whatever, whatever. But this is an operation, do you want to have it while you're in jail? And I was like, well, why not? I'm in jail, I have time. I can't recover, but I have time. So I went for my CT guided biopsy, they put you on your front, they, get, they show you the needle, it's like this long, and then they, they, they stick it in you, and then they scan you with the biopsy, and they try and see where the mark is, and they adjust the needle, and they scan it, it's like 30 minutes of them shoving this needle in you, trying to get to the right point. And eventually they uh, did it, did the biopsy, and they said, uh, yeah, it's, it's benign, some lesion I might have had from when I had, I had pneumonia when I was a kid or something, it was benign. And that's what I told you. I knew that cancer wasn't my life path. I knew it wasn't. But obviously rumors spread like wildfire. 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 Everybody in the States. Especially because I smoke. Especially because I smoke all the time. Right. But, but it was actually very refreshing to hear. I have zero smoking damage on my lungs. Zero. I was like, there's zero? I mean, I, I'll accept a little bit. <laughs> I'll take a little bit. But I think it's because I train every single day. I work out every single day. I train hard every single day. And I think... You know, you, you burn it off. A couple cigars here and there are not a big deal. It's not cigarettes. I think cigars are better than cigarettes. I also believe nicotine is a super drug, so I'm not going to stop. I think nicotine and caffeine. A super drug? 100%. What does that mean? Nicotine and caffeine are what I run on. 100, 100 that's all I run on. Coffee's for closers, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him. <laughs> Ten I'm the only one that, that drinks coffee. Between the two of us. Oh, really? By the way, you know who, uh, who talked about nicotine? Tucker Carlson talked about nicotine. Right? Have you seen that no. when he talks about nicotine where he starts his days off, his day off with nicotine? Or, fire, yeah. 100%. Fire yeah. blood. I, I, I have about 10 to 15 cups of coffee a day and two or three cigars a day. And I only eat once a day. And it's funny because people look at 10 to 15. Cups of coffee a day minimum. Minimum. Wow. But well, you don't do drugs. Zero drugs. You'll do, you'll have a sip of alcohol every once in a while. I used to. I haven't had alcohol in nine months. I've quit. But you're running on caffeine and nicotine. and nicotine. It's funny because people look at my physique when I put pictures up and they're like, what's your meal plan? I'm like, bro, cigars, <laughs> coffee. Coffee That's and cigars. Wild, coffee and cigars. I eat once a wow. day. I eat once a day. I what eat, time? I eat dinner only. That's it? Only eat dinner and eight. So you do intermittent fasting for every 18 day. hours? What? Yeah. And 80 to 90% of my calories are meat. That's it. I'll just have like three steaks for dinner. Now, how much of that is genetics? How much is that like? The, I'm not sure if it's genetics, yeah. but that's just how I feel best. I feel best when, if I, if I smoke and drink coffee all the time, I feel hungry, which motivates me, and I feel energetic. It's energetic hungry. That's how I like to feel when I'm working. I want to be hungry. If I eat, I'm tired. Life's too good if I eat. I'm in my mansion. I've just eaten. She's beautiful. I'm in a bit. <laughs> no, but if, but if I don't, yeah, but if I don't eat, I'm like, maybe, I wouldn't say angry, but I like to have that tinge of, irritableness. Does that make sense? I don't know. Maybe I sound crazy. When it's how I get things done. It's how I get life done. It's just how I... cups of coffee a day, three cigars, and you eat once a day. That's right, yeah. And you train every day. I train every day, yeah. 
and it's working. Well, working it worked, for you. It's how I feel best. It's, I don't know if I, if you wrote a book on uh, Tate's diet, if that book would do well. <laughs> well, I had, I had, well, this is interesting because I had a blood test when I was in hospital for yeah. all these things and my testosterone level, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on male hormones because I'm not, I don't understand them. I don't know what measurement it's in, but it's, it was between nine and 27 is the testosterone, the testosterone level, the mark it can be between nine and 27, the normal range. I've never taken a steroid in my life. I don't inject anything. I don't take any pills, nothing. And I was 32. I was above the normal scale and I'm 36 years old. It's supposed to be going down. So whatever I'm doing, I'm sticking to it. What was your diet and your regimen while in jail? There was no Cigarette, coffee? There, you... Oh, I had coffee and cigarettes. Don't worry, bro. I had those. Really? I spent my commissary money on coffee and cigarettes. I had coffee and cigarettes and one meal a day, same. So there was commissary money. Yeah, so we had I gave you that. Yeah, so uh, a friend of mine put money on my account. So I was a rich guy in jail, because in Romanian jail, most people haven't got money, right? I was rich, rich. I was rich. <laughs> There's a limit to how much you can buy, but I was spending the maximum. So I had plenty of cigarettes, coffee. I actually quit coffee, but now we're talking about coffee, and then I wanna go back to the point you made earlier, but I quit coffee for the first 30 days in jail, because I've never, I've never not been caffeinated. My experience of life is caffeinated. I'm a caffeinated <laughs> human, right? If I'm awake, it's caffeine. So I'm like, I don't need energy now, I'm in jail. So I quit caffeine and, and all coffee for 30 days to see if there's any tangible benefits. And I can confirm to the world that there are none. Zero. I did not sleep any better. I did not go to sleep any easier. I did not dream anymore. Nothing, absolutely nothing good happened except I was tired of it. It was garbage. I was like, give me my coffee back. I went back to my 15 coffee, cups of coffee a day. That's, Reaffirmed that's your coffee. Wild to have that much coffee. The last time I drank coffee, I was 25. We have really? one friend. Literally. We have one friend that drinks almost as much Mario coffee. Drinks Mario drinks as much as Shout you. out to And by Mario. the way, everybody around me loves coffee. Yeah. Including my 11-year-old son, Tico. Yeah. He, he, him and his mom got into an argument the other day because she didn't want to take him to Starbucks. He's like, yeah. what do you mean? He's like, I want some coffee. He's like, you're not having coffee yeah, yeah. at 11 years old. Anyways, but it's working for you. It's working for your body. Correct. Sometimes when you, when you find a diet or a combination that that hits your body well you'll know it you'll feel it and, and, and that, you have to know your body the correct, best correct i think there's no perfect diet for everybody i agree Everyone's slightly different i agree and that's just and and i think you are what you eat to a degree and it also depends the mental model you want to operate under some if i wanted to operate under comfort i certainly wouldn't eat the way i eat i, I do it because i particularly want to operate under a degree of irritability and high energy and hunger i like feeling hungry i don't like feeling full i like being hungry all the time I, I love that. I mean, I mean, that's that's the quality of people where, you know, you can you can tell a lot from somebody how big they think after they make money and they have some success. Yeah. When they make money, that's when they slow down. That's when they get casual. The hunger goes away. Yeah. It, you'll really know if somebody is hungry when they made money and they're still going. What is this guy doing? Still going? Yeah. You've already made the money. You've already had the success. Yeah. Let's transition to a couple other stories here. Sure. So. All of a sudden, you put in your profile. Obviously, I joked about it. You're the most Googled yeah. woman on earth. You know, that was based on your Twitter profile. You know, Nina Turner comes out and says, if somebody says they're a woman, they're a woman. Not a tough concept. Your response is, I'm a woman, right? You do that. And you've left it on Twitter. Yeah. Tell us why. Because I am. You don't believe me? You're a woman? Are you misgendering me? I have to choose to, you're, choose to agree with you, right? My pronouns you. are she, her. No, but the, the level of... The, it's all a joke, right? But there's actually a very sinister undertone to all of this garbage. And the sinister undertone is that your baseline instincts and your baseline senses are how you've always perceived the world, right? They have to attack them at some level. And they did, I mean, it's fantastic with COVID. COVID, I know we can talk about it now, it was amazing. I used to say to people all the time, who have you seen die? Do you see a pandemic? Yeah, on the news, no, 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 no. Do you see ambulances rushing back and forth everywhere? Do you see bodies on the street? Do you see lines outside of hospitals? Do you see a pandemic? How a pandemic would look? Do you see a pandemic? Oh, but my grandma, my friend's grandma, your friend's grandma was 96, okay? So I'm, I'm not saying it's not sad, I'm saying she was 96. Do you see a pandemic? No, you don't. But they have just lied to you so many times that you're ignoring your own eyes. That's the final stage of the slave mind. It's the final stage of it. The final stage of the slave mind is when your eyes tell you this is green, but the news told you it was blue. So it has to be blue. So when they're doing these things, it's nothing to do with caring about the mental health, of gender ideology, none of this garbage. They're deliberately attacking you and saying what your eyes tell you is wrong. Because if they can make you start to admit that your own eyes are wrong, then what, what other defense do you have against propaganda? If they're gonna give you a lie, but your own eyes can't protect you, well then it's over, isn't it? So all of these things they're doing, all of these things are a deliberate assault on the senses. And they do it 
by controlling the language. If you control what someone says, over time, you'll control what they think. You don't think what you don't say. It's very hard to live a life for eight years, if you're lucky, and think things and never say them ever. If you think it, you're gonna say it sometimes. You're gonna give the idea, get some feedback on the idea, build on the idea, change the idea, whatever it is, through discussion. If you never, ever, ever discuss it, you're not gonna think it. So they say, this is the truth, ignore your eyes, and you have to say it's the truth. You can't say it's not the truth. And the people who are in charge of the world, they think generationally, they have time. Right now it's a joke. 200 years from now, it won't be a joke. 200 years from now, it'll all be fucking standard operating protocol. The grandchildren, the people who are in charge now, that, that's what they want. They'll pull it off in the end. Slow, incremental damage. They'll take, they do it with nearly everything. They'll take all your rights away. They'll take 100 of your rights away. They'll upset you. They'll give you 99 back. We're good again. Don't worry. And, and the grandchildren, the people in charge of the world, get what they want in the end. They think generationally. So now we're at the beginning of it. It's all a big joke, right? But especially before Elon had Twitter, when you couldn't say the truth online, when you couldn't say my eyes see X on the internet without going to jail or losing your account or getting a hate speech charge in the UK or some garbage, they're controlling what you think. And on a long enough time frame, what you think becomes true. If two, we all believe two plus two is four, but with a hard enough psyop, if you can't say that, if you have to say it's five, on a long enough time frame, math breaks down and everyone's just gonna believe that two plus two equals five. You, That's what happens. You think we're gonna get there? Have you ever seen the experiment? There's a really interesting experiment with monkeys and a banana and a water spout. Have you ever seen this? They put five monkeys in a, in a room and at the top of the room there was a banana. And when one monkey tried to climb up to get the banana, they turn on the hose and splash all the monkeys with ice cold water. So the monkey would come back down and wouldn't get the banana. And when another monkey would go to climb up, they'd splash all the monkeys with ice cold water. And what would happen over time is, when a monkey went to climb the rope to get the banana, the other monkeys would jump and pull him down and hit him and teach him a lesson. Don't go for that banana. If you go for that banana, we get splashed with water. Mm -hmm. Then they'd swap one of the monkeys out. Now there's a new monkey in the room who doesn't know the game. The new monkey would attempt to climb and all four monkeys would attack the monkey, pull him back down and kick his ass. He knows if he climbs the rope to get the banana, he gets attacked. He doesn't know he gets splashed with water if he, doesn't, if he gets the banana. He doesn't know the game, but he knows if I try and climb, they're gonna attack me. After a certain amount of weeks, they change another monkey, and another monkey, and another monkey. Over time, you have five brand new monkeys who have never been splashed with water ever, but nobody goes to climb the rope because if they do, they're attacked by all the other monkeys, and nobody even knows why. Damn. That's just how it works. If you climb that rope, we beat you up. That's just how it works. That's what they're doing on a long enough time scale to humanity. There are already X amount of people on the planet. There's already a population, X percent, who knows what it is, who ignore their own eyes and repeat what they are told. You can't say that that's not what they're doing because they're already successful with X amount of the population. They've begun. The seed is there. 2%, 3%, 7%, who knows? They've already proven they can do it. Now it's just a matter of not shutting up and hammering, the, the, hammering at home. Make sure they repeat it in schools. Children are young, they believe things are impressionable. Hammer it to the kids, especially. Put it in every Disney movie. Give it to the kids all day long. They grow up sooner or later. Long enough time frame, that's it. It's generational attacks. But do you think that's gonna work though? Because I, I, let me maybe unpack the question. So uh, uh, I'm from Glendale. I went to Glendale High School yeah. and Steloy, right? So yesterday, a big fight broke out in Glendale. Massive, it's all over the news. Yeah. So the fight was over these parents, Armenian parents, who are for four years are like, listen, we don't mind if you're gay, but don't teach our four-year-olds yep. about transgender. Yep. Don't put these books in. Yep. Finally yesterday, big old brawl. Yep. It's all over the news. They're fighting. Armenian parents are like, we're not going to tolerate this. Yep. This is just not going to happen to us, right? Then you go to YouTube. YouTube comes back and says, hey, uh, starting such and such, all the videos that were put up about you know, the election and, you know, whether it was a fake election or not, we're no longer going to give a strike or take those videos down. Yeah. They can stay up there, right? This is totally fine. Then you see uh, uh, the Surgeon General uh, comes out, the attorney, I don't know if you saw this one here, he comes out with an article saying, new Surgeon General Advisory raises alarm about the devastating impact of the epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States. This is the same guy that was part of the camp yeah. is now saying, 
Hey, our epidemic of loneliness and isolation has been an underappreciated public health crisis that has harmed individuals and social health, our relationship, our source of healing, et cetera. Et cetera. This is the same guy that said, wait a minute, lockdown, you know, do this, do that. Yeah. So the more and more arguments are coming out against even ESG, I don't know how close you follow ESG where, why are we doing this? Did you see how much Target lost, $10 billion? Did you see how much Bud Light lost, 25%, 12%? This is no longer working. Well, if you want to, like, even one of the insurance companies I work with, closest, one of our biggest ones we work with, yesterday I see their post on Instagram. Well, because of Pride Month, we're doing this. I know the people in that company, but they just raised a few hundred million dollars. One of the companies they gave the money to was one of these bigger guys, the Vanguard, BlackRock, and, you know, State, State Street. Street. Yeah. So when you take money from those guys, you have to have, you have, to have a certain ESG yeah. score. But a lot of people are now saying this is not a proven formula that it works. Stop doing it. So do you think guys like you, who are maybe in business, who are maybe in church, they're saying, Pope, what are you doing? What are you talking about? Who are maybe in the Christian uh, church, who are maybe in different denominations, yeah. they're in the military sitting back saying, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. So meaning successfully, do you think these guys will be able to manipulate their in agendas down everybody's throat or there's going to be certain people standing up? Well, certainly I'd like to believe that the tide is shifting and we're starting to get some degree of victory against the matrix as a whole. I do believe that the public sentiment is shifting. However, the fight is long and it's very, very difficult because I agree with what you're saying. Only a year ago, I would argue it completely and say it's basically over. I'm actually very impressed with the back, with the, with the ground we've taken back with common sense. But these people operate so slowly. It's generational, these attacks. The attacks we're suffering now were started in the 70s and 80s. They take it over time. And yes, it's fantastic that those parents fought back against that school. That's fantastic. But there's a whole bunch of schools where they didn't. And who knows, okay, that particular book might be removed. A softer version will be implemented. Next year, maybe that book will come back. They, they have all the time in the world, all the money in the world, and they're, they're insulated from these things. That's what's most scary. You talk about Vanguard and BlackRock and all these companies. What's actually scary about it is the people who are making these decisions are completely insulated from the consequences of their decisions. They're in Switzerland. They fly private. They don't care. You think they care about any of this crap? They'll say, oh, do this. Oh, it's caused a riot. They don't live there. They're nowhere near it. They have nothing to do with it. When's the last time you've even seen a politician? Do these people even exist? They're not even near, they have nothing to do with where they, they operate. It's actually amazing. When I was in Dubai once, I think it was about three years ago, I saw the leader of Dubai walking through the mall. I was like, he's a person and he just walks through the mall. I was so impressed. Imagine a, a Western leader walking through the mall. Never, never, never in a million years. He's just pieces of paper, private jet, vanish. All these people are in charge of everything, don't even live in these communities. I do believe that yes, we can win because I don't think you can fight to the best of your ability if all hope is lost. I do believe we're winning and taking ground back, absolutely. And I believe that we're doing that by purely telling the truth. What our eyes see is what's real. And we're doing it in the name of God because you're saying Armenians are strictly religious. I think God and religion is one of the best ways you can combat these things. However, the fight is never ending because they're never ending gonna try and implement. You talk about ESG scores, it's garbage they put together. That's not gonna end. It's just gonna get worse and worse and worse over time. And it's kind of unfortunate and it's kind of upsetting that we still have this system where the people can be unhappy with something. The peasants can revolt to a degree, but does it even really matter at some point? You get to a point of power where you don't care about money. And then things are really difficult, right? When you control everything, you don't care about money. I mean, I'd like to actually argue, we talk about Bud Light. This Mulaney, whatever is it? Is, 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 Dylan Mulvaney. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, Dylan Mulvaney. Sweetheart, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I know we've damaged their share price, et cetera, et cetera. I would believe people who own that company or beyond that company, I don't think they truly give a fuck. In both. I don't think they care. Maybe they care a bit. I don't think they're losing that much sleep over it. Maybe they are a little bit, but I'm saying you get to degrees of power and levels of power where you don't care about money. I'll give you a perfect example of it. I know we keep going back to this, but it was actually a massive pivotal event in awakening so many people was the COVID scam. I said this multiple times in many different countries I visited. I said, if they cared about you, they would have left everything open, maybe put a tax on everything, extra tax percent, whatever, and built hospitals. Why didn't they do that? Why did they, why did they lock you all up? Because it's a mass compliance exercise. They want you to comply. They don't give a shit about your health. They just want you to comply. They want to test how many people comply. And people were saying, yeah, it's all about money. It's all about profit. And I said, that's actually a very optimistic way to look at it. I think that if you destroy the economy and lock everyone in their houses and destroy everyone's businesses, you don't care about money. You're, be you're beyond money. You're above money. You want power and you want control. Because once you become actually rich, you learn that 
the world is all just about people, right? The best things in your life are people. The best things in your life are family. The things that make you happiest are your friends. Your life experience is the best if you have good team around you, good assistants, good helpers, good staff, whatever it is. It's all about people and controlling people. What do you want money for? To get other people to do what you want. That's all money is. I want a Lamborghini. I can't build one. He can. I will pay him to build me a Lamborghini. It's all about people. So once you get beyond a certain level of money and there's a certain level of control you want that money perhaps can't buy, buy, then you think, well, I don't care about the money. I want the power. I don't want money. I want them to stay in their houses. Why? Because it's so. I don't have to. They have to. Ha ha ha. It's funny. And I've said that and sat with people and said, do you really think people in charge of the world are so petty that they would lock everyone in their houses so they can laugh? I say, yeah, I actually do. I think if you were born into a wealthy family where money has precisely zero value and you are arrogant to the moon because you're this whoever and you believe you're God's gift and you don't, a Ferrari ain't gonna make you happy. Who cares about Ferrari? Ferrari's free, it's pennies. You don't care about any of this shit. What makes you happy is everyone respecting you and being afraid of you. To a degree, you're gonna try and influence some power and fear. I think that's what it is. So I think a lot of these companies, when they're doing these things and they're upsetting people, etc., yeah, it's good that we're fighting back, but I also think part of them enjoy the show. I think part of them genuinely enjoy the show. I think part of them go, you know what? Let's do, this is, this is insane. Let's do this. Ah, oh, they're fighting. Uh, I really believe, it. I, I, I know it's a pessimistic way to look at it, but I think they enjoy the show apart. I don't disagree with you in, in regards to that. I can see that how you know, you see it in movies or scenes where, you know, condescending, arrogant, you know, and they kind of want to, they enjoy bullying the guy that can't help himself, right? Hey, do this. Hey, clean up. Pick this up. <laughs> Look at this. He'll do anything that I need him to do, right? I yeah. fully believe that those types of things exist. But, man, empires have fallen so many times it's true. because they thought they can get away with murder. It's true. And then eventually people said, listen, stop. You're not going to do this to me anymore. We're not, we're not going to take a stand. And typically when that happens, you said it earlier, uh, you know, what is really why, what's going on in Glendale or some of these other cities that people are protesting? Why is there an organization called Gays Against Groomers? Yeah. Gays Against Groomers? What? What do you, why, what are you doing? He says, man, I just wanted to be gay and leave me alone. I'm not trying to be, you know, grooming kids. That's not my job. I just want to be gay. Leave me alone. We've made so much progress. Yeah. These guys, I'm not that guy. I'm not yeah. this person, right? Yeah. So I think the part that they fear the most. If you read Communist Manifesto, there's a book written by uh, Cleon Skousen. I think he was like a former yeah. CIA agent for like 15 years. He wrote a book called The Naked Communist. Yeah. One of the things he talks about how getting rid of God, well, they're succeeding in that area, but not fully yet. Yeah. You know, getting rid of the family nucleus, well, we already know what is the purpose of this LGBTQ movement? What is the purpose of this transgender? What is the purpose of, let me get this straight, this person cannot buy a gun at 13. This person cannot go in the military at 13. This person cannot vote at 18. This person cannot own a car at 13, but they can transition the most, the most important decision of their lives you're okay with? Yes. So, now, that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't make sense to me. I think you said something at the beginning, the, the concept of being tolerant. You know what, yeah, it's okay, we can have gays. Oh, it's okay, we can have this. It's okay. Uh, listen, man, uh-uh, you've crossed the line a little bit. Yeah. I think faith, family, kids, values, principles, they fear the hell out of it. Absolutely. And I think that community is rising up. No, you're totally right. But you made a really interesting point there about empires falling. And this is where I kind of feel like we're inter entering a new stage of the world because it's never really done before. Because typically when empires fell, the world was far more polarized. If the empire fell, there was nowhere for the corrupt dictators of said empire to go. The empire's fallen, or I say, let's say England fell. You can't, it's very hard to get exile in France. You could do it a little bit. But let's say America fell today. Let's say it completely collapsed and it fell. The people who archetyped that downfall, do you think they'd be in America? Do you think they'd be sitting there waiting to get scooped up? Do you even know who they are? Can you recognize them? What's their name? Even if you could, do you think they're in America or do you think they're skiing in Switzerland? This globalism, the whole point of globalism is that they don't care when empires fall. When you globalize the world, then you have a chess board. Oh, I lost the knight, doesn't matter, Pope Bishop. Sack the queen, who cares? And there's so many things I want to say, but I don't want to die. But there's truth, that this can be proven and shown even with this current proxy war. Europe and all the gas prices and the inflation rate in Europe has gone to the moon to fund this proxy war in Ukraine. Why has this happened? Because America's in charge of everything, and America has decided that Europe has to bear the brunt of the bullshit for its proxy war. You're going to have higher gas prices, you're going to have inflation, you're going to have mass civil unrest, you're going to deal with it all. 
and we're going to sit over here and insulate ourselves because we have the global reserve currency, and the war is going to happen over there, and everyone's going to die, and we're in charge. So it, now we have this globalism. How can an empire fall when you have basically two camps? <laughs> There's two teams now. There's two sides left. So it's, it's a, it's, it, I agree with you completely about empires falling, but I'm saying if the empires fell in days of old, the kings would be strung up. But now when the empire falls, nobody notices. It doesn't matter. We don't know who the kings are. We don't know who's in charge. We don't know where they are. They're not going to be anywhere near the trouble. That's for fucking sure. They're going to be somewhere else. Oops. Oh, well. And do they really care? Do, do the people in charge of the world care if America's crime rate goes up 1,000%? Would they lose sleep at night? I actually think they do partially because think about it. So I'm, I'm with Andrew Schultz and I'm taking your position with him. Yep. Okay, you know who Andrew Schultz yep. is? Good guy. And he says, you know, part of me that gives me comfort is knowing these guys are so obsessed with their money. He may be wrong. This yep. is, we can debate this. Yep. They're so obsessed with their money that there's no way they're going to let America fall because if America falls, everything else falls. So they're, they're going to go just as much as they can to control, but not enough to get the machine to break because they're so in love with money and power, they don't want to give that up. Well, I hope that's true. I would love for that to be true. But my argument is that these people are already so deeply entrenched, they print the money. They'll print the new money. They don't care. If they cared about money, COVID wouldn't have happened. They closed the entire economy. I don't think they care about money. I think they, con I think they control the world to a level where you want to eat? You want war? Like, I don't think they give a shit about money. They'll print the new money. They'll change the name of it and print the new one. At a certain level of power, I think they're so above and beyond all of our concepts of how the world works that they don't have any interest in any of it. I don't think they give a shit. I think if you were to go to these people, whoever they are, and say, we're going to take your money away, they would just laugh at you. You think you can take my money? You think you understand money? You think you're going to damage the stock market? You think I give a shit about the share price? I think there's a level beyond all of this. And they're the ones who truly are running things and they truly have no influence. And in fact, the harder they damage the economy and the, the more damage they do to money, the more people are dependent on governments to eat. That's where communism comes from, right? The more yeah. poor we get, the more you need the government just so you have food in your mouth. How can you resist the government if they feed you? You can't. So yeah, like, and I sound pessimistic and I'm not pessimistic. And I do believe the answer to all of these things is free thinking and truth and God and communities standing up for themselves and changing the general consensus. I do believe that. Because to a degree, although we talk about people who run the world, to a degree we run the world. Because our tolerance level is what runs the world. There's more of us than them. So to a degree you say, who's in charge of the world? Well, I like to say, well, we are. Because it's all about, we're, we're, the, abu we're the abused wife in this relationship. How much crap are we going to put up with? We're, we set the limit. They're going to come at us with everything they can, right? We set the limit. But the problem is they try very, very hard to one, increase our limit to the max, which yeah. is tolerance. Yeah. And two, to divide us to the point where we don't ever unite long enough. I love what happened in Glendale, what you just told me about. That should be happening in every single school across America, all of them. Oh, they would love it if you retweet the video for them and give more exposure. I will do. You know, it, it's, it, it, when you're saying this, I'm reading a book right now, Robert Moses. I don't know if you know who he is or not, power broker. This is a guy, it would be a very interesting guy for you to study. This is the guy that built New York, yeah. okay? And he came up and uh, uh, hated, uh, uh, complicated person, misunderstood. Uh, the more they would push him back, the more he stood up. The more they would say, no, this is not fair what you're doing, the more he would even say, I'm going I'm to go more, even more extreme. And so if, if in New York you mention the name Robert Moses, there's going to be a camp that's going to say scumbag, racist, white supremacist, all this stuff. And there's a side that's going to say, this guy built a bridge. This guy did this. This guy did that. He, he, he would make it so hard for a certain community to go to the nicer community. He would put the car, you know, the bridge so low that trucks couldn't go through because he didn't want the bad people to go yeah. into this. Like he was that... Yeah. Sure. And one time in, in the book, they talk about how Robert Moses, he says, look, the one thing about Robert Moses, he could give a shit about money. He could give a shit. About, it, it was all about his influence over. So I agree. There are certain people that don't care about money. Yeah. They're more driven by control, influence, all of that. The part that, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about the movie Fury, Vinny. And you give me this whole thing about Fury, the scene where Shia LaBeouf is reading out of the Bible and he's crying while he's reading this. And then, right, if you want to text me, what's, what the, and, and then afterwards, you see uh, Brad Pitt quotes exactly what scripture it was, but they never showed how much faith he had. Yeah. 
And the whole point was, I'm ready to die. Yeah. We know we're here. Yeah. This is going to be happening. We're in the tech. There's no. I think the people. There's a part about Trump. Uh, I had a girl on Whitney Webb. I don't know if you know who Whitney Webb is. We had her on. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. And we start talking about different things. And I'm, yeah, I've been having a lot of weird guests on lately. And making a comparison between the Kennedy family and Trump pisses a lot of people off. Yeah. But those two families, forget the fact that one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. They were both anti-establishment. Yeah. They were both anti-military industrial complex. They were both anti-CIA, anti-FBI, anti-all of this stuff, right? Yeah. We saw what happened with Kennedy. We saw what happened with Reagan. We saw what happened with Lincoln. All these guys were anti-establishment guys. We saw what happened with Trump. Yeah. The part about Trump that, you know, made the other side uncomfortable is, okay, we can kill the guy. That's been the strategy for a long time. You can't really do it today as much because they fear one thing that they're the most jealous and envy. You know what that is? They don't want, they do not want to build a martyr. Yes. They fear building a martyr yeah. because that's the ultimate yeah. high that they want to get. They yeah. do not want to build a martyr, right? So, okay. We're going to humiliate the crap out of you. We're going to embarrass the crap out of you. We're going to publicly try to do this. We're going to come in between you and your kids. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to go get your daughter to be more yep. LGBT. We're going to get her to be on this side. And we're going to pin this. That's the strategy. Yep. We're going to put the, the break the entire family apart, right? And he still stands up there. Yep. And, and to them, it's like, what the hell do we need to do yeah. for you to you know, just sit down and be quiet, not willing to do it? That's right. Do you think, again, going back to it, more of those types of men and women who are misunderstood and complicated stories. They, they're not perfect, far from it. Yeah. More of those guys are the ones that are saying, yeah, it's just not gonna happen on my watch, man. And that's what we need. And the, the, by the very nature of being the kind of person who's principled enough to risk his own personal situation in life, if you have principles that strong, you're gonna be disliked by some people. You're never gonna have a person who is principled enough to take risk to his public detriment for the good of what he believes in, who's liked by everybody. That, that's a logic fail, right? Because he has principles which are hard lines and people exist across the entire spectrum. So there's gonna be people who exist outside of those lines. That's what I liked about Trump. He's not perfect, of course not, but he says what he means, he means what he says. I actually disagree with him on many things, but he says what he means, he means what he says, and that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of a man who says what he means and means what he says because he can't be bought, because he's principled. He can't be bought. Even now, me, if they were to come to me with $100 million and say, we'll sponsor you with this company, it's $100 million, you just have to shut up. I'd say, no, I don't want your money. I don't want the money. I don't need money. There's nothing else to buy. I've bought everything. I don't need it. I buy principles worth more. So, and that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of principles, and it goes back to the original point. They're trying to remove all of our morality, all of our baseline understanding of things. Minect is an application which allows you to take a minute to connect with influencers from all around the world. My name is Andrew Tate, and I'm available to speak directly to you on Minect. That's, that's how they in inject you with the slave mind. That's exactly what it is, and you're right. Hum history has always been that way. And now it's under conscious assault. I've never said this before, I've never even thought this before, this is a brand new thought for me. But I would like to think in times of old, in history, perhaps everybody was the same. Everybody was principled, everybody had parameters, but they were different parameters. Perhaps they were competing ideas. But I think in the modern world, it's not so much competing parameters. It's just people who believe in things, people who don't believe in anything besides what they're fucking told that changes every day. They're just, you have the empty brains, the, the slave minds, and the people who actually stand up for something. And the free slave, thinkers. And the free thinkers. But the slave minds, you can't say, well, they believe in a different ideology because they don't. They believe in what they're told to believe in on that particular day. It changes. They don't have any true core belief. They just repeat. I talk about the matrix all the time and people say, why did you choose that terminology? And I chose that terminology because it is perfectly accurate in describing exactly what is happening. The matrix is a computer program which is designed to control your mind so that your body can be used to power the machines. That's exactly what happens when they make you watch the news to control your mind so you can continue to use your body to work some garbage job and suffer from inflation and power the machines. The machines being soulless people who are in charge of the world. But there's also a million other different ways you can compare the matrix to the real world. In the matrix, they say, anybody can become an agent at any time. If their mind is not unplugged, they become an agent. If their mind is not freed, they turn into an agent. You can see that in real life. Mention COVID to an NPC. Mention Trump to an NPC. You can sit and have a perfectly cordial, normal conversation with somebody for an hour. 
and be fine. And you can mention one of the particular subjects mm. which they are programmed to hate by the matrix itself, and they will turn into an agent in real time. And you will see them now start to genuinely emotionally dislike you as a person. They were your friend for an hour. Yeah. Now they hate you. They will turn into an agent. COVID was perfect. I would sit with people and we'd all be friends until I mentioned that COVID's garbage. And they would... <laughs> now they're an agent. What do you mean COVID's garbage? My friend's grandma was 99 and she got sick. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> that doesn't change my view. And they change. And, and the matrix is actually a perfect, absolute explanation of what's happening. And, and Morpheus says it, if your mind's not freed, you can be one of them. And that's what's happening. And this is why we have, we don't have competing sets of parameters which are trying to argue about which is the best way to run the world. We have people with parameters who believe in family and love and God and tradition and taking care of yourself and taking care of others. There's people with moral standard and there's people with none, zero. Empty vessels, agents who are programmed on any given day of what they're supposed to care about. These people can't tell me they care about things. That's what's most annoying about my position because it's absolutely and utterly weaponized virtue they use against me. The people who hate me, hate me because one, I, I truly believe, and I know this is arrogant to say, but I feel like I have to say it. There's huge, there's definitely a massive jealousy implement. If I wasn't so tall and rich and good looking, it wouldn't be happening. They don't fucking like me. They don't like me because I remind them of the jock at school that took their girl. That's part of it, right? They don't like me personally. So they can't, they try, it's true. So they try and find an attack vector. And what happens when you have somebody who's monumentally successful across all realms of human endeavor, the only way you can attack them is by calling them a bad person. They can't, can't call me stupid, they can't call me ugly, can't call me broke, can't call me weak, can't, they can't call me any of these things. So how do we attack this guy? Well, he's a bad person. How do you call someone a bad person? You weaponize virtue. None of the people, none, who are pretending to give a shit about women and that I'm bad to protect women, have any interest in protecting women. None of these people think I better become physically strong to protect women. None of, none of them even believe in protecting a woman in a physical scenario. None of them even believe in protecting their family. None of them have any, none of them donate to any charities that involve women, nothing. They're just taking the virtue and weaponizing it and attacking me with it. Me as a person, who donates $25 million a year to charity to feed both male and female children. Me as a person who believes I have a responsibility to be physically capable so that any woman I'm walking down the street with is safe. I do more for women than any of these clowns would ever do. But they're just weaponizing virtue and attacking me with it. It's not even genuine virtue. That's what's so upsetting about it. These people, the matrix-minded people, have so few parameters and so few virtue. Whenever there's virtue inside of them, it's only so they can take it, weaponize it, and fire it at you. They don't give a shit about any of the issues they talk about. They don't care about race. They don't care about women. They don't care about gays. None of it. They take it, they put it in a bullet, and they shoot it at the people they don't like. It's all fake. All of it. When you were, when you were talking about this... Um... I wrote all these things down that we're talking about. Principal virtues, God, parents, true believers, fighters, traditions. These people they fear, right? All these people they fear. And these guys are slowly but surely starting to stand up. The scene we're talking about with Shia LaBeouf, he says what we're doing here is a righteous act. Here's a Bible verse I think about sometimes, many times. This is his words. It goes, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And he began crying and said, Here I am, send me. Brad Pitt turns around and says, Book of Isaiah chapter 6. For me, <clears throat> in my own business, I asked this question the other day. I'm so curious to get your thoughts on this. For the longest time, when I got into business, I was you know, a younger guy, 21. I'm like, okay, very coachable. Tell me, what do I got to do? I'm a coachable guy. What do I got to do? I'm a coachable guy. Super coachable. I want to make money. I'm sick of time of being broke. My dad's at the 99 cents. Too, too many heart attacks. I want to get out of this. Yep. So I'm like, hey, Patrick, basic stuff. When you're doing business and you're talking to rich people, I'm Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. Never talk religion. Never talk politics. Never talk sex. Just don't talk about those three things. I said, okay, guess what? Never talk politics. Never talk religion, never talk sex. No problem. We're going to business. So what do you think about the political climate today, Patrick, Ben David? Yeah. Oh, what do you think? Yeah. You know, well, I think this, this is, but what do you think, Patrick? I don't know, you know, quite frankly, I think I'm trying to figure it out for myself right now, but we'll see what's going to happen, like, you know, the, whatever yeah, yeah, way you're yeah. deflecting yeah. and you kind of go on your phone. Hey, what do you think about God? What, what is your opinion on Islam or Muslim? Yeah. Well, you know, for me, you know, yeah. you deflect that. Eventually, you're sitting there, you're like, the people that I know at that level, want to talk about those three topics. Yep. Now, sex is maybe off camera and they're kind of having fun with yeah, it, yeah, yeah. but they want to talk about politics and religion. Yep. 
So we, for the longest time, have been silenced, and now the ESG community, all this time they've told us to stay quiet, and they're saying what? They're talking politics, yeah. they're talking religion, yeah. and they're talking sex. Sex the way through LGBTQ, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? It's normal, it's normal, it's normal. No, it's not normal. Yeah. Well, listen, you guys shouldn't talk about politics and sex and religion, shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. And then you see this one, you know, during COVID, one pastor, Australia, Syrian man. I don't know what his name is, Benny. What's his name? The Aust Syrian pastor, priest from uh, Australia. And he was uh, fighting all the anti-COVID guidelines. And he's, yeah. his stuff is going viral. He's yeah. doing this. And you see these messages. Some of the people that stood up, they stood up because they feared God. Yeah. Okay. And for you, with your life, it's been interesting watching you go through your evolution of your faith. Yeah. Pre 2022, former atheist, couple yep. of the things you've said in the past, God isn't real because you can't prove it. Yep. Okay, kind of like uh, that was more the Malcolm X argument, right? Yep. Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people yep. far too often for God to exist. Yep. I'm the center of my universe. That's yep. pre 2020. Yep. Then gradually you start talking about Christianity and yep. you know, in 2020 you made a video announcing that you were wrong about what you had said previously about God, right? Yep. Now you start saying people are, uh, who are atheists are angry, bad energy people, and I don't want to be uh, on that team anymore. And even if God is not real, the world is a better place if people do believe in God. I know God is real because there's so much evil in the world that there has to be an equal and opposite force. The devil can't exist if God does not. And if you look at the world today, it is very obvious that the devil does not exist. And I'll go to the last one here with Muslim. Quotes from you. Christians don't have a religion anymore because they tolerate everything and stand for nothing. Yeah. And, and by the way, I actually agree with you, the fact that they are, they're tolerating way too much. Islam is the last religion on the planet. God is something to be feared, respected, and to prove yourself to, which means you gotta earn his right. Yeah. It's a, hey, I wanna earn your right and your respect, right? How did you go, if you don't mind talking about sure. your own evolution, because us as men, if you knew me at 25 years old, you probably would have liked that party with me. I was a selfish guy. I was a guy you would have thought I was, right? Yeah. And we go through this phase of where the selfishness kind of comes down a little bit. You still need to be yeah. selfish because you need to be driven. Yeah. But to the point where you're like, listen, man, I got to really do something. And then somehow, some way, God enters. What's been your evolution of your faith and where, where are you at today? Yeah, I think Newton's, I think it's third law, equal and opposite force, what you just said there is absolutely true. There has to be an equal and opposite force to all the evil in the world. And that, the equal and opposite force to all that evil has to be God. And I've talked about this at length even with atheists. And I try and say that regardless of whether you're an atheist or not, you're thinking of God as a man in the sky. But you need to think of God as a concept as a whole. And once you do that, it's impossible to accept that he doesn't exist, right? I said to the atheist, I said, let's say there was two islands. You're shipwrecked, right? And there's two islands. Both of them are full of savages. On one island, you and your friend are shipwrecked. On one island, your friend goes and he crashes and they, they kill him and they eat him. And you go to another island and they want to kill you and eat you, but they don't because it's against their religion. Mm -hmm. Did God save your life? Who cares? Who doesn't even know the name of their God? But their God said, don't kill shipwrecked survivors. And now you're alive. So their God saved your life. The concept of God in and of itself saved your life. You owe God just for the concept of it, the idea of it. So even the idea of opposing evil as a whole is a belief in God. So you're either an evil person or you believe in God in some regard. And then I became, once I understood that there had to be an equal and opposite force, I was raised Christian. I live in a Christian nation. Romania is actually, I think the second or third most Christian country on earth. It's a very Christian country here. There's churches everywhere. They, they strongly believe. And that's where I began my journey. But I always had a very healthy respect for Islam because I understand that to a degree, to have a religion at all, you have to have an intolerance to a degree. Because without an intolerance, you don't have rules. You don't have laws. You don't have any, like you said, you have to earn God's respect. If you're a religion which is tolerant of everything, then you don't have to earn God's respect. You can be a bad person and do bad things. God loves me, so it's fine. Well, no, it's not, because that's not the point of the religion. So then you extrapolate that out, and I was sitting and thinking, well, what's the primary function of a religion? And the primary function of a religion, I don't believe it's the religion exists so I can live forever. I mean, that's a, that's a nice thought. But I think on a macro level, the primary objective of a religion is to restore and contain some degree of traditional value within the society. How do you judge, let me change the way I, I worded that. How do you judge the success of a religion? 
I don't think you can judge it by the number of people who join it, because there's lots of people who are Catholic who don't act Catholic. They don't act in any way particularly Christian. Anyone can say they're something. You can walk into a strip club and everyone says they're oh, Christian. It doesn't mean anything, right? So how do you judge the success of a religion? Well, I like to think the best way to judge the success of a religion is how successful is it at fighting evil? How successful is it at preserving the morality of a population in X parameter, in, in X geographical area? So when you look at it from that way, you can't say that Islam isn't the most successful religion on earth. It's the most successful in regards to opposing evil. It's the most successful in regards to opposing its differing viewpoints. It's the most successful in regards to having people act within the, the limits and the confines of what it finds to be moral and good to God. It's the most adhered to. It's the most feared. It's the most respected in most forms. And then also I'd like to think... I, I would say it's the most feared. Yeah, it's the most feared. But what is respect without fear? Do, do we respect men we don't fear? If there's a man who could do absolutely nothing to you on any level at all, you might be nice to him, sure, because we're not bad people, but would you really respect him? If you could take his chick in front of his face, set his car on fire, and he wouldn't do a thing, you wouldn't respect him. You might be nice to him because we're not bullies, but you wouldn't respect him. Respect and fear are linked. They're not always the same thing, and you can, you can maybe have fear without respect, but it's very hard to have respect without fear. And also, I, I, I heard someone say once that we see the world as we see ourselves. If you're a thief, you think everyone's a thief. If you're a liar, you think everyone's a liar. And I, I kind of agree with that. I understood that. I also like to think we see religion as we see ourselves. I like to see myself as a person whose respect you have to earn. I like to see myself as a person who has strong, rigid boundaries. I like to see myself as a person who will stand up and say, no, that's wrong. I like to see myself as a person who's not afraid of being shamed by whatever community for saying, I don't agree with that particular ideal. I like seeing myself that way. So if I'm going to see myself that way, then I'm going to naturally align with a religion that operates within that form. So when I say Islam is the last religion on earth, I say it because it seems to be the only one who will stand up and say, no, we don't care. No, that's not what the book says. No, I was raised Christian and, and Muslims as a whole, we have no problems with Christians. None at all. I don't want anyone to think I'm anti-Christian and like I dislike Christians. We don't have a problem with Christians. We believe in a lot of the same things. We believe in Jesus. We put more respect on the name of Jesus than most Christians do. I just don't like the idea of people saying they're a Christian and saying, but because I'm a Christian, I can do whatever I want and throw all the rules away and none of it matters. Because once you have that level of tolerance, you no longer have a religion. Islam seems to be the last religion left with parameters. If you don't have parameters, you don't have a religion at all. So the closer I found myself to God, the closer I, self I found myself to Islam. That's just how it ended. And Andrew, speaking of fear, one could argue that Islam these days, certainly in the last 20 years with the war on terror, they've also been the most vilified. Absolutely. Right? So you know, everything that we've seen happen with extremism yeah. and everything that's going on all over the world. How are you grappling with that? You've been a Christian yeah. for, for years now, Islam, everything. And, and you know what's, you know what, that's such an interesting question because when I was younger, especially when I was an atheist, I would, I would sit and I'd sit and think, people are really doing terror attacks and, and doing all this crazy stuff because, you know, they're upset over a cartoon. That's so stupid. And I, nobody should kill mm -hmm. anybody. Nobody should kill anybody. Charlie Hebdo, everything yeah, that Nobody should yeah. kill anybody. Nobody should kill anybody. I'll make that very clear. But also part of me is now saying, why would you want to insult the prophet for billions of people? Why would you want to do that? I'm not saying you, I'm not even, I don't even want to make the argument against free speech. I'm not even saying you couldn't be allowed to. This is a sensitive subject. I'm mm -hmm. just saying, what kind of person wakes up and thinks, I want to do that. I don't know. I just don't think that's a healthy mindset. Like when I see these Satanists and they're, especially in America, and they're doing, let's keep it on Christianity, these Satanists and they're dressing up Jesus as gay and all this stuff like, that's not done in any kind of good faith. There's no good reason to do that. That's done with genuinely malicious mm -hmm. intention. And what kind of people want to do that? And then the answer by extension is, I thought America was a Christian country. So how can you have a Christian country where the, the prophets of the religion are mocked to the highest possible levels within the confines of the country and, and it's promoted? Is that a Christian country? Doesn't seem like a Christian country to me. I don't think the same thing would happen with Islam in Saudi Arabia. I can't imagine that happening. So how can you say we're a Christian country, but everyone's mocking our God on the streets? Ha, ha, ha. It's, it's on Netflix. Ha, ha, ha. That's not a Christian country to me. So if you're not a Christian country, then where's the religion? Where, the religion's supposed to enforce certain boundaries. You're supposed to at least show it respect, mm -hmm. you know? And it's also kind of interesting because in Christian countries, there's more respect for Islam than there is for Christianity. 
in a Christian country. Name one. They still don't do it with the Islamic prophet. Why do you think that is? It's too much smoke. It's just not worth the heat. <laughs> because, because people believe. And I'm not advocating for violence on any level. I'm saying that even these degenerates who are trying to destroy people's belief in God, like we've discussed earlier, because they don't want you to have any baseline morality. If you believe in God, there are commandments, yes and no. That baseline morality prevents you being an absolute slave. So they're trying to destroy it. But even those degenerates who are trying to mock and disgrace God understand there's a point where it just backfires and, ooh, this is smoke. And they don't want the smoke. And shouldn't God be feared? I'm scared of God. It's the only thing I fear. I fear God. They can put me in jail. I know I'm telling the truth. God's on my side. I fear God. So God should be feared. So once again, does anybody fear the Christian God? I haven't seen anybody scared of him in a long time. And it's kind of crazy because it's very interesting. The max, the, like the mass migration and all these things are leftist policies, but then also Islam is the most right-wing religion on earth. It's kind of very interesting. I grew up in England and I grew up in Luton, which is a town which is mainly Muslim. It's, like this, it's a huge Islamic community. And there was a bunch of English people who were complaining about there's too much immigration, we're losing our culture. And I understood their point absolutely. But these are the same people complaining about all the left-wing LGBT in schools and all these issues. And I was like, the only allies you have against this are the Muslims. They're the only allies you have in any of this. The Christians don't protest against any of this stuff. The Christians don't, the Christ, there's very few Christians who will get up off their ass and complain. In fact, I saw on Twitter yesterday, one of the churches was lit up in rainbow. I have nothing against gay people, I don't care. And that's actually another point I want to make into about this thing. I think most people don't care, and I think that bothers them. Have you ever had, a, have you ever had an argument with a girl, and she's like stropping around the house, she's huffing and puffing, and you just don't give a shit? So she has to keep upping the ante till you eventually go, what's the problem? Because she tried the low-level stuff, and you didn't care? I kind of feel like this has a remnant of that. I'm gay, cool. I want to get married. I want to wave my dick in your kid's face. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. I feel like they're like, they, they tried to annoy us and we're like, we don't give a shit. Do whatever you want. Be a person. We don't what care. A point. And now they're like, okay, well, we have to get to a limit where they have to react. Yeah. We want attention now. We want them to care about What's this. the right move on that? Well, that's, and that's the point. You know, it's, it's difficult because there comes a point where you simply have to address it and so now you have to oppose it. And this is, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but this is why they're so careful and so clever with what they do. They package it all together. LGBTQ, I would argue, I don't know what Q is, firstly. Sorry, I don't know what Q is. Questioning. Q, all right. LG, I would argue that G and T are very different things. Beyond. A gay man and a, someone who's chopped the dick off are very different things. Completely. So they package it all together, so now, because the, the spectrum of your enemy is so large, you have people who are complete fully this way. Mm -hmm. You have people who we accept and are normal in society. We have no problem with gay people. And they put it all together. You're an enemy of all these people. And they complicate the argument and they mix it all together. And now you're a bigot. And really, you just want your kids to be left alone. Really, you just want to leave the children alone. Of course. All you want to do is leave your kids alone. And then it's like, okay, I'm now raising children. I have more children than most people would believe. How do I protect my children from this insanity? God. Which God can protect my children? Allah, Islam, I'll move them to Dubai or Saudi Arabia and none of this will happen. Can I trust a Christian nation? Some of them, Romania is a Christian nation and to a large degree, they oppose quite a lot of this stuff. But they're also NATO and they're also EU and they also rely on bailouts and grants and money. And on a long enough time frame, even in the seven years I've lived here, I have watched certain attitudes change because money buys influence and power. So Andrew, uh, not to cut you off, how much of you converting from Christianity to Islam is actually the belief in God versus the societal pressures that are facing it's children? Because it seems like it's a little bit of both. For you to believe in God, you have to respect him. How can I believe and put, the, put my life in the hands of someone I don't respect? And I'm going to respect a God which is feared. Yeah, but it's a vertical relationship, right? It's not a horizontal. If you base... Uh, if you base it horizontally, they're going to disappoint you. If you think about, uh, 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 if you're going to believe, let's go believe Prophet Muhammad, yeah. his teaching, and let's go believe the Bible, NIV, and Jesus, Father, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his, you know, yeah. you gave your son for me? Yeah. Let's say that's true, yeah. and you're doing it based on faith? Who would do such a thing for me? Yeah. What, a, what a level of sacrifice for you to do that? Who am I for you to 
be so worried about me. If, if you look at it from that angle, it's not necessarily coming from a place of fear. It's coming from a place of grace. It's coming from a, pl grace, a place of love. It's coming from a place of, Absolutely. you know, a, a, a different feel. Because I do believe uh, the, the part that upsets me is the fear aspect. That they're allowing others to mock your God, to mock, mock Jesus, to mock whatever religion it is you're a part of. And you're kind of like, oh, they're just funny, man. It's no, it's not funny. You just cross the line. Like, JC has that one line where he says, don't tell me why you, the guy, yeah. what the guy said about me. Tell me why he was so comfortable saying it to you. 100%. You tell me why he said say it comfortable to you. So I think that's the part about uh, faith. I understand when you're saying the fear and the respect side. So th that's the part where fear is needed. I totally agree. Yeah. But the part where you, you were making a point about LGBTQ, you're like, I don't even know yeah. what Q stands for. It's questioning. And then you're like, well, I'm gay? Okay, cool. Yeah. Trans? Listen, man, yeah. spectrum. And he said, on the, if we were to say which religion is the far right, it's going to be yeah. Muslim. Yeah. Totally get it. They're on the far right. Christian today is kind of going center left today. Like they're kind of being soft right now. Okay. So if I want to raise my kids, I'm going to take my kids to you know, Dubai, and I'm going to take my kids to Saudi Arabia. Why? Because I'm defending against some of these immoral philosophies that they have. Yeah. I don't want to go there. I actually understand that argument. Yeah, and, and I truly, and I want to make one more point, I do believe there is one God, and I believe there's many different paths to God. And I am not a religious scholar, and I'm not an expert on Islam. I'm doing my best, and I'm reading the Quran as, as often as I can. And it does say that Christians on the Day of Reckoning will see how close they were to the truth. And we are, we are allies. We are not enemies in any regard, Christians and Muslims. And I do believe that the idea of Christians and Muslims shaking hands and saying, let's put an end to a lot of this garbage would be fantastic. I'm not anti-Christian in any regard. I just found myself, as I became more and more religious, seeking and looking for a faith which not only I could be proud of, but a faith which was guiding in regards to I don't know what a Christian would answer to certain questions nowadays. What does a Christian answer to? I'm a transsexual and I want to show your kids my genitals. What's a Christian? Well, a Christian's supposed to say no, do they? I know what my, I know what my Muslim friends would say. I, I don't know. If you're a Christian, I don't know how you're supposed to act. I don't know what you're supposed to adult. I don't get it anymore. The, the true believer says The true no. believer. The true, the true believer. believer. Yeah. But how many are true believers? In, I, mean, I don't know. I see all over Twitter, all these churches are losing their minds. I, it's, it's just, it seems very complicated. Islam seems very, very simple. You know what's right, you know what's wrong. I have a question uh, regarding, we talked about tolerance yeah. and acceptance. And the other ex end of that is extremism. Yeah. So I'm a Jew, yeah. Christian, newfound Muslim, yeah. respect, look at us all yeah. hanging out here. Yeah, in it's Romania. the beginning of a joke somewhere. You know, so <laughs> I, you know, we're talking about accepting yeah. the, being, I have gay friends, yeah. I have lesbian friends, yeah. bisexual. Yeah. Okay. The T stuff is what, it's yeah. kind of like, all right, what's actually even happening here? You know, I'm not a, yeah. this is not my wheelhouse nor any of our wheelhouses, yeah. but one could argue that, you know, on the, on the opposite end of the acceptance and the yeah. tolerance is like absolute extremism. Yeah. And I'm sure the allies of the LGBT will point to Islam and point to the Middle Eastern countries and yeah. point to the North African countries that have Islam as their religion and say they are the most extreme when it comes to LGBT. They say that it should be illegal yeah. to be gay. And in some countries, you should be killed if you are gay. Super this is just, I'm just pointing you're out right. stats. You're right, and it's a super interesting argument because I will, I will sit here and say that I guarantee in most Islamic countries, there are gay people and I guarantee that they have gay relationships and nobody cares as long as they're not trying to inflict on the children. It's illegal to walk down the street and do indecent things in front of children. But I guarantee if you were gay in a lot of these countries, privately. no, privately, nobody would care because they're trying to preserve the family unit. And to a degree, you have to always protect innocence. When you were talking about extremism, I would be friends with a gay person. Yes, I'm a Muslim, but I would be friends with a gay person because if a full grown man decides to make a decision, it's his decision to make. But I must protect innocence as a man, so I must protect children. If two, men, if two full grown men decide to have a fight, let them fight. If a full grown man decides to pick on a kid, that's unacceptable. So I must protect innocence. Mm -hmm. So I agree with the extremism point, but I have no problem with full-grown men doing what they want to do. Maybe some Islamic scholars are going to watch this and get mad at me. I don't have a problem being gay, with gay people and being friends with a gay person. I don't care. My problem is when you take a person who is unarmed, who is innocent, who is programmable like a child, and start inflicting your worldview on them. That is disgusting and it's immoral. That is unfair and it can't be accepted on any level. And that's the reason homosexuality is genuinely outlawed in these countries. Not because they fear what two full-grown men are going to do. 
They fear what's happened in the West. So two full grown men are gonna purport on the minds of children which aren't theirs. That's what they're afraid of. You know, I don't know if you saw the interview. Uh, CNN uh, uh, is interviewing this uh, in Africa. And I have the video, I don't wanna play the video. Obviously oh, the, the, the leader. Yes, and the he's leader. talking about democracy. He says, democracy says, look, you can do whatever you want to do. He says, what do you think about gays? And his reaction was like, what do you mean? What they do, I don't, think, I don't agree with what they do. Yeah. You think that's okay? Anyways, he's given his argument, yeah. right? And a lady's reaction is like, how could you? Yeah. He says, look, you keep your beliefs to you. Do not bring it to our country here, right? Uh, the, the, the challenge goes back to, remember how you're like the girl that you're dating? is like, so what happened? I asked you to bring the oranges from the store. How come you didn't bring it? Yeah, I, I forgot. Hey, so how about this? And, and you know, that's why you love your mom more than you love me. And, that, and you're like, oh, shit, you're going to go around them. And now there's a fight, right? Okay. Well, is the mistake being too tolerant from the beginning? Is the mistake being too accepting from the beginning? Is the mistake of, you know, you, you know like the, the fear when I talk to Second Amendment guys and the fear about, well, you know, what's wrong with them doing background checks? What's wrong with them doing this? He says, look, that's, that's how it starts. You give them the background checks, then they're gonna come for everything. Oh, you're over-exaggerating. No one's coming for your guns. Well, you also said 20 years ago, Hillary Clinton, marriage is between a man and a woman and the sanctity of marriage 20 years later. So that is the fear where one must watch this as a case study. Say somebody starting a new country and saying, look, here's where we stand. These are the laws we're not touching. We're not gonna be doing X, Y, Z. You've been too tolerant and now you're paying the price for it and now you're reacting to it. And that's exactly why you completely nailed it. If you give an inch, to take a mile. And that's why I think in a lot of these countries, they have an official, it's officially illegal. They're actually quite tolerant of it, more than you'd believe. I'm telling you, you can go to Jordan and your waiter will be a bit fruity. You can tell. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit, right? But they have it officially illegal to prevent it ever bleeding out into actually affecting the mindset of society. You can do what you want, you're a full-grown man, but society is based on family, traditional family values. That's how our society is based. That's how we show ourselves to the world, and that is not going to be affected or changed. I was going to say, that's yeah. why you see the, the, you talk about the collapse of Western society, specifically America. You see a decline in values. Wall Street Journal came out with that article that said family values plummeting, religion plummeting, uh, being a social, uh, being community organizer plummeting. All, everything's plummeting in America other than money. People are... Uh, focusing on money. Minect is an application which allows you to take a minute to connect with influencers from all around the world. My name is Andrew Tate, and I'm available to speak directly to you on Minect. So, so it's interesting, while you're, while you're talking about this whole religion thing, while you're in, who has reached out to want to support? We talked about this last time briefly. Yeah. Uh, uh, being a Muslim yourself, have some of the most powerful Muslims reached out, trying to help out, figuring out a way to get you out? Yeah, absolutely. They certainly have. And also the amount of mail I got from Muslims around the world was completely incredible. When I was in the cell with Tristan, he even said, he said, well, I'm Christian. Nobody's written to me. Uh, so, yeah, so it was kind of amazing the support we, that you have from the, the Brotherhood and you certainly feel part of the family and I've had a lot of support from them as a whole. Um, it was Ramadan at the time I was in jail, so my first Ramadan was in jail. So that was certainly interesting because you eat when the sun goes down. And my meal came when the sun was up. So I'd have to cover it up and try and hide it from cockroaches and wait for the sun to go down and then eat it cold by myself. But I felt like, you know, if, if you're going to do it the first time, you may as well jump in the deep end and do it hard. So I, I did that and that was an experience. And jail as a whole, I mean, there's so many stories I can tell. There's so many different ways I, I remember it. There were times I laughed. I will sit and say some of the best days of my life were in jail. Get out of here. Yeah. And some of the worst days of my life were in jail. But there were days where me and Tristan, when we were finally in the same cell, there's times we laughed like we've never laughed before. Um, I'll sit and, and, and admit that's absolutely not really true. I feel like if you're going to be the kind of person who strives for an exceptional life, which is what I am, I think I'd be a coward if I said, I want an exceptional life, but I only want it to be exceptional in a good way. I don't think that's genuine. I want an exceptional life. And exceptional means away from the norm. And away from the norm means flying your Bugatti on a jet to Dubai and taking your own plane to meet it there. And it also means a Romanian dungeon <laughs> with cockroaches on New Year's Eve. They're both exceptional experiences. And the times I was with my brother and it was just him and I, we truly had some genuine days where we laughed like we always laugh. 
me and him laugh and have fun on a private jet and we laughed and had fun in a Romanian prison cell because that's just who we are. And I also have to give my brother some credit while we're here. I would like to state that I absolutely genuinely believe I have the best brother in the world. And I'll tell you why. I always knew I had the best brother in the world, but he proved it in jail. And I'll tell you why. My brother was put in jail for being my brother. He hasn't said any videos. He hasn't said anything on the internet. He hasn't said any of the things I've supposedly said. He's never, the Matrix isn't attacking him. The BBC doesn't print about him, nothing. Why was Tristan Tate in jail? Because it's Tate brothers. So they just took him and threw him in a cell. Now what's interesting is, when I got out of jail, so many people near me got heat. All business partners got heat with the tax. They got hit with like a tax paperwork and uh, they were calling everyone who's ever known me and ex-girlfriends got heat and all these people got heat. And some people complained, some people didn't. But some people were like, oh, since you've been in jail, it's been so stressful for me. The media's outside my house. I'm like, stressful for you? I was in jail. What do you want me to do? And people were complaining at me. And as these people started to complain, I sat there, I said to Tristan, you got thrown in jail purely for being my brother and never for a fraction of a second did you even moan? Didn't even, not even for a fraction of a second did he say, oh, they only put me here because of you. Why am I here? I, I'm innocent. This has nothing to do with me. Nothing. In fact, he said the absolute opposite. He said, I am so glad I went to jail with you. Hmm. I would be furious if they sent you here by yourself. If they're going to lock you up, they better lock me up. And there was a time, about two months in, because there's less media pressure on Tristan, they were talking about releasing Tristan first. And he was saying, no. I won't leave without Andrew. Going down with the ship. I won't leave unless my brother leaves. Wow. I won't leave. And he was telling the guards, I won't leave. Keep me here. I'm not leaving. And they said, the judge says you have to leave, you have to leave. He goes, then I'll stand outside the gate. I'll sleep outside. I ain't leaving this jail. And our lawyer said, well, we can make an appeal to just release you because there's less media scrutiny around you. And Tristan's like, no. Andrew's in jail. I'm in jail. He refused to leave. He was adamant he had to stay. That's a brother for me. And it was the same for me. I said to Tristan, if they came into me and said, Andrew, go home, I'd be like, no, no way. If Tristan's in jail, I'm in jail. We're in jail together. He never for a second complained, never bitched, never moaned. And he was only in jail for being my brother. And then I come out and there's other people, oh, they sent me a piece of paper, blah, blah, blah. You're, you're moaning? It's unbelievable. You truly learn, like I said, jail confirms everything you already knew about the world. And you truly learn who's on your side and who isn't. And that's good to learn, but it's, it's actually crazy. The also the, the larger psychological analysis of it all, everyone lives inside their own minds, right? So it's, it's kind of crazy. I came out of jail and the, some of the first messages I got from people was them complaining about the problems me being in jail had given. Like, you think that wouldn't happen, right? You think, oh, you come out of jail, people would be like, oh, are you okay? They're like, oh, you're okay? You're out now? Okay, yeah, well, listen, Mo, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed. And I'm like, I was in jail. What do you want me to do? Yeah, that sounds unfortunate. I was in your jail cell. What do you want me to do about it? It's kind of crazy how much everyone's kind of self-interested. So it's been a, a learning curve and you learn a lot about a lot of different people and your circle gets smaller. And uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons God put me in there to just learn a lot and, and make my circle smaller. And you just have to listen to him and pay attention to it and say, okay, right, you're off, you're off, you're off, you're on, you're on, you're on. Mm -hmm. But my brother, I have to give him credit because I tell you, I also think me and Tristan are one of the best teams in the world because we have different roles inside of our brotherhood. My role is to be concerned and to panic. Not panic, that's the wrong word. I never panic. My role is to be concerned and try and fix the problem. I'm in jail, pacing up and down. How do we get out? And Tristan's role is to not care. And together, that helps us achieve the objective best. Because when we really need to get out, I'm in charge. <laughs> I, his, role, his role is to not care. Sometimes, when it, was, when it was at the height of frustration, I needed his superpower. Tristan's superpower. And this is his superpower for life, is he is the master of not giving a fuck. We would go to court. We would go to court. Imagine this. You're in jail, right? Weekends were the worst because the TV was worse on weekends for some reason. Like you had, you had like three channels. The TV, the weekends were the worst and you could hear out the window everyone having fun. I hated weekends. So on a Friday would roll around and say, okay, Tristan, we just have to zen away the weekend. And on Monday there's court. We just have to zen away the weekend. So for the weekend, we just sit there staring at the wall. Intrusive thoughts, can't sleep, all those things you're trying to get out your brain, just sitting in silence because the room's tapped, just staring at the wall, just staring at the wall. And you think Monday would never come. And Monday would eventually come, right? Or Sunday night comes, and 8 a.m. on Monday, they're gonna take you to court, and they might let you go home. They might let you go home, you've done nothing. This person in this room can decide if you go home. 
and it's Sunday night and you can't sleep and you're awake all night long. There's no clock, but you just, you just, the seconds feel like hours. You're just sitting there. Eventually, AM comes, put you in handcuffs, walk you to the court. You walk in there. Everyone speaks Romanian. Don't have a clue what's going on. Everyone's just talking at each other in Romanian. Then they say, you'll get the answer in three hours. Go back to jail. When I went back to jail, I was sitting in the room. I was like, do I pack to go home? No, that's too optimistic. Okay. But you're nervous. You're like, you're anxious. Am I going to go home? Is it over? Do I get to go home? I called the lawyer. Do you have an answer yet? No, no answer yet. Okay. Sitting there. I can barely sit still. Tristan finishes court, walks straight into the room. It's a matrix attack. It's bullshit. I'm going to sleep. I went to bed. <laughs> Clean asleep. I was like, how the fuck are you asleep? He didn't care at all. He just went straight to bed. And then when he woke up like six hours later, matrix attack. I'm like, yeah, you thought so. And just rolled back over. Didn't care. But it's perfect for a guy like you. But that's what you need. I need that. I agree. Because if I had someone else next to me as hyped as me, I would have gone insane. I agree. I need someone like yeah. him who's just like, he had the superpowers like, bro, I love jail. Jail's great. Look, we got coffee. I love jail. None of my women are messaging me. I love jail. Truth, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I had 45 minutes on the phone a day and I used all of my minutes. Tristan never made a single phone call from jail. Get out of here. Not one. I was like, Tristan, do you want to speak to anyone? Nah. Sit there watching Romanian news. Didn't give a shit. <laughs> like bulletproof. But the only reason he's so bulletproof that way is because he knows I'm doing the absolute best the other way. Okay. He couldn't be that way if I wasn't trying to get us out because then he would try to get out. You, like need, you, need, you need the yin and yang. So like when, I, when, we, when, I, when it was chill time, it was his mental frame. And when it was, how do we get out of here? It was yeah. my mental frame. But Tristan's superpower genuinely is genuinely, genuinely not caring. I can't explain the level of how much he didn't, it didn't affect him. He didn't bother him at all. I didn't see him sad, nothing, he was smiling. He didn't care. You consider yourself a stoic. How much more stoic is he than you? I just think we have different roles and I think we've evolved into them over the time because it's not just jails so with everything. That's what we are with everything. If, if there's a business problem, I'm the one who's like, shit, we have to fix this now, shit, shit. And Tristan's the one like, Andrew, you are so ridiculously rich, chill. But we need that. We need both, right? But he couldn't be that chilled if I wasn't the way I was because he wouldn't be successful. So totally. so you, need, you need the opposites. Yeah. So everyone goes, oh, you and your brother are so close. We're so close because we're actually very different people. But yeah, he, he was amazing in jail. And even afterwards, I, I still struggle to sleep. He sleeps fine. Because I think my experience of jail was a far more stressful one. Because I, but I adopted that. Now, I'm not saying I couldn't have done what Tristan did. I could have done what Tristan did. If I were to go into jail and say, your MO is to not care, I could not care. But my MO was, how do I get out of this matrix attack? So I, I was the most stressed I've ever been in my life. So that's carried over. So I don't sleep. He sleeps fine. But he slept fine in jail. So why wouldn't he sleep fine now, right? So yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting, but I have to give him props because it's, it's amazing to have that level of clarity. And he, and he said things which were absolutely not really true, things I already knew, but it was nice to hear. I, I wanna ask you a question on this. So I have two boys, yeah. right? And one day they're gonna watch this. They're not gonna watch it right now, they're 11, yeah. nine, but they're one they're gonna watch yeah. this, right? Uh, and in school, you know, I'll go and, and the kids that are, you know, 11, 12, 13, they're like, you, you, Andrew Tate, you know, how was that interview? Oh my God. So 11 year old kids are watching these types of content, but that's pretty wild where they're at. But here's a question about brothers. There's a lot of brothers out there. As a father, there's certain principles I'm teaching them, yep. okay? One, if you can speak from the idea of how your bond was built based yep. on a man, yep. your father, yep. Emery, yep. injecting certain values and principles on the two of you. Yep. You guys better do this. I don't want to see this. Yep. And then which part of the code did you guys create? Because there's friendship, yeah. but there's brotherhood. There's yeah. a very different story. Absolutely. How, how was that developed? Yeah, so my father, and I have endless stories about my father, a lot of people who dislike me would call him an extremist. I don't think he was an extremist. I truly believe I had the best father on the planet. And from a very young age, he made it clear. He said, look, you're Tates, and you're gonna have enemies, you're gonna have people who are against you. Your best bet is to be a team. So whenever me and Tristan would fight, which happened, we got put in a room together. And we had to sit in that room. And my dad would say three hours or four hours in silence. He'd sit us down in the room here, here, looking at each other and say, if I hear a noise, I'm starting the time again. And we'd have to just imagine, you know, when you're a kid and you fight and you're furious and you're so mad. And then you end up sitting across from the person you hate. Silent. Because you make a noise, dad gets mad. And dad's outside, right? 
So just sit there, two hours, don't make a noise. We had to stare at each other. And over time, we thought every time Dad was home, we just stopped fighting because it wasn't worth it just sitting in this isolation, weird, silent stare thing. <laughs> because that's what happened on repeat. It happened like five times and we just stopped fighting. We would literally, we'd fight all the time when Mom was home. And when Dad would come home, we'd literally just look at each other like truce. Like, we can't, we don't want, we don't want to sit and do this thing we had to do. Yeah. So we became a team. And then I think it evolved from there because there's always been a hierarchy. I am the older brother. I'm the bigger brother. He does respect me for that. We both have opinions, but... You know, it can be it can be vetoed by me in the end. And we have our specific roles. My specific role is I'm I'm the one who takes the most action. I'm the one who over worries. I believe, especially in business and many other things, I say it to all my staff. I say react, I said react fast, react early, like panic early. Like panic now. I don't believe in waiting for things. It's just not who I am. I can give you a million different examples. If 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 my email processor, this happened just before my cancellation, said, Oh, we'll put your account under review. You'll have an answer in 72 hours. As soon as I get that email, within three minutes, I'm like, get a new one, get a new one. I've never waited for anything in my life and it worked. I've never waited and it worked out fine, ever. Every time it's your cancel, every time it's your deleted, every time someone's like, no, get a new one now, get, just get a new one. I need today's email out, get a new one. We can't get a new one, no one will accept us, build one. So in a day we build our own. Like I'm the panic fast and early guy. Tristan's the complete opposite and that makes us a, a perfect synergy and I, I super need him and I need his energy. Especially in jail, man. He was fantastic in jail. He was like, Andrew, I'm like, what? he goes, if when you were 18, they told you you could be one of the richest, most famous men on earth with street cred in every single city that knows how to speak English, all you had to do was sit in jail for two months. Would you have taken it? I was like, yeah. He goes, and what the fuck do you care for? <laughs> so true. No, we're took in that. He goes, I know he used to say that, what kind of man hasn't been to jail? This was his saying. He used to say, what kind of man hasn't been to jail? He loved jail. He was loving it all the time. He goes, what kind of man hasn't been to jail? Of course I've been to jail. I'm just a tail. Of course I go to jail. Like he didn't care. And his energy was amazing to tap into. But we both understand that we, neither of us could be us without the other one's polar. And that's why we live together. That's why we'll always live together. I've had a lot of like women try and say, why do you still live with your brother? Why don't you want to live with me? Da, da, da. And I try and explain to them that, one, I don't think I can be my most competitive without him. Two, I'm most emotionally stable with him. I like the idea. I'm most competitive with him. I'm, I, I'm my best version of me. If it doesn't matter if I have to go into a fight, doesn't matter if I have to run a business, I'm better with Tristan by my side than I would be by myself. And three, my ideal family life, even my ideal family, the way I live my life now, is very much more like a clan than a nuclear family. I like me, my girl, my kids, Tristan, his girl, his kids, my cousin, his girl, his kids. I like this idea of lots of people. I like that. I like that feeling. So girls say to me, well, you don't want a family. Like, no, I want a family bigger than you want. I just don't want to just sit with you. I want a lot of people around me, and I think it's better for that, and I think it's better for the children especially also. I think they enjoy it more. But yeah, I've got the best brother on the planet. I truly do. And um, this is why I'm saying some of our best days of our lives are in jail. I was going to ask you that. You guys live here in this compound. It's an amazing place. I was going to ask you. You kind of just answered it. But you foresee yourself living with your brother the rest of your life. thousand percent. thousand percent. I can't imagine not wanting to live with Tristan. If you want privacy, you have privacy, right? We have a big house. So yeah, it is what it is. You're on one wing. Yeah, it, on is, the other it wing. is what it is. But I can't imagine him not being around if there's a problem I just shout his name or I just can't imagine it and and I know I'm my best self also there's the overall the overall male competition the masculine competition that exists between us and between all men so we live currently here we got me my brother my brother's personal trainers here we got camera guys here we got war room guys here we got loads of guys here but I can give you a million examples there was a record set the next story of a gym and there's a stair machine and there was a record set of 188 floors within a time frame I came along and smashed it with 198 I only held the record for 45 minutes because someone beat it with 202. As soon as the record's beaten, everyone gets pissed off and puts their trainers on, puts their shoes on. As soon as it's beaten, everyone gets mad. Who beat it? Who beat it? And everyone goes and did it. And, and that's how you push yourself to the level you never thought you'd be able to push yourself. 202? 202 floors in 30 minutes. Good luck. 202 no, 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 minutes. No, he, that's what that was beaten with. Now it's 222. It's been beaten again. I don't know if I'll ever get to that. But I, I'm still 198. I've got to try again. But the point is, when you have men around you, there's that natural masculine competition, and that's mm -hmm. what drives you. If you're going to be the best version of yourself, even if you're a boxer training for a fight, you train with a team. You train with other that's boxers. You train with other boxers or other trainers. If you're a football, if you're on a football team, you're pushed by your team. I think life should be the same, right? 
If, imagine you took the normal average man and you moved him into a house of five people and you had a philosopher and a fitness expert and a hypnotist, whatever it was. These will be, that will make him a more competitive person overall because he's trying to compete with all the other people who are on his level. You don't want to take bitch position. So I, I don't like the idea of my life without masculine competition. That's what I'll always say to my brother. And if you met a girl one day who says, Tate, I want to have have your babies live with you but it's kind of weird that your brother's here what would you say to her yeah a few of them have said that i offer some degree of compromise i'm like look we can have our own house separate if you really want but i'm gonna be spending a lot of time at that other house including nights over i want to stay with where my brother is so you would compromise is. a little bit but he's going to be living next door or with you 100 percent. and i don't show. think and that may be unusual in the western world i don't think that's unusual in many places i love that by the way well, you talk Just about so this you know. all the time oh you don't even know yeah. how much i love that yeah i love that to me as a kid, that was a dream. Like, if you could, you know, write next to each other, uh, live next, there's a family in our community, a uh, billionaire family. They live right next to each other. The, the oldest son has the biggest house, 12,000 square feet. Then the youngest son has the second biggest house, 8,000 square feet. And the parents live in a 6,000 square foot house right next to Absolutely. each other. Absolutely. Okay? The two boys have four kids. The eight kids are always together. Absolutely. What a great environment. Absolutely. It's a dream environment. Absolutely. I, I, I can't see how a person wouldn't buy into that, the benefits of it. And, and, and there's also benefits to the relationship because I, I think you have a better relationship with your woman if she can go and talk with other women and be with women and I'm with guys and, and then you're together sometimes and you can split it up. It's better for everybody. This whole idea of, the, of, of just man, woman, boom, child bang, I understand where it's come from. I'm not saying it's all typically bad, but I do think that in those scenarios, there's a lot of men who are particularly miserable, particularly men, especially. And the idea of a clan and having that team around you, I love that. I wouldn't live any other way. I love living that way. Well, being born and raised in Miami, there's a lot of Latin culture there. Yep. And, you know, the American friends, they just move out, move on their own. That's what they do. But in Latin culture, the abuela's living in the house, the family's living in there, the, the, the women are all kind of congregating well, we yeah, together. We could also it's a different world. We can also discuss it financially, right? If, if, if you're a man and a woman and you have three boys and they're, let's say, traditional Western, whatever, they all go and pay three different rents and they all move in with their girlfriends and everyone's getting wrecked, right? If you all mm -hmm. stay together and combine your income, you also do much better financially. This is how a lot of immigrants even survived, especially Muslim immigrants in England. I've heard you tell the story about Absolutely, yeah, they all stay together in one big house, they all pool their incomes. You have a bunch of people with average jobs and Ferraris on the drive. And then they buy the house they're in, then they buy another, you pool the incomes. If you all split and separate and just spread out, you're just paying all different rents, all different electricity bills, and you just go broke. You have to think of the last name and the generation and the clan as a whole. So yeah, I love the idea of living with my brother. I'll never live without him. And it, yeah, his woman can move in, of course. His kids can be around me, of course. I'm uncle, why not? I, I have no problem with that. That's a dream. Let's, let's transition to a couple other topics. So um, I saw a video by the president of Microsoft, Brandon. I think it was the president of Microsoft who said, you're going to see one of the biggest threats in the future being deep fakes. Okay? Mm. And then you saw a similar thing being said by Google, Sergey Brennan. You're going to see what's going to happen with deep fakes. And then the example of deep fakes was given by the actress from Wonder Woman. What's her name? Uh, Gal, uh, uh, Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot, right? There was a deep fake porn made of her. Then there was a deep fake uh, video made of Trump. Then there's deep fake of Joe Rogan. There's one of Morgan Freeman. Hi. I am not Morgan Freeman. Kind of goes like this. Wow. So the direction we're going with deep fake, right? When it comes down to AI, yeah. where do you see the threat? Is that something you, you think about? Is that something you see as an opportunity, as a threat? And if yes, which part of it? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Deep fakes are certainly going to change the world because what we're going to have is we're going to have a post-truth society. And then the only way they're going to be able to tell you what's true or not is some committee which decides what's true and what's a deep fake. And then they're going to be in charge of the world. And then they're going to lie to you and then you're really in trouble. <laughs> so that's gonna be very interesting. Once you get to the point where, what did I say earlier about not being able to trust your own eyes? They're gonna take that away from us soon. Then what? Then you're really in trouble. Um, in regards to AI, I think it has to be adopted. Inside of my school, Hustlers University, we teach AI with absolutely everything. A lot of the images we generate, even on my Twitter account, is all AI. And what's actually scary about the modern world is, I don't consider myself old, I'm 36, but some of the children, children, I call them children, 17, 18 year olds inside of my school, Hustlers University, they're, AI wizards, and they can do magic with this stuff. Magic. 
Like they can literally genuinely Andrew Tate on the moon and the image is generated in seconds. Like artists are going out of business. I thought AI would put truck drivers out of business. Artists are going out of business. Musicians are going out of business. It's kind of scary. I do like to think that with things like AI, there's always going to be some degree of natural separation between the men who are genuinely inventive and killers and the men who are more... Let me change the way I say that. I think if you're an exceptional person, a truly exceptional person, you don't have to be afraid of nearly anything. But may, you'll probably agree with this. In my experience, in nearly every business in the world, you have 10% killers, and then you have a bunch who want the paycheck. They do their job, but I wouldn't say they're killers. You understand? Mm -hmm. And we, we live in a society for a long time where I can even, I even tell you now, sometimes when I hire, I'll say to, to my cousin or to my, my COL, I'll say, look, either get one killer or three normal people. Because that's the reality. That's the basic, you either need three people to half do the job or you need one killer to do the job. And I think that those three people who half do their jobs, enough to not get fired, they turn up most of the on time, but they're not really that motivated. Those are the ones who have to fear AI. I think businesses in the, near, in the medium term are gonna become killers and AI. I tell them now, I have some, some guys who work for me on one particular company and their sales staff. I was reading through the sales scripts, the killers doing really well. But the average guys have said, you're not doing much better than ChatGPT could do right now. I want to warn you that you're not doing much better than I could replace you with a machine today, let alone in five years from now, for free. You need to be careful. So I think it's just becoming more and more competitive. The idea that you can just be Joe Schmo, do your job, turn up, I don't try that hard, it's fine. I think that's all going to go out the window because as the world becomes more competitive, as a company, you have to compete with your competitors. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is just where do you cut the flat fat? Where do you cut the flag? When I see AI popping up and getting more and more intelligent in the way it's talking, that doesn't scare me. But I have a way with words. If I was Joe Schmo, I'd be afraid. <laughs> this chat GPT can probably text your girl better than you can. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, probably get, he'll probably get laid faster it's than a you. Little will. advice for the guys out there. Yeah, right now. just plug it in your GPT phone. That It'll thing. do better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's scary, you know. That's and hilarious. I, I, I think that's what the the, the average man really needs to struggle. And I've been saying this has been my message for a very long time in all realms. I've said for a very long time that life for the average man is going to get harder and harder. It's becoming more and more competitive. You need to find more and more ways to stand out and be unique. And the only way to really do those things, unfortunately, as a man, is to suffer. And that's one of the reasons I'm kind of glad that God put me in jail. Because if you look at anything that builds a man into a man, there's a degree of suffering. It's very hard to become a man and have a man who's uh, respected and has stories and is capable when he only had a nice life and nice experiences. It's usually the things that made you the best version of you are usually the worst things that happened to you. So the demons I carry from jail, the fact that I can't sleep, the fact that I can't sleep, I've had girls say to me, you can't sleep, you need to see a psychiatrist. And I said, absolutely not. I would be furious if a psychiatrist walked in here and took my demons from me. I don't care if they could fix me with a click, they're mine. And they were bestowed to me by God. And they are mine to deal with and they are mine to fix because that's how I become a better version of me. I would be furious if someone took them away from me. I'm glad I can't sleep. Good, I can train endlessly. That's why I'm bigger than I've ever been. I'll train every, I'm not going to waste a minute. But all the demons that have been given to me by God and all the problems that have been given to me by God are mine to fix. I would never, ever allow anybody else to take them from me. I'd be furious. Mm -hmm. If a psychologist came in and said I could cure you, I'd say, no, thank you. I will cure myself. I don't care if it takes 10 years. I'll cure myself. That's my job. And I know that when that's done, I will be more mentally resilient than I ever would have been without jail. That's the whole point of it, right? So many men say, I want to be the man, but they don't want to suffer. They don't want to fight. And I don't understand why, because even if you look at a superhero movie, they tell you, even in superhero movies, they make it very clear. Batman's parents died. That's why he's Batman. All the bad things have to happen. There's no way to get there without the bad things. I get so many emails from people complaining about their bad things. And I, I don't have time to reply to any of them. But if I could, I'd say, good. Good luck. Congratulations. Off you go. Of course you broke your heart. Of course you're sad. Of course you miss her. She's with me now. That's life. That's part of it. That's the only way you're going to get to that level of resilience. You can't become the man any other way. So yeah, I, I, I thank God for everything bad that's ever happened to me and, and all the demons. And I, I trust that he's not going to give me anything I cannot, in the end, decipher and deal with. In the end, I think it's a puzzle and you decipher it and you work out the best way to deal with it and you internalize the good parts and you become a better and stronger and more resilient person for it. Mm -hmm. So I have to thank God for every single one of them. Well, I mean, you got to go through shit to be the shit. That's basically what it is. And, and by the way, what you're saying is not a hypothetical. You talk about being the average man. 
you see this play out on dating apps these days. If you've seen what's happened, especially on Instagram and yeah. on, on all the dating apps, Hinge, Bumble, yeah. and out there, the top guys out there yeah. are getting 90% of the women, whereas the bottom guys, I think the stats are a third of men under 30 have not been laid in a year. If being average is not acceptable anymore. At, at all. It's not acceptable anymore. And it's not, it's not acceptable in the sexual marketplace, but it's also just not acceptable, I don't think, even in life anymore. Period. You have to diversify now so much to even protect yourself. The idea that you can just be a law-abiding citizen in a country and just work your job and be okay is gone. It's gone. If COVID doesn't prove that, I don't know what will. Yeah. Look at my situation. You have to diversify. You have to be smart enough that you have assets and friends and, and, and capability and, and lawyers and whatever all over the world now. That's the only way to protect yourself. You can't just sit within jur one jurisdiction and go, oh, well, but I don't speed, so it's going to be okay. I don't think it is. I think it's coming to a point where it's not going to be okay. And AI is going to make it harder and harder again for those average men. It's going to be harder and harder. I don't think the exceptional men are ever going to suffer from AI. I think we're going to use AI. Do you think this whole neural link that uh, Elon Musk just got the approval for, for the patent, so now the sale is going to be, look, no matter what you do, John, you will never be like Andrew Tate. Yeah. But if yeah. you take Scary. this neural link, Scary. GT500 slash Tate, you're able to get upgraded to his levels and think like him and I'll think and do this and do that for only $49,000. If you it's put scary. this chip in your head, we will offer this to you. My mother always says to me, I'm glad I'm not young. And I'm starting to say that now. I'm glad I'm not young. Because I'm telling you, it's going to be scary, right? Because the world is hyper-competitive. Every single thing in the world is competition. I don't think people realize I'm a hyper-competitive person because I understand that every single thing I want, somebody else wants. The girl I want, other people want. The car I want, other people want. The house I want, other people want. The lifestyle, the jet. Every single thing you want, somebody else wants. It's a massive competition. Yep. As a man, you have two choices. You either accept that it's a massive competition and try and play the game, or you just try and pretend it's not a competition and live in perpetual failure. And it's gonna become hyper-competitive, the world already is. You're not gonna be able to compete with a person with a computer brain. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to have it, because you can't compete. And then once you have it, then who knows? Can they turn it off? I don't know. Can they turn you off? I don't know. Can they inject the slave mind programming directly through the chip? I don't know. That's scary. I, I would never want to do that, but it's going to get to a point where you're not even a person without it. You can't function without it. You're a second class what citizen without it. Then, what happens to competition then? Is it going to be whoever has access to the best uh, technology, whoever has the most recent upgraded version of XYZ Neuralink chip? Absolutely. It's going to become scary. I'm glad I'm not young. I hope it doesn't happen while I'm alive. I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be an interesting world. Does it, does it inspire you to want to have more kids or you're like, that's indifferent. I'm going to have the kids. I'm not worried about that. I think, yeah, I, I think they, I think in the 1700s, they're probably saying the same thing. The future's over and the future ain't that bad. So there'll be a way it will work out. I just have to instill within them the same values I have and they'll find a way to work it out and, and hopefully they'll be okay. PBD, but you always say the future looks bright. I mean, you must be concerned. You've got four kids. I would have 20 more right now if I could. I would have 20 more kids, right? I don't know how you feel about it. I'd have 20 more kids right now if I could. Absolutely, absolutely love children. There's nothing bad about having children. The only thing I wish I did is start earlier. It's the only thing, the only thing I wish I did was yeah, Well, listen, right now, I don't know if you know, if you need some inspiration, there's this guy named Al Pacino. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Who had a kid at 82. I saw that. And was 29 years old, and De Niro had it at 79. Wow. Well, So you know, it's never too late. You're never 36. too late. You, if you got the testosterone level of 32, I'm sure you can have 20 more kids. I'll be okay. Politics. Let's talk politics with uh, America. You're seeing what's going on with the election. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, <clears throat> vantage points you have is you're not there. It's kind of like it's your problem. You guys deal with it. Yeah. I'm over here on this side. From your perspective, YouTube comes out. Hey, all the election stuff you guys talked about, that we would ban it and take it down, you guys can talk about it now because we want a balanced argument from both sides. Okay, no problem. Um, who do you see, what, do you, what are your thoughts on the, uh, Trump today, 2024, DeSantis, Biden? How do you see this thing panning out? Politics is, is, is so interesting. It's, it's so messy. I mean, obviously, I'm a Trump supporter. I believe in Trump. I like DeSantis and the things he did. I, I'm not going to choose between Trump or DeSantis. I think if one of them won, if any of them won, it would be fantastic for the world. I think YouTube taking a back step is actually extremely important symbolically. It'd be interesting to see if they keep that up post this election, seeing what happens with this election. That'll be very interesting. Uh, but I think it's certainly a massive symbolic step back. I remember when I got canceled, nobody talked about Rumble. Nobody talked about Kick. Nobody talked about even you got Valuetainment. No disrespect. You were a lot smaller then than you are now. Of course. It's crazy how fast alternatives have popped up. 
And I'm only saying this because I do feel like I literally said, I remember my exact words. I said, there's pressure behind the dam. Everyone's tired of it. All it takes is a crack. And when there's a crack, there'll be a flood. And the crack in the dam will be a man who is more famous once he's canceled than he was before he was canceled. That's what I said. Now they're trying to put me in jail, which is making me more famous again. I'm not saying it's all because of me, but I'm saying there's definitely a public consciousness switch where the, the arbitrators of truth are having to backstep now. They, they've overused their power. They overstepped their power exactly like we said they would. And now they're allowing open discourse. So I hope that America has a free and fair election. That's what I'm praying for. I think every country should have a free and fair election, especially when we're going to fly fighter jets and drop $500,000 bombs on farmers who've never made $5 in their day under the guise of democracy. If we're going to bother to do that, then we should at least have a democracy ourselves. So I think a free and fair election will be interesting. And I think the will of the people should be done. And that's how America was built and founded. And that's what I would like to see. And I do think that America does lead the public consciousness overall as a whole. I know what you're saying about me being over here, but I do think that which, which side wins does have an overreaching effect overall on the entire planet. America is still the most powerful country on earth. It'd be very interesting to see what happens in 2024. We'll put it that way. Crazy question for you. He gets approached all the time. PBD, when are you running? When are you running, PBD? He goes, listen. <laughs> I'll vote for you, bro. Yeah, he goes, listen. Uh, I was born in Iran, made in America. I can't run. Well, when are you going to... But you were born in America, Andrew Tate. I was, yeah. You know, you were raised in, the, in Luton, UK. You lived in Romania. But you are an American citizen. I have no idea. Dream with me for a second. I have no if idea. If you were president of the United yeah. States, Andrew Tate, what would that look like? I have no idea what it'd be like to be president. But I have a feeling what Putin said about the presidents might be true. Did you ever see what Putin said? Yes. Eight years, they come and go. Yeah. Yep. I've, been, I've seen three presidents. I've, I've seen a lot of presidents come and go, and they all come with these grand ideas. But once they get in office, the people with the briefcases and the dark suits come in and sit them down because of the strong bureaucracy inside of the United States and explain to them how things are done. And they never seem to get their ideas done. They never seem to do the things they said they were going to do. Do you include Trump in that? I think Trump tried his very best to resist that, and that's why he's in the situation. That's why they're taking him to court for no reason. That's why he was matrix attacked. I mean, if Trump's, okay, let's, let's cut the guard. I'm going back to jail anyway, probably with this matrix stuff and try and kill me anyway. They probably are. If Trump's situation isn't a matrix attack, what is? What did they just hit him with in New York? Some de defamation for defending himself against a lie? Is that, if that's not a matrix attack, tell me what, what is possibly else. Anyone who's sitting out here who actually truly believes that the matrix doesn't exist has no idea how the world works. The media machine and the legal system work hand in hand to try and slander people's name and convince you enough, convince the populace enough that they're guilty so there's no revolt, so they can hit them with a guilty plea. They've already decided before all of it. It's all, it's all, it's all a plan. This many months of negative news, then we'll hit him with this, we'll get him guilty for this, and with this many months of negative news, the populace will probably swallow it. It's garbage. It's a matrix attack from head to toe. How much do you see yourself in Trump? And do you use your words? First, they try to cancel you. He was canceled. Yeah. Then they try to throw you in jail. He's dealing with lawsuits. Yeah. Lastly, they try to put a bull in your head. Well, Trump's lucky because he's a bit older. So Trump will try and outlast him. They'll wait. My problem is I'm a, I'm a bit young. You know? And I also think the reason I feel particularly at risk, and I, I say these things on podcasts to protect myself, and I don't want anyone to think I'm paranoid or crazy, because I, I, I really don't believe I am. The reason I think I'm particularly at lit risk is for the thing you just said. It's the masculine youth who are my fans. It's the 11 year olds, 12 year olds, 15 year olds, 16 year olds. They are the future of the world. They're the people you want to go and die in a ditch. They're the soldiers you need. Those are the people you need psyoped. You need them psyoped. You can't have a bunch of men who aren't psyoped. Mm -hmm. That's when you lose control of everything, when the men don't listen anymore. And they're all listening to me. And I'm teaching them things like God, religion, personal responsibility, accountability, discipline. And everyone's saying, well, why are they attacking Andrew for just telling the truth and making me go to the gym? Because when you have these things, when you have accountability and discipline and personal responsibility, you have a barrier, you have a parameter, you have a no, you have a limit. They don't want you to have a limit. None of the men are allowed limits. We must accept whatever we are given from our relationship with our woman, from the government, from our job. We're, we're just the slaves. We're, we're the backbone of the tax bracket. We just have to shut up and pay our taxes. As soon as we have limits, they have a problem. That's why they dislike the things I teach. What do I really say? What do I really teach young kids that's genuine dangerous? What do I say? Go to the gym, stick up for yourself? Stick up for yourself, go to the gym, you're allowed an opinion. Educate yourself, be smart, work hard. Believe in things, believe in yourself. Have friends, have strong friends around you. Don't listen to dishonest men or dishonest women. It's not misogynistic to say dishonest people. Non-gendered should be anywhere near you. You should have standards for who's your friend, standards for who you have relationships with romantically, whether you're gay or straight. You should have standards. Telling men to have standards is now wrong think. Because if, as soon as men have standards, they lose control. 
They don't want any man to have any standard on anything. They mm -hmm. want to come along and say, no, you need the eighth injection. Take it. That's all they want. I think that's the saddest thing that's happened to you is because anybody that listens to your long form content, not 60 seconds on TikTok, fully understands that you're an advocate for male self-improvement. Absolutely. Get out of depression, work your ass off, be coachable, make money, yeah. get women, yeah. enjoy the finer things in life. Yeah. But they will take the little things you say and label you a misogynist, it's label what, you a chauvinist. And that's a, the tip of the iceberg of minor things you say when you really are a male advocate. It's weaponized virtue. But also, you can't have an opinion on any kind of differences or differentiation without them now calling you a misogynist. If, 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 if I believe a woman is better at raising young children than a man, I would never drop my child off to a nursery run by men. I think that would be weird. I would never take my two or three year old girl and drop her off in a nursery which was male run. I would only bring her to a nursery which is female. No, would you hire a babysitter that's a boy? Neither, never. Am, am I, do I hate men? No. Like, I just believe that in war, a man should go and raising children, maybe perhaps women should go. I just believe in the same things that everybody believed in 10 years ago. Yeah. The world has gone nuts. 10 years ago, everything I'm saying was standardized and accepted and normal. And they're taking this misogynist garbage and weaponizing the virtue and trying to attack me with it. And they don't even believe in it. It's truly, it's, it's truly upsetting, but I just can't be quiet because I don't know how I couldn't live as anyone else other than me. I couldn't live as a, per, a man who wasn't trying to be his best self. Let, let's stay on this. So you said uh, uh, president, then you brought in Putin. Yeah. So then that uh, uh, discourages for somebody to think they can make real change. Okay. Yeah. So two questions. One, if you are the president today, and I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah. What policies would you attack? Right now in America, uh, I watched RFK. I don't know if you listened to the recording oh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. What he said about the angle he would take with pharma. He says, all these things, we're talking about guns. He says, how is it that we have the same amount of guns as Switzerland does per capita, mm -hmm. but Switzerland hasn't had a school shooting in 21 years. Yep. We had it 21 hours ago. Yep. And we just had one last night, by the way, big one. I don't know, in Virginia, I want to say, right? Seven people shot. Yeah, seven people shot just yesterday, right? Every day, there's Every day, you're talking about fentanyl, you're talking about the drugs, you're talking about LGBTQ, you're, t you're talking about military industrial complex, economy, taxes. What, what would be top three issues you would uh, attack if you were uh, president today? If the, and that's so interesting because before I answer that question, that ties back into what we were saying earlier about men's mental health. They pretend they give a shit about men's mental health. But if you come along and actually advocate and tell men how to be happier. I've been a sad man and a happy man. I am a man. I know exactly how it feels on all ranges of emotion. And I'll be honest with you right now. When a man is sad, yeah, there is an inclination towards aggression. That's how we're born. That's how we're evolved. We're evolved with that inclination towards aggression. We need that to protect and provide. That's who we are. We need that bravery. But having a bunch of depressed, sad men who have no emotional control is dangerous for society. I say this all the time. They try and pretend that I'm somehow dangerous for society by telling men to stand up for themselves and be masculine. Absolutely not really not. When you tell a man to have no emotional control and be more feminine, that's a school shooter. A school shooter is not a man with masculine accountability. He's a man who's told, act how you feel all the time. Then he gets picked on for long enough throw on some drugs on top his psychiatrist gave him, throw in a lack of a girlfriend, and he's had enough. That's where school shooting comes from. School shooting does not come from men being masculine. It comes from the absolute opposite of these things. And they know this. They know this very, very well. To fix society, we have to fix that at the most base level, the root level. I think America and most countries need more transparency and understanding of how things work. But when they're attacking the family unit, they're attacking all of these issues. Every issue you've just labeled all starts down, back down to the beginning. I really think the reason I would like to argue, and I don't know any of the statistics on this, in the 1950s, I'm sure there was prevalence of guns all around America, but there just wasn't the school shooting. Why? What was different? What was different in the years before that there is now? I think it's just because children obeyed their parents and their parents were a family and there was a degree of responsibility that was instilled inside of people and there's a degree of accountability and also there was a degree Great of honor question. and pride. Great question. There's a degree of honor and pride. Yeah. I I'll tell you something now. I bet in the 60s, 70s, whatever, in any country in the world, people didn't want to do dumb shit because the family would be known as criminals. The last name would be tarnished. Their son did this. You hear what their son did? There was a whole, there was a vested interest in all of it. Now you have a school shooter who's gonna go out there, be a piece of shit and kill people, and then their parents are on TV while, yeah, he was failed by the system. They don't even feel any shame. It's unbelievable. If one of my children or someone close to me did something that heinous, I would be disgusted. I would, I would apologize just for the sake of, just for the name alone. There's no honor left. There's no pride left in the name. And this is what happens when you remove honor and pride from people. 
You have no honor and no pride. Nothing really matters. What matters anyway? It doesn't matter if you're out of shape. It doesn't matter if your kid's a piece of shit and a criminal. Nothing matters without honor and pride. And this is done on absolutely every level. I said this to Tristan the other day. I was actually saying we were driving. Well, the other day, long, long time ago. <laughs> I haven't left the house in a while. We were driving and I said, every, even on the most base level, I said, every building is ugly. Have you noticed that every new building is ugly? It's ugly. Tristan goes, yeah, it's all the same glass, big square, ugly building. In the 1400s, we built these ornate, gorgeous buildings. And now everything's ugly. Why is that? And well, I'll tell you why it is. It's because they don't want you to have any intrinsic attachment to a specific place. If, if all the buildings are beautiful in a specific town, you have intrinsic attachment to that town. You care about that town. You want good things for that town. You'll protect that town. You'll defend that town. What, what is that? That's a barrier. That's a parameter. If everything looks the same all the time, you'll just move. Who cares? Oh, they've messed up San Fran. Who cares? I'll move somewhere else. I'll move somewhere else. It's all the same. Globalism, doesn't matter. It's all the same. Buildings in Berlin and New York, they all look the same. Where's all the beauty gone? When there's beauty, you have an attachment to that beauty. They want to remove all your attachments from everything. Even now, when they try and psyop you into, let's say, the, the way that models all look different than they used to before, right? Models all look different. Victoria's Secret. Yeah, and I was arguing this point. And someone's saying, oh, but that's because you have Euro Eurocentric beauty standards. I said, no. I'm going to correct you, because I know you think you sound smart using the word Eurocentric, and I'm going to correct you because you're a dumbass. <laughs> Let me tell you what beauty standards are. Beauty standards, by definition, for something to be beautiful, has to at least be unique. If everything is beautiful, then it's not beautiful. If everything's beautiful, then it's standardized. For you to take a model who looks the way they look without any effort at all, and they look like most out of shape, uninteresting people on the street. You cannot call that beautiful because it's standardized, you can see it everywhere. Beauty means it must have been difficult to obtain. Whether it's a building, it's difficult to make because it's ornate, or a woman who's trained really hard to have a beautiful figure, that is difficult. Difficulty and beauty are linked. You can't have beauty without difficulty. You cannot show me another model and tell me that my Eurocentric beauty standards are saying she isn't hot, because that's not why. She isn't hot because she's made no effort. She hasn't tried, that's why. And they're doing this with everything. Everything is ugly. Nothing has a standard. Nobody has to try for anything. No parameter. No baseline belief of what's true and what's false. Everything's subjective. Your truth. No, there's the truth. There's no such thing as your truth. And this is an attack on every single level. They're assaulting us from everywhere. Even the buildings they build are assaulting you. So you can't even just drive through a town and go, wow, look how much energy has been put into this place. I love this place. I will not allow them to do it to this place. Now it's just like, ah, we can move there. Ah, let's move there. It's all the same anyway. It's all a Starbucks on the corner and a 7-Eleven. Who cares? It's all the same. Why fight? Why fight for any of it? This is, it's all done purposefully. I'm telling you, there's, call me a conspiracy theorist. Call me crazy. I don't understand why an architect would now decide, who hires an architect? I'm going to build a building. Let me hire an architect to come up with the same sketch of the same bullshit building, which is already existing everywhere. How much did I pay him? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to build a skyscraper made of grass that looks like every other one. Is that it? We did all this 600 years ago. We built cathedrals and now we build this crap? Why? Everything is on purpose. It's all a psyop. It's all a psyop. When they're putting these models on there, the psyop is you don't have to try. You don't have to try at anything. Don't try. It doesn't matter. Just don't try. Wait for the government. We'll give you some food stamps. You'll be okay. It's Participation slavery. Participation trophy. It's slavery. It's slavery. When you need to do every single thing they say to eat, that's their end goal. That's what they want. It's slavery. They don't want you trying anything. Even going to the gym today is an act of rebellion. Even being in good physical condition is an act of rebellion. If I put up a photo of me and I'm in good physical shape, there are people who write underneath it, oh, you're dumb, you train so dumb. They insult you for it. Like, it's a, you're a bad person because you have standards for yourself. That's the level of bug man they want to get you to. Of course, these people will give up meat and eat the bugs and live in the pod. Of course they will. They have no standards. They have no self-respect, no standards. Of course they can live in an ugly building, a big ugly matrix pod. That's all they want. Is it, is it somebody has to sell you on that? Or is it going back to conditioning? Or what would it be? Is it someone selling you or is it conditioning? And, 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 it, and it goes back to my original point about the family. I do believe that the reason we didn't have so many problems before is because I believe the families had standards. And some, some cultures still do. I have friends who are Chinese. My dad, I cannot not get an A. That's just their culture. When my dad was still alive and he was teaching chess, my dad would charge four or $500 an hour for chess lessons. And towards the end of his life, he goes, all of my students are Chinese or Indian. Nobody else wants to spend money, $500 an hour to teach their kids chess. Only the Chinese and Indians will spend that money to make sure their kid is that good. 
So that, that's it. They're the ones who invest the most in their children. They still care on that level. But most families don't wake up and go, ah, I want my children to act a certain way for the legacy, for the family name as a whole. I'm instilling standards upon them because of the last name. My entire life I've had standards in, instilled upon me. My entire life. Your last name's Tate, you can't do that. Your last name's Tate, you're not allowed to do that. Your last name's Tate, hit him back. I've been like that my whole life. And now we've removed all standards from everybody. This is why you get school shooters. These school shooters should be too embarrassed to even embarrass their fathers. They should wake up and go, I would never do this to my, to my family. And I'll also, this is definitely gonna get me canceled, but I'm gonna say it because it's true. I'll say it by extension for suicide. I don't care what you do to me. I'm Andrew Tate. I cannot kill myself. I can't. I'm not allowed. It's against, it's against the creed of my last name. I didn't have ancestors who suffered how they suffered, who went through what they went through for me to be born to kill myself. That's not why, that's not the end of my story. I refuse. I absolutely refuse. No matter how bad it gets or what bad situation I'm in, I refuse to do it because I have too much respect for my last name. I won't do it. And I, and I think that a lot of things, a lot of men's mental health, a lot of crises can actually just come back to the old adages of honor. And, and you can fix a lot of it. Your girl left you, you miss her. I get it, we've all been heartbroken. She's with a new guy, you're upset. She doesn't care, you care, I get all of it. But there has to be a point where you get to a level of pride and you just go, that's not who I am. I lost her, that's life. You just got to get on with it. And the best way is to have, where do you find the strength when you're in these difficult situations. I always find the strength from, from my last name. I'm Andrew Tate. I'm Andrew Tate, so I just have to do it. I'm in a Romanian jail cell. I wake up, there's cockroaches in, in my bed. They're all over my face. Well, what am I gonna do, cry? Well, am I gonna bitch out? Am I gonna go and sign a piece of paper and say I'm guilty? I'm gonna sell my brother out? Is that what I'm gonna do? Am I gonna go fucking lie and, and, put these, and sell the girls out like they want me to? Am I gonna stand up and say, I'm sorry for, for saying go to the gym like a pussy? No, I'm gonna take the cockroaches off my mouth I'm going to do some push-ups because I'm Andrew Tate. When shit really gets hard, honor and courage and bravery and your last name is all you've ever had. It's all you're going to have. And it used to be like that in the olden days. That's why no one did this dumb shit. They were just too embarrassed to even do it. And this is why you're saying, how do we fix the country? Absolutely all of it comes down to the fact that, especially with men, none of them are bestowed with the things that the masculine essence needs to be a good man. You need pride. You need honor. You need a healthy level of ego. You need all of these things. We're taking it all from boys. And what are we giving them instead? Video games, porn, weed. And what do you expect of these people? What do you expect of these shit versions of men besides trash output? You're going to get garbage of all across the spectrum. Either they're going to do nothing or they're going to do something bad. They're certainly not going to do anything good when they don't try for anything in their lives. How are they going to do something good? The scary thing about all of this is that there still are two teams in the world. And there, are, there is a side of the world where they don't accept this crap. How long is America going to compete globally when you have countries like China and Russia and these other countries where they don't do this? I don't know if you saw, in, uh, they did that survey to kids of what they want to be when they grow up. Did you ever see that? Yeah, it was crazy. Every American kid wanted to be a YouTuber. YouTuber yeah. Every Everyone. Chinese kid wanted to be an engineer or an astronaut. Yeah. Who owns the future? Who owns the future? We're in so much trouble. We're in so much trouble as a society. And what are we arguing over? It's insane. And what do they show you on TikTok, though? Oh, absolutely. Exactly. But this, this, let's stay on this. You asked a very important question. Let's go back to it. We had the same amount of guns, 1950 per capita. Brandon, can you look at that per capita, how many guns we had in 1950 versus today? Yeah. But it's relatively the same. Gun laws haven't changed dramatically from 1950 till today. What's changed from then, then today? We took out God, God yep. out of school. Prozac was invented in 1987. Yep. The law to legalize advertising uh, drugs, Big Pharma, in America was 1985. It's only two countries in the world that can advertise, us and New Zealand. Crazy. So you got God, you got Prozac, you got uh, 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 Big advertising. Pharma advertising, you got the, the LGBTQ movement that's taking place. You got all of that taking place to where we are today. So when you're talking about guns, what has changed? It's not the guns that's changed. Society has changed. Standards have changed. Completely. So, so how, do you, how do you fix that? So if that, if that is the biggest problem you're selling, yeah. number one, here's a problem. Let me sell you why this is the problem. Okay, the people are like, you're right, I'm buying it. Give us a solution. What's the solution? Yeah, I think the solution comes back down to, to family values, and that's a very difficult question to answer because it's across the entire spectrum, right? I do feel like it's almost 
a race to the bottom for men and women now in the modern society. I don't think women are being very good women. I don't think men are being very good men. And I think both of that is accelerating against each other and it's a race to the bottom. How do you fix that? It's difficult. It's hard. And I still think one of the easiest ways to do that is God. I think if you bring back some degree of morality and some degree of standard to both sexes, I think things will start to get better. I can tell you right now, they talk about why does men not want to get married anymore. Men don't want to get married anymore. They come up with all these elaborate reasons. The main reason men don't want to get married anymore is because their girlfriend was with me for free. So why are they going to marry her? That's, that, that's the bottom line of it. Why would you, a, a white dress means virgin. Marry who? A girl from the club? Who your friends have been with? You want to marry her? Like when you remove all of the morality from life, you just end up in a scenario where the only possible logical move is to act without morals. Game theory, right? We sit there and we analyze things logically. If you're going to be, if, if all the women you meet are immoral, how are you going to act? You, well, you act morally, you get wrecked. So how do you act? Immorally. It's a race to the bottom. We have to fix society as a whole. And it comes down to even the most basic things, the most basic things like female promiscuity, the most basic things like men sticking up for their last name, the most basic things like men having to be too honorable and too proud to be out of shape or be poor or not take care of a woman. I'm not just talking about women. I'm talking about men. Any woman who's with me, her life is fixed. That is my job. I'm Andrew Tate. I would be embarrassed to have a girl say, I'm Andrew Tate's girlfriend and have to work her job if, unless she wanted to. She could do anything she wants. She's my chick. You can have anything. You run the world now. You're with the top G. Anything you want is mine. I'll take care of you in every single way, but you must take care of me. I take, take care of you financially and physically. You must protect me spiritually. You must do your job. It's a race to the bottom on both sides. And when you have two genders racing to the bottom and then a child is born, what do we expect from this child? Who's raising the child? The school, the TV, the internet. You trust these people? Look what they're injecting into them. So another thing that's very interesting, you talk about the 1950s, another thing that was different, in the 1950s, parents raised their kids. Who raises kids nowadays? School. School, internet, Twitch. How much time do you spend talking to your child compared to the programming they get from the Matrix? You're, you're losing in terms of pure minutes. You're losing. You can't even control what your child sees in school anymore. You don't even know. And when you find out, they do what they did in California. They're like, what? Most people don't even know this. You have children 15 years old, I've seen it on YouTube, arguing with their own parents, disagreeing with their own parents. The whole point of having children is to instill your values in them. I want my sons to be Emory Andrew Tate. They must think and act and be like me. And for someone, I've had people say to me, what if they're not? If they're not, they're not, that's fine. But the whole point of me having them was my lineage. That's the whole point of me suffering to raise them was my lineage. Why would I raise them to be anything other than what I believe I should be and they should be? That's the whole point of it. And I'm proud of that. I'm not going to sit and apologize for wanting my sons to be Tates. I'm not going to apologize for it. I don't care what the school wants them to believe. They believe what I want them to believe because they are mine. But all of that's gone. So then we also talk about what's different between the 1950s and today. These kids are being raised by people who aren't their parents. And whoever's raising them clearly ain't teaching them anything good. It's teaching them, if you feel, feel, act how you feel. You can't tell men that. It's dangerous. You can't tell men to act how they feel. You can't tell men to not have emotional control. You can't tell men to cry anytime they want. Because men don't just cry sad. They cry angry. They, they cry very angry. You don't want that. You have to teach them stoicism. You have to teach them all of these things. And it's all gone. So, okay, so st st let's stay on this. This is actually a very interesting topic we're in from 1950s till today. So you're saying uh, if somebody is a Tate, if somebody is my wife, if somebody is my son, you you're going to be doing this. I'm not going to let a teacher X, Y, Z. Okay. Well, 85, 90% of America doesn't have the money to be able to Correct. put them in a, public, a private school. Correct. Where right now is June. If you go on YouTube or Twitter and look at Pride Month, everywhere, kids are coming to school, parents... You know, teachers got these uh, pride stuff going on all over the place. Parents are like, look, I'd love to put them in a private school, but even some private schools are doing it right now. Mm -hmm. In Florida, there is a private school. It's known one of the best private schools out there. You know which one I'm talking yeah, about? I, I won't mention it. It starts with the letter P. People yeah. should know what it is, but they all know who I'm talking about. We have a party at our house, okay? And baseball. My son, you know, so he's got a baseball. All the players are their parents. I'm talking to the parents. So, hey. Meet one of the girls, so what school do you go to? Oh, well, you know, uh, I was going to such and such school, but now I'm going to such and such school. Oh, really? Tell me why. The dad's like, yeah, it's just, you know, reasons. He gets uncomfortable. Yeah. I said, no, really, tell me why. I'm curious. Well, you know, I don't really want to get into that. I said, are you uncomfortable because it's political reasons? Well, yes. I said, well, let's just say you're safe yeah. to say it here. Yeah, yeah. He says, am I fully safe? Yeah. I said, what do I need to tell you for you to know you're fully safe? You're fully safe with us because you know my position. Yeah. He says, fair. He says, we took him out because 
they started asking my daughter to do X, Y, Z with pride to write on this. And she wrote a letter, yeah. a paper that was opposing the opinion. Yeah. And she failed the class because her opinion didn't match whatever they were saying. And boom. Yeah. Now, so, so I said, what's going on with that private school? That school's 50 grand a year per kid. The one that's yeah. grooming. 50 grand 50 a year, grand per, a year kid. per kid. Yeah. There's an exodus from this school to go to other schools. So one, some parents don't have the option, Andrew to say, you and I are not worried about it. I'm not worried yeah. about it, but the people I'm leading, they're worried about it. Absolutely. How do you fix it if you're that person without the resources you got? And that's another thing that's difficult because I have two answers to this question. I have the, the arrogant answer, not the answer that I believe I think I know the arrogant one. We'll yeah. give both of them. Let's, I'll give both. Yeah. The one I actually believe is helpful. This is where I think things like we discussed earlier, like the Klan comes into, comes into effect, right? Imagine you had 18 kids from six or seven fam parents, groups of parents, and everyone's living together. The family unit, the, the energy and the ethos and the, the merits of that particular clan is gonna be so much stronger and difficult for the matrix to penetrate and break. Their best friends are the people they live with. The kids live with the other kids who believe the same as them. The parents all agree. When you're a clan, you're far more difficult to attack and assault. So I would say the first thing I would do if I was a parent of, of normal income, I would try and find other parents who agree with me and try and find other people who are ideologically sound. And I'd make sure that our, our children are friends and they spend the most time with each other. And I would try for us all to go on holidays together. And I would also put in conscious effort to try and deprogram. I don't think many parents say to their kids, what did you learn today? I'd be doing that not to check on the kid. I'd be doing the check, on the, you. check on the school. But let me challenge you what's going on. Sure. So let's role play. Go ahead. Ask me the question. What did you learn at school today? So today we learned that, you know, uh, Dylan Mulvaney had the courage to stand up for her beliefs. And she's a, a, she's a hero because she's out there and she's helping a lot of other people that are going through challenging times be able to stand up for themselves. Okay. What are you going to tell me? I would say, why do you think they want you to believe that? What do you mean that? Why do you think they want you to believe that? They've told you something. Yeah. I don't believe that's true. What they've done is lie to you. Why do they want you to believe that? Perfect. So say you now convince me I'm your son. Yeah. Great. I go to school tomorrow. Yeah. Ready? Correct. Now I'm in school. Correct. Hey, Miss Jones says, hey, Patrick, so tell me, so what did you think about this as this? You have to write this paper. Well, let me tell you, last time I was having a conversation with my dad, yeah. and my dad told me, why do you want me to believe that? Yeah. Then comes the phone call. Yep. And then now you're cornered as a parent, and now what do you say to the school? Say I'm the school, role play. Correct. And this is, and I can't role that's play what, it by myself. That's it's what difficult. I'm that's it's difficult. The point. And this is the exact point why you need a clan, you need a network, you need other parents. If I was a parent and my child yeah. was going to public school, I'd be extremely interested in finding other parents whose kids were going to that public school. Yeah, you have the PTA meetings, etc. But there has to be a degree of strength in numbers. It's hard. You can say homeschooling. That's the, that's the cop out. But the other answer, the more arrogant answer to this, is actually an answer I gave after the subway incident. You know in New York with the subway where they choked the guy mm -hmm. and he died? Yep. I get asked all the time, Andrew, what would you have done in that scenario? It's a very difficult scenario. I mean, we can argue whether he choked him too long, whether he was trying to protect sure. people. There's a bunch of arguments. But it's very unfortunate. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. You can no longer just be the average man, the average citizen. I insulate myself from so many problems with money. I know this is a terrible thing to say and people aren't gonna like hearing it, but it's true. I never have to worry about some garbage on the subway. I never have to worry about, do I stand up and defend this woman or allow her to get attacked because they're gonna put me in jail? I never have to worry about some fight on a plane because the ticket was $40. I never have to worry about my kid going to learn something they don't wanna learn. I don't have to worry about any of this because money protects me, right? So when I say this, like if I have a girl and she's saying, all you do is work, you need to be a dad too. I'm being a dad by being rich. That's me being a dad. That's how I protect you all. I'll work 18 hours a day every single day. That's me being a dad more than almost anything. Cause that's how I protect you and everybody else from all this insanity. It's the only way to do it because you need to be flexible. We're fully on the same page. I'm on the same page as you. I also went and made the money so I get to pick and choose. Yeah. What I'm talking about is a message because the reality is not everybody is gonna go out there and make the Correct. 10 a month or Correct. whatever you make. It's just not gonna happen. Correct. The, the market's not set up that way. Correct. Quite frankly, not everybody brings that kind of value to the market Correct. to garner that kind of pay. You Correct. know that, I know that. Correct. Okay, how can you and I help the audience that is sitting there, great citizens, yep. net positive. Yep. They take their kids to church on Sundays. Yep. They work their butts off. They're doing their best to keep their marriage together as hard as it is. Yep. They're paying the bills for the kids. They're making 80 grand, 120 household income. Yep. 
they can't talk like you and you're, I. You're right. What do they do? You're right. Let's so, give them the solution. You're right. So if I were them, here's what I would do. I would make sure that my family had core parameters and core beliefs that we believed in, and I would fact check everything my child was told against those core parameters and core beliefs. So let's say one of our core parameters and core beliefs was hard work. We believed in hard work and dedication. When they came home and told me something about uh, body shaming or the fact that models can change, I'd say, does that agree with the beliefs and the, the merits that this family has decided we are gonna operate under? Yes or no? I would have a framework, I would have a gate which ideas have to penetrate through. Every idea has to be fact checked against a gate, a parameters of set values that was stuck to my last name. Honor, courage, discipline, hard work, whatever those parameters are. And I'd say to my child every day, what did you learn in school? And I'd listen to it and I'd say, does that align with our value on this? And also I'd make this very clear because this was done to me as a child. I'd make it very clear to my children that they're exceptional. I think every single person is exceptional for different reasons. We talk about normal children, normal families, that, uh, that doesn't mean they're not an exceptional individual. They can still be an exceptional person. Totally. Who knows? Who who knows yeah. what they might become? Sure. I'd say you're an exceptional. You don't believe what everyone else in that school is told to believe just because it is said. You're an exceptional person and we have a framework we operate under because your last name is X and our framework is this. Does that align with hard work and dedication? No, it doesn't. Why are they trying to tell you that? Because they're trying to attack the framework which you need to be successful. My father said to me when I was young, you are now, my father had many, many quotes and I use them all the time, but one of my favorites was, I allow manipulation to find out where my enemy wants me to go. And then I use my mind to break the trap and punish the perpetrators. That's, exact, that's the exact line I will tell my child. I'll say, they've attempted to manipulate you. We've allowed it. I allowed you to go to school and listen to this. Why were they trying to manipulate you? Where do they want you to go? They want to take you away from discipline. Yeah. They want to take you away from hard yeah. work. Now we're going to use our minds to break the trap. We now know what they want. My father explained this saying to me, and he said why it was so important, and it's true. If you don't allow them to manipulate you at all, you don't know where they want you to end up. You might get tricked another way. You might take another road to the same destination. Mm -hmm. You allow the manipulation. Tell me what you want me to believe. Tell me what you want me to understand. You allow them to manipulate me all the way to the end. I see the end goal. Yep. This is what you want. No. And this is what I would teach my children. Explain. Your time in school is going to teach you some very important things that you need to know. And they're also attempting to psyop you and trick you and poison your mind. And we are going to discuss daily, built within our family framework, within the code of our last name, to see which are true and which are lies. It takes work, like everything else on earth. It takes work. And I know it's hard. Parents are out there. They're working. They haven't got time. Yeah. Their kids are on the internet. It's difficult. But you have to put the work in because you are mm. almost fighting an enemy for the minds of your children now. You know what I think, you know what I think is, that's great, F very good feedback, but, so I lived in Iran, yeah. and in Iran, you'd go out there and you'd say, so hey, listen, people are asking about religion, don't talk about it. Yeah. Are we Christians? I don't know. Yeah. Talk to my mom and dad. You don't need to answer the question, yeah. right? Because there's that fear. Yeah. So parents are teaching kids to not talk about their values and principles. The element that parents fear what the school's gonna say to them and not give the kids the best grades? Because imagine you got a 10th grader or even a senior. If you really say what you believe in, that teacher gives you a C, you don't get the A to get the 4.3 GPA, yeah. to get the scholarship because you yeah. can't afford it. You have to be like constantly like yeah. this. So parents are telling their kids, look, whatever I'm telling you, don't tell them. I think, it's, I think it's bigger than that. I think a part of it is, I think a part of it is, this is the first time we had stats, and I don't know in how long this was, where uh, kids no longer, uh, p kids graduating high school are not valuing a four-year college as much as they did before, mm -hmm. okay? That is a threat to the establishment because they can't be a control, right? Yeah. Number two is there is an element, when I'm watching this video with these parents yesterday in Glendale, and this is where I grew up, this is my street. I grew up Broadway and Verdugo, right next to that uh, post office. I'm 200 yards away from the high school is where I grew up and I lived on uh, uh, Doran for a couple years before I went to Wilson Junior High School. And I'm seeing these parents upset, like how is this, this is common sense, leave these kids alone. Yeah. I think there's gotta be an element of those parents coming together yeah. in a form of a strike, yeah. I believe, yeah. to say if you want the tax funded money that's being given to your school district, hey, we're not coming, we're gonna decide to do schooling together and we're gonna use this place or that place or this facility and that facility because they have to feel the pain. They, they cannot do that to the kids. So my only messaging with what you're saying right now, number one rule is what? Go start a part-time income, make an additional three grand a month so you can send them to the private school that they're yeah. teaching right values. Okay, that's number one. Two, 
I can't afford to do that. Three, this is the other option that you got. Yeah, and you're right. And Trump said it in his book, The Art of the Deal. He said, if you're not prepared to walk away, you can't negotiate. And that's the same with absolutely everything. If, you have, if there's never a bottom line in which you say enough, then you can't negotiate. You have no negotiating position. We talk about this when it comes to children in schools, but this is also very applicable for relationships. I've had girls who say to me, you know what, I was watching TV and they were saying that, I don't know, X, Y, Z. And I would say, listen, I take care of you. I love you very much. I'm gonna make sure you have everything you've ever wanted. I'm gonna make sure you're physically safe. That's why you're not gonna go walking a home alone drunk. It's not because I'm a misogynist. It's not because I dislike you. It's not because I'm controlling. It's not because I'm manipulative. It's because it's for your safety and your safety to a degree is my responsibility. But I saw on the news X, Y, Z. If you believe the news over me, then go find another man. You have to be prepared to walk away, right? This is the bottom line of it. This is what I personally believe. Uh, These, are These are my values. I'm 100% with you. These are my values. And this is what I personally believe. Yep. If, you're, and if, if she says, well, no, I'm not listening to you, and I stay with her anyway, well, then it's over, isn't it? And then she's going to do whatever she wants. But not everybody can do that because you've course. earned the right. Of Again, course. The, the, the proposition you're offering is so high that they have to sit there and say, I can't lose this guy. Completely. And yes. this is where we go back to the original point about how difficult it is to be the average man now. I, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult. We're in a position now where you have a racetrack and you have Ferraris and Nissans. And yeah, we can discuss how the Nissan might beat the Ferrari, but the truth is, it's hard. It's very, very hard. If I was a man and I was starting all over again, I would, be do, I would do the same things I did. I would wake up and say, okay, this game is extremely difficult. My best chance is to level up my character to a point where the game becomes easy. Because life does become easy at a certain point. Yes, now I'm in a very unique situation. But before this situation, I had only three problems in my life, my health, which I take care of, my woman, who I take care of, and money. I, that was it. If I made enough money, I had no other problems. If you're broke, you have lots of small problems. Yeah. The, the car doesn't start, the school fees are coming up, whatever, we need new clothes for the kids. I had one problem to fix. If I fix my one issue, everything else is fixed. You get to a point in life where someone goes, oh, we've got an issue, how much? Just tell me the number. I don't even wanna know the ins and outs. Just do the transfer, make it go away. So. Yeah, as a man, I think you have that imperative to understand that the video game of life as a man is exceptionally difficult, and especially as you get older, as you progress with the levels, it gets harder. It's getting harder and harder. You need to level up your character. This is what amazes me when men go, I struggle with motivation. How can you struggle with motivation in the modern world? Are you asking to just lose? Are you asking to just be erased from humanity? Yep. Are you asking to be invisible? How can you be an 18 year old man and say, I don't have the motivation to train as hard as possible and get as rich as possible. You are born to lose if you don't have motivation at 18. In the modern world, as competitive as it is, all those girls, those 18 year old girls you go to school with are talking to some 28 year old man on a, with a yacht somehow. And you're sitting there lonely and you don't have motivation? You must be out of your mind. The only way to win this game is to become as powerful as possible. It's difficult and it's getting harder and harder. And this is why I teach the things I teach to men. You can't just be Joe Schmo and win anymore. That, those days are over. You have to be something else. The challenge those young men have though, it's not, sometimes not even their fault. Why? Single mother, yep. raised by a single mother. Yep. They've been indoctrinated and they heard the future is female a yep. million times. Yep. Next thing you know, they're 18. They kind of have this victim mentality. Yeah. It's almost not even their fault some of these times. Oh, completely. We're all in our late 30s, early 40s. We've, we've grown up, play, I played football in school. Yeah. He's an athlete, bodybuilder, obviously you're a kickboxing champion. Yeah. We've had coaches, we've had people kick our ass. Yeah, yeah. We didn't grow up with participation trophies. We've had our asses kicked. Yeah. We've gone through shit, now we are the shit. Yeah. A lot of these young guys playing video games, addicted to porn, they yeah. grow up with a phone in their hand, yeah. raised by women, they don't have they weren't raised how we were raised. How do you teach those kids though? Well, that's why they don't, that's exactly what they don't want me doing. That's why they're trying to put me in jail. Because I've managed to become, I, I, I'm not for a second bragging, but I've, the, the size of the movement that I created, I turned up in Slovenia. I don't know if you've ever seen that video with the Bugatti where everyone's going, top G, top G. That's mm. the capital of Slovenia. I can't even pronounce it, Lib Libuana or something. I've never been there before. I, Slovenia, where even is it? Like, I, I can barely find it on a map. I know roughly where it is. If you want a guaranteed way to get in touch with me, maybe you have a business idea, maybe you want some fashion tips, maybe you just want to connect, you could find me on Minect. This is what I was saying earlier on about how complicated masculinity is, but I broke it down to those three basic tenets because even a teenage boy can understand if you get enough money and enough power and enough powerful friends and enough sexual access that you're gonna be able to build yourself to a man of, I can cry now. I've qualified to cry. When you're an 18 year old boy, you can't, you shouldn't be crying. 
You should be focused and you should be an animal and you should be training, you should be working hard, and you should be listening, you should be going to coaching. I'm now at a level where I'm allowed to cry. I understand all the different t elements of being a man. I understand the tapestry of masculinity fully. I can cry if I decide to, I've qualified for that. But before you get to that point, you have to go through all the hard shit. And the hard shit, I've broken down to the three basics. And I think that's why they're coming to attack me so heavily. Because genuinely, because of what you just said, I'm telling kids things. And especially people often ask me, especially Matrix Media, they say, why did you get so big? Because I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth, which every man knows is intrinsically true in his heart because God has instilled him with a, a basic degree of morality of right and wrong. I'm saying things to a 17 year old boy and he's going, this is the, he makes sense. I get it. Everything I was told so far just didn't quite click, but this does. And that's what they're so scared of. And I agree with you, you're, you're completely right. And this goes back to once again, we were saying about last names, family values. The number of times I was told I couldn't do something because of my last name. I think that was my whole childhood. <laughs> my whole childhood is where you're a Tate. Dad, I got an A. Of course, you're a Tate. It wasn't even, it was just like, duh. Of course you got an A. But what else are you gonna get, a B? What, are you a dummy? <laughs> That's who I was my whole life. I had standards exacted on me. And I've even heard like psychologists, I have a big problem with psychologists. I don't like them as a whole. I'll tell you some of my scenarios. I've, I've, I've had conversations with psychologists. There's a couple good ones, but there's a lot of them who I don't like. And they, they, their ideas are, oh, you raise children, don't put standards on, don't put pressure on them. How are they gonna perform without pressure? Do you have pressure to perform in your business? Because I certainly do. I certainly do. Pressure I, makes diamonds. You think I didn't have pressure to perform when I sat down with the BBC and they tried to set me up? You think I didn't realize instantly? Okay, war, she's ready. You think, I, you think there's no pressure? You think there's no pressure when they try and stab you to death? There's no pressure in life? You're gonna raise a child and say, don't give him no pressure, give him no standards, so he can just be a kid. And what's he gonna mold into? Absolutely and early not. Life is pressure, especially as a man. You need to have these exacting standards. That's how it is. My whole life was a pressure to perform to my last name. That's all it's always ever been. I don't know how anyone's raised any other way. So yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's a very difficult problem to fix. I agree with you, it's a very difficult problem to fix. But I think it starts with baseline things. And this is also why I feel like I have such a duty to act. I'll give you an example. If I could lie right now for $10 million, and nobody would find out, nobody. I still couldn't do it because God would know and he'd punish me sooner or later. I really truly believe that I would pay the price of that lie. I truly believe it. I think when you're, if you're a man and you're growing up and you're saying, how do I act? What do I do in this scenario? What would God want you to do? Tell the truth. You'd be amazed how far just telling the truth will get you. In any situation, I can give you benign situations that don't even matter. Your girlfriend caught you. Oh, and no, and I barely know her. That I, just say yes. Sorry, I love you. I'd love to stay together. But you did this. Sorry. I'm leaving. Okay, goodbye. Next day she's back. You just tell the truth. It could have gone on for weeks. She could have kept spying. She could have called the girl. All this drama. Just sometimes in life, you just man up and tell the truth. That's why in my current scenario, when I was saying earlier, I think that's my, the only way you're free, by the way. Yeah, oh, completely. The only way you're truth free. Truth shall set you free. It shall set you free. When I was saying earlier, the incompetence of my enemies is scaring me, and I don't know exactly what to do. All I can do is just tell the truth all the time. I'm going to tell the truth all the time. I'm going to say what I mean and mean what I say, and I'm going to tell the truth, and that's who I'm going to be. That's what I think is the best yeah, thing yeah. for me to do in the current scenario. But we're not even instilling that in children anymore. We're not even telling children how important it is to not lie. Well, but, but that's, that's also part of what you're talking about. I want to show you the stat because the guy sent it to me. And then we'll put this for the audience to see as well. Percentage of gun ownership from 1972 till today. Same thing. Exactly the same. If you look at the numbers, pretty much the same thing. So what's been the biggest difference is a lot of these things that we just talked about. By the way, that question you asked from 1950 till today, the candidate that's talking about this, again, I went, up and went back to politics, RFK is talking about this. Yep. And I think it's a very important thing to talk about because it's making people go research and see for themselves and to ask the question, what really did change? Uh, completely. We've had this all the time. Completely. What became legal? Why completely. are we adding all these pharmaceuticals to yep. you know, kiss the tape? Yep. Uh, what, what else would it be outside of that? So, so that, that was the foundation, which I agree with you. Household, values, principles, kids, men, raising them better. Yep. What else would you see as a challenge from an outside. And then I got part two of the question for you. Yeah, it's... it's Anything else where you say, you know, X, Y, Z would also, by the way, I love the way you say Nissan and status. I just love the way you pronounce those <laughs> yeah. two words, man. For a second you said Nissan, I'm like, what is Nissan? And then I realized what you're talking about. Well, I remember when I was young, other people's parents would tell me off. Do you remember that? 
Did you ever get that yeah, when you were young? Of course. Other people's parents yeah. would come up and like, yeah. you better not. Random adults would just tell me yeah. off. I was scared of every grown up. Every grown up had a degree of authority. Just random adults. We can't do that anymore. There was just a degree of community that's certainly not really lost. And asking me how to bring it back is difficult. It's very hard. And that's one of the reasons why I've become so religious recently, because I think that God is definitely part of that. And that's also the reason I want to live in the clan I live in. That's why it is. My brother can tell my kids off, no problem. If I came home and Tristan's like, I, I, I had to scream at all, I'd be like, good. I trust him in his judgment. Good. Scream at them then. Good. They're children. Also, sometimes, you know what? Kids need to be yelled at sometimes. Why not yell at them? What are they going to do? Life's hard. Life's hard. The way we pander and baby children, especially, is, is, is insane. I was talking about this the other day. I was talking about how I have a, a pet peeve, and one of my pet peeves is, is painkillers. And I was being typical me, and I was going over the top. But I was saying, I was argu not arguing, I was discussing with this guy. This guy said, have you got any aspirin? I said, there's no aspirin in my house. And he said, why? I said, brother, you are not facing 1% of the life difficulties I am facing. Think about it. No government's trying to lock you up. The matrix isn't after you. They're not trying to frame you. Nobody wants you dead. When God finally gives you a tiny headache to give you something to show you're half a man, a little bit of resilience, you pussy out and take an aspirin. Can't you just have a headache? Just have a headache. And not only just have a headache, have a headache and don't mention it, because I don't care. So don't even talk about it. Nobody needs to know. <laughs> just have a headache and be quiet. I have a headache, Twitter. <laughs> yeah. What do you want? Do you want therapy? You want sympathy? Nobody cares you have a headache. Shut up. It kind of goes back into my original conversation when I was saying I don't like psychotherapists and all their garbage, because they're constantly, I don't believe in, I've, I've had conversations with therapists a few times. And my biggest detractors and enemies say, you need to talk to a therapist. The last <laughs> conversation I had with a therapist didn't go very well. I said I didn't believe in uh, most of their field and that it was garbage. And she said, why? And I said, because there are some boys who don't drink alcohol because their dad was an alcoholic. And there are some boys who are alcoholics because their dad was an alcoholic. You have the same scenario and different outcomes. So I don't believe in it. And she said, well, no, it's not an exact science, but we have generalized rules that we can follow that lead to patterns of behavior. I said, but I'm not a generalized person. I'm an exceptional person. So everything you've learned and everyone you've ever spoken to and everything in your books does not apply to me because I'm exceptional and I'm smarter than you and I've done things you could never do. And I'm a world champion athlete and I'm richer than you'll ever be. So nothing you know can possibly apply to my, my, my mindset. So why are we sitting here talking? What was the reaction? She just wrote things down on a piece of paper. <laughs> Probably called me an arrogant piece of shit. But he said he's a, don't like this guy. Complete narcissist, yeah, 100%, egomaniac, 100%. who knows what's going on But here. I'm right. Yeah. There's nothing you've learned in your you book that applies to people. It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to me. So I don't want to hear it. Don't care. Don't care. And, and this whole idea, this goes back to the thing about uh, painkillers. That's something I didn't just make up. That's from my dad. I remember being at my friend's house, and I remember him saying I need an aspirin, and he had an aspirin. I remember just being a child and coming home and saying I want an aspirin. I remember my dad going, for what? You're a kid. Shut up. No, you're not popping pills. And I remember my mother going, it's only an aspirin. No, well, nothing wrong with you. Your body is, is going to go through the same damage it's suffering, if any at all, whether you feel the pain or not. Man up. Get over it. It comes down to the details. It's like if you're a professional fighter and you get to a certain level, your coach, once you've been training for 10 years, your coach is honing you on the details. It's the tiniest details that make you a predator. The tiny things. Mayweather does 1% better than the guy he beats. It's the tiny details. So simple things like denying a child a painkiller when you know there's nothing wrong with them. I'm not, I'm not saying if he had surgery, he can't have painkillers. I'm saying if he walks in, there's nothing actually wrong with the kid. Say no. It's all the tiny little things you need to do to instill pain, you need to instill that resilience inside of them. I was in jail and I could just hear crying and sobbing from every cell but mine. Everyone's in there having a mental breakdown but me. And the, the, most thing, the scariest thing about my position and I think it's the position for most people who end up in jail in Romania because of how the legal system works and the extensions and that. You don't know how long you're in there for. You don't know. It could be a year, could be five, could be three days. That's what messes with your brain. You're like, do I prepare for six months of this? Do I prepare for five years of this? What's going on? Nobody knows. Everyone's in there having mental breakdowns but me. Why did I not have a mental breakdown? Because I've had too much crap happen to me too many times and never took the painkiller, never took the easy way out, never asked for the therapist, never been a bitch about it. This, this is how life works. There's no way to the top besides the difficulty and the pain and the trauma. I say, I, 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 I'm really flabbergasted that there's men out here who still believe they're gonna somehow become something of importance without it. Of course she broke your heart, good, good, good. 
<laughs> Good. I'm tired of people complaining and crying about it. That's the game. That's the life. So yeah, it comes down to tiny things, even down to painkillers, smallest things. My dad used to, another thing my dad used to make me do, he used to just make me drink water. I remember being a kid and it would upset me. I'd be sitting there playing chess or whatever. He'd say, go drink two liters of water. And I'd go and I'd get some water and I'd start drinking it and say, I'm not thirsty. I don't want to drink the rest. And he'd stand there and make me drink all two liters. Now I understand it was just compliance. Two liters of water is not going to hurt me. Not going to hurt me. Do I really need it? Who knows? I drank a liter. Why do I have to drink all two? Because he said so. That was the household. If I, was, if I tried to rebel, I really don't want it. I'm not thirsty. Da -da. You're going to drink that water. That's, the, that's it. And it's all these tiny things that instill discipline in you. Over a long enough time frame, drink water. Yes, sir. Bring that to compliance today, though. Bring that to compliance today. Say your dad is uh, uh, around today yep. and you're 12 years old. Yep. And you're living in Ohio. Yep. Okay. And your dad is teaching you compliance. Yep. And your dad says, okay, so now teacher in school tells you what to do. He's right. He's this. He's that. What is the uh, uh, angle you're taking at that time? Yeah, and that's another thing that's difficult because back then it was much easier to say you shouldn't get in trouble at school. Right. Much easier. Than Today's kind of like a badge of honor almost. Almost. You stand up. Almost. And, and it is hard. But my loyalty was always to my last name above anything else. This just depends where your loyalty lies. I think that everyone, when we talk about, we can link back into religion and talk about atheists. I don't think there's such thing as an atheist nowadays. I think everyone has a religion. If you're not religious to God, you're religious to either this woke agenda or you're religious to a political party yep. or you're religious to some kind of perversion. Yep. Everyone's religious to something. You have to decide what is you're most loyal to above everything. You have to put these things in hierarchy or order. In our last, in our last talk, I said, to, I said this. A lot of people hold beliefs and they don't know where they got them from or why they hold them. They, there's people walking around who believe things and they don't know where it came from or why they so strongly believe it. They don't even have any personal experience to link it to. You truly believe two plus two is five. Why? Oh, because it just is. And the news and the news. No, no. What happened to you that made you believe? Nothing's even happened to you. Yep. And you believe this with your complete core. Yep. You've been psyoped. I, I know where my loyalties lie. I've had them in order. I know who, who, I, put, who I put above others. I absolutely not really know. And sometimes in the most harsh situations on earth, there's going to be scenarios in life which are completely and utterly, they're unexpected and they're exceptionally rare where you have to make very difficult choices. But I know my, my hierarchy. I know. I know if I was in a position, a hypothetical, where I had to choose between my brother or my girl, I, there wouldn't be a, oops, what do I do? I know the choice. It's never been the case between the two of you? It's never been the case between us yet. But if it happened, I know it would be. I've had girls say, I, I've had girls try and give me the line. I've had girls do it. I've had girls say, if you're going to live with your brother, then it's going to be No, weird. that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, has a girl ever come in between you guys since you were kids? Never. Never. Ne it, it's impossible. That's because of the value taught down. Completely. It's, absolute, it's absolutely impossible. So the hierarchy of compliance and respect at that time, last name was first. Yep. Where would it be today? If you're raising kids today, yep. what is number one? Is it God? It is God. Is it me second? Then, then who? No, it is God. It's God first and then it's the last name and the legacy in my teachings. I think it has to be God first. I think it has to be God first because God is the only thing that can resist this insanity. Yep. What is happening is truly evil. This is not some different worldview. No, it is evil because it is dishonest. Anything that is dishonest must be evil. It is a lie. All of it is a lie. It is constructed deliberately to be a lie. It's deliberately constructed to alter the minds of people to believe in lies. It is evil. So it has to be God first because God is truth. And I believe if I have children who put God first and then put respect for the last name and the things I've taught them second, it's very hard to corrupt them. How are you going to truly corrupt these people? It's going to be very difficult. And that's what I always try and do. And that's how I was raised. I, I was raised in a Christian family. I was actually raised religiously. Then I thought I was smart when I became atheistic. Because, yeah, there's a lot wrong with the world. And obviously, I'm, I've already apologized for that and understand I was completely wrong. But respect for my last name, even to this day, is still there. I, and, and, and that's why I say to my girlfriend, if we were walking down the street and 10 men have approached with machetes, I'd just have to die. I can't be Andrew Tate ran away. I just can't. I can't be Andrew Tate ran away. I can't do it. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. If you're living in this clan, right? You're living here, your family, yep. Tristan's family. Yep. You're raising your family. Yep. Muslim, Islam. Yep. Your brother's still Christian. Yep. How's that going to work? Well, there's one if God. God's first. There's one God. There's, I truly believe there's different paths to God. I truly believe that. Like I said, I'm not a religious scholar, but it says in the Quran, people of the book. Even, a, even a, as a Muslim man, I'm allowed to marry a Christian woman. They are of the book. 
It's only atheists that the Quran has a problem with because there's something morally corrupt with them. But if you're a person of the book, a person of faith, we don't, we're not even, even says inside the Quran, we're not supposed to convert you or insult you. We're not here to insult you or correct you. There's one path, there's different paths to the one God. I truly believe that. And I also, another thing I'll say about clan living, in my experience, I think that men quite often get along in those scenarios. If anyone is hearing the idea of this and love the idea of this, but they feel like it would be argumentative or there'd be problems, I think that comes from the women. I think it's when women don't like each other or the woman's in the man's ear. You're too bad with the guys. That I think the women are more against it than the men for some reason, unless you have a very strong frame in the relationship. I don't have that problem, but in general. The men get along. The men love it. I think, I think it's quite firm and quite, and, and quite uh, rigidly installed inside of the basic psyche of men. We like that. Men feel best in a gang, in a group. It's, it's why we charge at the gunfire. When we're with our boys, it's when we feel strongest. It's why we go out and drink and party when you're with your guys. There's something inside of you you just feel like on fire. I think men have that. A lot of the time it doesn't seem to work and it breaks down because women can be unhappy in certain scenarios. But this is why, especially in, in, in some ethnic communities where the gender roles are more specific and defined, where the man is in charge and the woman does this, they can live, all live together in peace. It's much easier for them. Like I said, I grew up in a, in, a, in a town full of Muslims. They'd have 10 families in one house. The women cooked, cleaned, looked after the children, looked after their man. The men all worked, made a bunch of money, a bunch of average ass jobs and they were all millionaires in five to six years. So let me ask this other question while we're on this topic. Uh, that was a good question, by the way, Christian dynamic and, and Muslim dynamic. When you're saying there's a lot of ways to get there, you know, there's a religion called Baha'i. It's an element of, Christ, uh, of Muslim. Mm -hmm. Baha'i is like uh, how Mormonism to Christianity, and yep. Baha'i believes there's eight ways to go to heaven. That's yep. the philosophy of Baha'i. My sister, husband's family, they're all Baha'i, great people. But going back to this, okay, impact. Let's think impact. If a person's watching this content, most of the people that are watching this, a portion is going to be those that are haters, that just want to find, like, poke at the argument to find, you see, I told you, see, I told you, fine. But a lot of people that are also watching this, they're probably wanting to make impact. They want their life to have meaning behind it. That's who's watching this show today, right? Okay. So, I can't be a president, but I want to make impact. I being anybody that's watching this. Because Putin says eight years, another, another guy comes, or the guy with the briefcase shows up, okay, cool. Well, if you were in the States and you're saying president wouldn't be how to make an impact, but let's say there is a kid who's 20 years old, 18 years old, 25 years old, has so much drive, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Ambition at the highest level. Who do you think has the biggest influence to make positive change, like real change? Is it the person with the money? Is it the person with the biggest mic? Is it the person that goes into politics? What is the best way to have the biggest impact? Yeah, so I think the world has always only ever been a battle for influence. Even if you look at the current battlefield, Ukraine is next door, it's five hours drive away. The battle in Ukraine is not just about tanks and trenches and grenades, it's a battle for influence. Who influences the people within this territory? Who is in charge of the thinking the language, the mindset of people within this geographical area. Every single battle, every single pitched battle, every single argument, every single debate has always been a battle for influence. If you have influence, you're an extremely powerful pe person. All of us here are some of the most powerful people in the world. How many millions of people listen to us? We have massive influence. And I think you can have influence at the ground level. You don't have to be a famous podcaster or famously well-known to have influence. I would argue that those Romanian grandmas who gave me my food will remember me for the rest of their lives. I would like to believe I gave a positive influence and a positive impact on their lives for the rest of their life. I believe if you go through life and you're genuinely a good person, you try your best to be good to people and you're honest and you shake hands and you don't lie and you're on time and you work hard and you're good to everyone who's good to you, I think you'll have a massive influence. And I also believe, I truly believe that God is extremely giving. There's the saying, goes around, comes around. Completely true. But I would say it comes from God. God is keeping an eye on you and he's paying attention to you and he knows the kind of person you are and the kind of things you do. And I don't believe if you're actually genuinely a good person all of the time that you're not going to get some good will back to you. Look at my scenario. If I was being a piece of shit for years with all these chicks, I'd be in jail. I'd be in jail. I could have never seen this coming. But the fact that I was nice, paid their taxi home, bought them food, looked after them, are you okay? I know we broke up, I'm sorry, I know it hurts, I just did it, I was nice about all of it, here I am, I'm fine. And so I could have never seen this matrix attack coming. It's amazing how what goes around comes around. It's truly amazing. If you're good to people, if you're generous to people, if you're helpful to people, you'd be amazed how much influence you can build up. 
I say this to people all the time. I don't think if you're a hardworking person who is honest, who shakes hands, who tries to learn, who does what they're supposed to do, who has a good heart, that you're truly, really not going to be able to get what you want. I think the universe is absolutely and utterly giving. When I see somebody who says they want something and they don't have it, I don't even think they truly even want it. You can have anything you want in the world. When a guy goes, I want a six pack, then why ain't you got one? If you wanted it, you'd have it. You'd like it. There's a bunch of things I'd like that I don't have, but I don't want them. Everything I've ever wanted, I've got. I've never wanted something and not had it. We all know what we're talking about here. There's things we'd like. I'd like to be able to figure skate. Not enough to go learn to figure skate. It's but, a weird look if you figure out, although that other guy <laughs> dancing like the way you dance is doing a pretty the good bottom job. G. Bottom G, yeah. You've seen this guy? He can figure skate. That but, guy kills the dance moves, Yeah, he's good. Way. But you're doppelganger. But if you truly want something, you're going to yeah. absolutely not have it. So when it comes down to influence, I think you start at the, at the base level, at the grassroots level. What if, I, what if this guy's got, like, you know, for example, like, you know how um, when you were 20, yeah. were you this driven? Oh, absolutely. I okay, just, so when you're 20, who did you look at and say, I can do it as good as him, if not better? My coach, because I wanted to fight, and he used to kick, he used to beat me badly. Everyone used to beat me up when I was young, and I wanted to be the best, so I used to go into the fight Okay, how about communication? Who'd you look at? Were you always a good communicator? I can see you being a great communicator since you were 14 years old. Am I, am I pretty? Sp I was pretty good, yeah. Okay, who did you look at and say, that guy's good, but I think I can you know, do it better? That's a good question, and I think that you know what I'm asking. I right? know what you're asking. I, I don't know if there's one particular person I took nuances from because when you're a great communicator, you know how to be serious and you know how to make people sad and angry and you also know how to be, make people laugh. There's different people who can do lots of different things. So who things. was that? Was it somebody that was multifaceted like that? I, I think it was a lot of different people. And I also think that... Did you pull from comedy as well or I no? I certainly did, but I was also extremely self-critical. I think that's where a lot of it came, comes from. I'll watch, I'll watch this podcast back 15 times. I will notice every single time I made a mistake. Just then I said, I'll watch twice. That was a mistake. I will watch this back 15 times and I'll identify every single error. I have uh, an email list and I sign up and I get words of the day. I get five or six new words a day, which I try my very best to memorize. It's harder than you think to memorize five words a day, but I always try to make sure I have the most interesting vernacular I can possibly have, a wide vocabulary. It's gonna be very specific with my points. The reason I actually did that, my, my, I keep talking about my dad, but. He, he taught, he, I'm his son. I have the same name, Emory Andrew Tate III. He was Emory Andrew Tate II. My father was a linguist for the CIA. He spoke Russian and German and Spanish and English. And uh, I think I've told this before. Back then, when they needed someone who spoke Russian, they would take a Native American and teach them Russian. Nowadays, we have a bunch of Russian-speaking allies. You can go to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. They're all NATO and just get a Russian speaker. Back then, they taught my dad Russian, and he held the Air Force record for the fastest assimilation of a foreign language. When he died, a guy sent me an email, sent me a message saying, you don't know who I am, but I worked with your father in the Air Force, and he had the fastest assimilation. He learned Russian in two weeks. Crazy. And I remember saying to my dad, will you teach me Russian? He said, boy, you don't even know English. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you don't even know English. And, at the t and, and once he sat me down with the dictionary, I was like, you're right. I don't even know English. That's why even, I've lived in Romania seven years. People say, why don't you speak Romanian? Because I don't know English yet. I need to finish the first job before I learn the second. I don't know English. There's a bunch of words I don't know. I can't speak how he spoke. So I don't have time for a second language. Yeah. Also, another thing I found really interesting, Putin speaks English. Have you ever heard him speak English? No. Because if you want to speak to Putin, you speak to him in his language. You speak to me in Russian, and I reply to you in Russian to you. I cannot be misunderstood or misconstrued. I don't make a fool of myself. You can't get me on some vernacular trick. I speak my language, and I also prefer that also. I speak English. That's what I speak. If you want to speak to me, you speak to me in my language, so I will win the debate always. Who do you look up to outside of your dad? I look up to lots of people. I'm talking specifically younger age, not today. I'm talking 16, 20, 25, that, that age. Not today. It's a good question. Because I always believed in trying to take the best parts of individual people and then amalgamate them. And I know you want a name and I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I would look at people who I didn't even respect, but they'd have one particular thing about them. I thought that's good. It could be somebody I didn't even like, but he dressed well. I think you just have to be perspicacious and look at people and there's something you can learn from absolutely everybody and just try and adapt it all. I'm not saying everybody should be clones of me for everyone's individual, right? But there might be some things about me they find inspiring that they may adapt and take on board and then they'll find some things from other people. But learning to speak is something I very well, I understood from a very young age how important that would be. That's a superpower. Okay, so let me go back to the question I was asking where I'm trying to go with this. 
So I asked the question, I said, imagine the 20 year old that's watching this, yeah. that's saying, no Tate, don't give me the answer for, I can, anybody can create, you know, yeah. con contribute to society. I'm not that guy, talk to me like I'm one in a million. Talk okay. to me like I'm one cool. in a million. So if I'm willing to give yeah. 20 years, 30 years of my life to yeah. one way to go up to make true positive impact yeah. in America, my country, yeah. in the world, yeah. What, what should, don't talk to me like everybody else. Okay. What the standards, what should I do? What Absolutely. angle should I do? Okay, so first things first, you need to be worthy of respect. And you're gonna be worthy of respect through having things which are difficult to acquire. So first things first, the basic things, you need to be very focused on trying to make money because people listen to you when you have money. They just do. Secondly, you need to be in fantastic physical condition because when you're in fantastic physical condition, it cannot be bought. It must be earned. And people know that. When you're in, I, mean, I don't know about you, if someone walked in to sell me something and they were obese, I would not trust them the same as if they were in fantastic physical shape. Because I'd say, I don't think you have dedication and heart. I don't think there's something about you that I just wouldn't trust you the same. So fantastic physical condition and money is, is the first thing. The second thing, whatever your ideas are, you need to learn how to communicate them. Speaking is a superpower in and of itself. You need to become a fantastic communicator. You need to be comfortable in all realms of communication. You need to be persuasive. You need to be comfortable arguing. You need to be good at debating. There's a lot of people out there in the world who have ideas that they can't even project into somebody else's mind. How are you going to rule the world with that? How are you going to get your ideas out there and make an influence if you can't make other people understand exactly what you think? That's the first thing. Second thing, once they understand exactly what you think, you need to make them agree with what you think. These are two different skills. Must be practiced and must be learned. If you're 20 years old and you want to change the world, you need to be having endless debates. Endless. Without resorting to name calling. Not on Twitter like a dummy. In person. And you need to come across in a way that people agree with you. We can go back quickly and talk about the red pill. The difference between me when I talk to girls on these panel shows and every other guy when they talk to girls on these panel shows is when I'm done, all the girls want me. Watch them. Watch the shows. I say the same thing and by the end the chicks are in love with me as opposed to saying the same thing and the chicks thinking I'm a dickhead. That's the difference. I project my ideas and I make them agree with my ideas to a point where they're like texting me afterwards. I'm not saying anything different, it's how I'm communicating it. Some, you can catch more flies with honey than, than hurting people sometimes. So you need to be good at everything. You need to have a Swiss army knife of tools. I know when to be intimidating or aggressive. I know when to come across as obtuse. I know when to come across as exceptionally open-minded and easy to understand. I know when to come across as understanding. I know all these things. This all has to be practiced. And a lot of it is, yeah, communication. I would say, if you're going to say to a 20-year-old who's truly exceptional and driven, I'd say you need to become a master communicator. Because once you can do that, you can do anything. And that fixes all the other problems, right? We talk about making money. If you're a master communicator, you do fantastic yeah. in sales. Yeah. You'll kill sales. Yep. You'll absolutely destroy sales if you're a master communicator. Not many people know this, but I used to sell windows. You know the old school knock on the door? Window sales. I did window sales for two or three years. And I'd say this is one of the hardest jobs you could possibly do. And I would always recommend a young man, if he has some time to waste, to go sell windows. <laughs> and the reason, it's fantastic, because I'll tell you why. It's the hardest one to sell, because one, nobody wants them. Two, they don't know who you are. And three, even if you convince them that they need windows, after them not knowing who you are, then they go to all your competitors and then it becomes a price war. <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's the hardest sales job. If you're selling a Lambo, at least they want the Lambo, right? Nobody wants glass and plastic. They already have windows. So you gotta find a way to sell them these windows. How do you do that? And that's where all this master communication comes in. And it's so many subtle little things. Being a good salesman is not necessarily being a liar. It's not being a trickster. It's just understanding what's gonna make the person believe and understand what you say. If I walked in and said, would you like new windows? And they essentially said, no, we don't need new windows. Our windows look fine. I would say, but what about the security aspect while looking at their three-year-old child? And they sit there and go, ah, oh, what do you mean security aspect? And then I talk about how we had the lock 5,000 and their locks are easy to break as if glass isn't glass, it's all the same anyway. And you'd end up selling the windows. You have to find the triggers in people. There's another thing people don't understand about me and my message. Sometimes I sit here and I say things that piss people off because that's how you trigger people to make action. I have often written emails or done videos, to, especially to men when I want to help men, to piss them off. You're a loser. You're a dumbass. Andrew, why you mean? Because you're not going to go to the gym unless I tell you you're a fucking loser. And you are a loser and I'm not lying to you. You are a loser. The emotional trigger you need to get up off that chair is the fact that you're not important, nobody cares who you are, any girl you're ever in love with I could take, and you're insignificant. And when you die, nobody's interested. That's your fault. You could have been something else. You did that. You failed. It has to be done. You have to be a master communicator. And sometimes that involves also insulting people. 
It's all a, a massive tapestry, but to answer your question, for the 20-year-old, he needs to become a master at communicating. But also to be a master at communicating, to be a master at communicating, you also, you also need experiences worth talking about. You have to live a life. You need a degree of wisdom, and wisdom doesn't always come with age, it comes with life lived. I had a guy message me, this is a long time ago when I used to reply to my own emails, too big now, but he said, I don't have any stories, my life's boring. I said, bro, where do you live? He said, Madrid. I said, bro, ride the train from Madrid to St. Petersburg. Ride the train from Madrid to Vladivostok. Do the Trans-Siberian Railway. Cost you like 300 bucks. He goes, oh, but what if I get robbed? Exactly, that's exactly <laughs> the point. What if you get robbed? Now you have a story. Maybe you'll die, maybe you won't. But you have a story. Don't bring your watch. Have you got a Rolex? No, no one wants to rob you anyway. Don't worry about it. You're brokey, get on the train. There has to be that degree of risk to even have a story because when you have a story, then you can communicate the story. A lot, you can't be an empty vessel either. So when you say to the, uh, you're telling me how I build this 20 year old into a super soldier. Yeah, he has to be a master communicator, but he also has to do things which are risky. Risk has value intrinsically linked to it, intrinsically. This is why people, when you do risky things, people want to hear the story. Your coolest stories involve risk. Something went wrong. This could have happened. I almost this, I made it out. Without these risks, you haven't got it. So I would say to the 20 year old, do what I did, get in the cage, get in the ring. Knock someone out, get knocked out, train hard. Fighting will teach you everything you need to know about life. You'll learn everything about who you truly are. You'll learn if you're a coward or not. You'll learn everything about perseverance and hard work and dedication. Everything about being underappreciated. You'll learn everything about fear. you learn all of it. you learn everything about people. You win a fight, check your phone. Lose a fight, check your phone. you learn all about people. you learn all about them. you learn all about women. I learned so much about women through fighting. When I had a fight coming up and I was, I was weight drained and I had barely eaten in, in weeks and I'd lost all this weight and I had a, a world title fight and I'm fighting a guy who might kill me and she's complaining about the toilet seat. I learned all about women. You learn a lot about life through, the, through these difficult pr processes and paths. And there used to be for men like a rite of passage. In most societies you had to go through something to become a man from a boy to a man. But that thing was always difficult. It's always been difficult. Now you have to self-induce it, self-inflict it. But if you're gonna be a boy and never, never bring on that self-inflicted rite of passage, how are you gonna ever become a man? It's great feedback. Let me ask a question about this. I love what you said, uh, especially, number one, you're a wordsmith, you're a linguist, no doubt. I mean. I don't know English yet, bro. Yeah, I'm yeah. practicing. You're still working on I'm your practicing. English. You know, you've got, you've got the kickboxing belts all up over here. I would, I would argue, I've never seen you fight, but I would argue that your linguistic skills are better than your fighting skills. I'll let you judge I'll that. I'll take that. <clears throat> I totally agree with you that the way that you speak to a man is, a way, is way different than the way you talk to a woman. Yeah. You can tell a guy, get, you're a loser, get yeah. your fat ass in the gym, yeah. and a guy would be receptive to yeah. that. So I can't tell you how many men come up to me, come up to Pat, dude, what was Andrew Tate like? <laughs> what was Tate like? Tell me about Tate, tell me a Tate story. Dude, that guy's so cool, he's such a badass. Minect is an application which allows you to take a minute to connect with influencers from all around the world. My name is Andrew Tate and I'm available to speak directly to you on Minect. I'm no longer interested in just random chicks. I want a woman who I know would wait for me if I did 10 years. That's what I want. That's what I find interesting. That's what I'm in love with now. I can't be in love with a random chick. Also, once you get to a certain level of fame and influence, you're no longer winning the exchange. I feel like a lot of men like going out there and pulling girls because they feel like they won. Ha ha, look at this hot girl I got. Whereas if I go to the club and get a hot girl, oh, okay. Me, the famous millionaire, the most Googled man on earth, got a hot chick. Who, who really won here? Who, 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 who pulled it off? She did. She'll brag, or rat, or kiss and tell, or ask for handbag. Like she, what did I win? Sex? Who cares? It's uninteresting to me. I, I don't want a child with her. I don't want a family with her. I don't want a future with her. So why do I even want her at all? I'm, not, I'm, I'm really beyond all of that stuff. So now, it's kind of funny. In jail, I got thousands of love letters from women. Thousands. I got thousands of love letters from women in jail. Should we read them all? I read every single one. Yeah, but you have time. But yeah. You went through all of them. All of them. Got it. Thousands of love the letters. Craziest letter you got. What's the craziest letter you got? A lot of poems. Uh, one had drops of blood on it. She did a little cut. Uh, lots and lots of love letters. Lots of just saying that I'm the last man. They've been in love with me and they watch all my podcasts. And they were with, one of them said she was with her ex-boyfriend. He started watching me, then she started watching me, then she wanted me, not him, and got rid of him, and oh. all, all this craziness. But I didn't trust any of it. Is it real? Is it an agent? Is it a psyop? Who's she? Is she crazy? What if I sleep with her and she says I did something to her? What if 13 years later she contacts the BBC? Garbage. I, I don't, that would never happen, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't talk to any new chicks. 
Same as I don't have any new friends. I don't talk to any new chicks. That's no what new I, that's girls. What I, that's what I thought. Zero. So, so let, me, let me ask you. The idea of going through a lot of girls when you're younger, do you think a man needs to go through that or do you think that is a form of a weakness that holds you that you're a slave to it? Right. So that's a good question. And there's a fine line because there's arguments on both sides. However, I think in all scenarios and life experience is always going to be valuable. No matter what it is, you need to have experience. If you're inexperienced to anything, whether it's hunting, figure skating, girls, you're going to suffer. You so pointed you, at him. You're saying like insinuating people. Sorry. Figure skates, I know. We just, he told me figure skating and we, we made fun of it earlier. But I was technically Patrick. Oh, sorry. We're talking figure about figure skating. <laughs> you need experience, and experience is exceptionally important. Also, as a man, especially when you're younger, you get your heart broken a bunch of times. Some, some bigger, older, richer dude's going to take that chick. And you need to get you need to get used to that pain. So so okay. you need to get through it. So I do think it's a necessary part of being a man, but you don't want to be led by it. There has to become a point where you go, you know what, I'm versed enough. And also another thing I would like to say is the reason you need to sleep with not sleep with, but date lots of women when you're younger, so you have choices. Which def, what, define the two? Yeah. Which is more important, date or sleep, in your eyes? I feel like you don't really. I I think that sleeping with a woman, you learn more about them. It's a closer relationship. So I'd say probably sleep with. X amount, not crazy amounts, but I would say that, okay, let me give an example. If I go to the supermarket and pick up an apple and it's the only apple I've ever eaten, can I really say it's a good apple or a bad apple? It's the only apple I've ever tasted. It might be sour, it might be terrible, I don't know. Whereas if I try 10 apples, I can tell the differences between apples. I say, what's a good apple, what's a bad apple? I think you need that degree of experience because sometimes you'll be with a woman and go, yeah, she's great, but if you're not experienced enough, you realize she really isn't all that great and she actually treats you like a dickhead. Whereas if you've been with enough women, you can always reference back to that girl who actually was really good to you. And, and you'll probably mess it up because you're young and you're dumb. We've all done it. All of us have that girl we had when, who was perfect when we were young and we all ruined it because we're stupid. Who was but that if, person for you? Okay. And, and, Can't not, say but, names. But no, no, not names. I'm not asking for names. But, but I have mine as well. Yeah. But I'm like, you know, I feel like when I watch you and you're going through your, your for example, so... I don't know what kind of movies you like, yep. but there's movies where it's redemption or vengeance. Yep. Like, I don't know if you watch Gladiator, the 43rd minute, he walks up to the house, sees his wife, sees his kids, yep. like, oh my God, yep. I'm going to tear you yep. apart, yep. right? And you watch that over and over again, or Taken, or Man on Fire, mm -hmm. or some of these movies that are just putting that energy in you, right? Yep. So, girl that breaks your heart, and to produce the energy to say, Watch who I'm going to be in life. For the rest of your life, you're going to brag about the fact that you could have had me, yep. right? Yep. And then comes to a point where you're like, okay, there's not much more I can do. To, she's already knows yep. what she missed out on. Yep. Now what? Yep. But for me, go back to you. I'm curious. How bad of a breakup was it? How bad did she break your heart? Yeah. I and think, I know you're... you're, yeah. you're I think lots of men have gone through heartbreak. A, a lot of men have. And I wouldn't say that I've gone through any heartbreak, which is particularly worse than any other guy. What I will say is that I think heartbreak is one of the most fantastic motivator on the planet. When a lot of men message me and say they're heartbroken, I think that is the most fantastic mindset to be in to achieve things. Because there is that degree of revenge and there is that degree of vengeance. And that can only be achieved because through being so successful, so monumentally important that she can't forgive you. And also, you cannot even sleep, you can't even concentrate, like you, your, your whole mind's a mess. That's a perfect time to train. I, I know what you're saying. I don't think I've been through a particularly bad heartbreak, but I'm saying that- Who did she leave you for? Did she leave you for somebody I, where- No, I don't think, I don't think I've, I've had a particularly bad heartbreak. I only mention heartbreak all the time because I know it's a path every single young man goes through. I also think you're not a type of guy that would ever give credit to that person, to, if there was one. So I don't see you, saying that because it is a form of a victory over top G, which that's not gonna happen. Well, right? that's part of it, but then let's, let's analyze now, right? Any, there's no girl who I've ever been with in my life who can now turn on the internet without seeing my face. Sure. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> They have to all lie to their man and pretend they don't know me. Oh, I don't, I don't know him. Because if they go, I was with him for a few years, their whole relationship will probably break down because then he's going to get pissed off and insecure. So that, that to a degree, is a victory. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of fun. But no, I, wouldn't, I, I didn't have any... The reason I say heartbreak is because 
in the modern world, I don't think things were as bad when I was younger. I don't. I think women were more pure when I was younger. Even in these, when I was 20, it's only 16 short years. I think women were actually a lot purer before OnlyFans, before Instagram. The sexual marketplace wasn't globalized. Yeah. When I was 20, if there was a hot girl in the small town, she was the hot girl in the small town. Now she's the hot girl in the small town. She's also in Dubai and Korshaval. And it, it, the whole world's globalized. The competition's yep. globalized. Everything's changed. I didn't have a particularly hard time. The reason I say heartbreak is because 80% of the emails I get from men are about heartbreak. I think that most men, especially young men in the world today, are getting their hearts broken. And when you're saying who are they leaving for, they're leaving for the millionaire who hits them up on Instagram. It's hard. Is it, that what happened to you? That's not what happened to me. No. Okay. Got but, it. I, but I'm talking about the emails I get. You're a guy, you're in Nebraska, to high school sweetheart, she's a 10, everything's fine. She's in Court Cheval with a millionaire. Instagram. You had an I, argument I, one I, day. I, Boom. I, I'm trying to target you purely for one reason. Yep. Because a big part of my drive, yep. I've had drive always. I was a dreamer. I was the guy that was, you know, but at the same time, the drive for success came after a lot of pain. Of course. Coming right afterwards. So Absolutely. that's why I'm asking you a question. So when that happened to you, did you fear risk of loving somebody? Where it's kind of like, I'll get this close, but boom, I got to move on. No, 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 no. I got to move on. Did that happen or no? No, I wouldn't say that particularly happened. What, would, what did happen though, like I said earlier, is when you have experience with lots of different apples, you know what a good one and a bad one is. So when we say we all had that girl we messed up when we were young, if I found another girl with those qualities, I certainly wouldn't mess it up. You just need, you need experience to understand what you have to value it. If you don't have experience, you don't value what you have. So the original question is a really good one of whether men are, are chained and enslaved by their desires or whether they need to sleep with lots of women. I think in the modern world, you need experience and you need choices and you need options. Mm -hmm. But if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you're going to be the guy who's also out there in the club and sleeping with lots of girls, talking to lots of girls, there's going to be times you lose a girl that you don't want to lose. You can't be a coward about it. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. There's up and down, there's, there's rain and sunshine. You have to be that man who's gonna go through it all. And then when you've been through enough of it, yeah. like I have, like I said, if I find a beautiful girl now who's a 10 and deletes and doesn't want Instagram, that's worth more to me than a thousand stupid girls. Respect. Yeah, that's who I want. Yeah, I got you. For my safety, for you, my career, for my peace clear. of mind, for everything. You're clear on what you want today. Absolutely, because I know. I when, know you, when you played, you, you said there was a phase of my life that I kind of went through it, okay. Was that after the heartbreak? I would say, yeah, it was after, but I think that okay. was just, I, I, I don't know if that was deliberately driven by heartbreak. I think I was just younger and I had less serious motivations and I was less, and I wasn't as famous and I wasn't as rich and I was less interested in. So it's not just my current situation that makes me say this. I would say this to any man. If your woman wouldn't wait for you, if you went to jail for five years, why are you with her? Why? If she wouldn't wait, I know she's hot, I know she's funny, I know she makes you laugh, but if you can't sit in that jail cell with 100% certainty that she's not out with her friends, them in her ear, talking shit, watching Sex in the City, whatever it is, and her ending up with some other guy, why are you even buying her dinner? For what, sex? Like that loyalty to me is the only thing left that's valuable. When I'm interested and we're in jail, we're sitting there saying we have it so much better than most guys. Because most guys in jail, imagine you're a normal person, you go to jail. Who's feeding your family? Who's paying the rent? Who's feeding your kids? I said, Tristan, we're in jail and we're suffering, but everybody we love is good. I'm a man, I'm supposed to suffer. I'll sit here with the cockroaches. If that means all my kids eat, everyone I care about eats, my mother's fed, my mother has a house, roof over her head, everybody has everything they want. Only person suffering is me. I'll take that all day. Most men who go to jail can't say that. Another thing that gave me absolute peace of mind is the women who love me are waiting for me. Imagine you go to jail and you're completely heads over heels in love with a woman, but you know deep in your heart that she's out in the club and she's, she's stealable. You talk about, we talk about thoughts you can't get out of your head in jail. It's amazing how when you lose all access to electronics, how thoughts are amplified. Most of us sitting here, you've never been without a phone or without a laptop or without a computer for, for 93 days. You'd be amazed how loud you can think. You'd be amazed how vivid your mind is. I learned that. If you had the nagging thought in your head, I loved her, she cheated on me before, maybe she cheated again, she hasn't written me in three days, and then plus jail. That's why they're all crying. That's why all the men in there were sobbing. Their wives are either fucking someone else or the bills ain't paid. It's not just his situation, it's everything else. Yeah. So now if you're gonna say to me, what do I respect in a woman? I respect a woman who's gonna wait for me. I have no interest in a woman, oh, she's funny, she's cool, she's hot, don't care, don't care. Is she going to wait for me? And I also know, because of my experience, which ones would and which ones wouldn't.
I'm not stupid. Because they'll all say they would. They'll all say they'll wait because they're on the jet. But I know which ones are lying because enough women have lied to me. I've seen it. So you do need that experience. But once you have the experience, you start looking for completely other things. Quick story to almost validate your point about experience. Uh, I like the direction Pat was going with this about if you want relationships or sex with a woman. Um, quick anecdote. Your friend Myron, fresh and fit. Yep. We just did a big live event yep. three days ago. It was myself, Myron, fresh. We're sitting on a panel, yep. 20 women. Yep. And he goes, watch this. Masterclass, Andrew, masterclass. He asks all the women on the panel, um, average 25-year-old woman, you tell me the amount of sexual partners she's had. What? Yeah. The body count. And these women give a wide range of, oh, the three, 10, yeah. 15, 20. One girl said 100. Yeah. Numbers were crazy. Yeah. Goes down the list. Ask all you, okay, great. Ladies, show of hands. How many of you want a man with more sexual experience than yourself? Every single girl put their hand up. Yeah. And they said, yeah, I want a man with more experience yeah. than myself. Yeah. And the reason this came about was because Ben Shapiro reacted to a video yeah. of me questioning Myron. Yeah. All right, when should a man get married? And he basically gave a checklist. You need to make uh, 100 grand a year. Yeah. You need to have slept with 50 women. You yeah. need to have six to 12 months of savings. A checklist, checklist, yeah. checklist, checklist. And Ben Shapiro was like, that's disgusting. This is yeah. a guy that married the first person that he had sex with. Yeah. And it was incredible to see every woman validate everything that Mayan was saying and everything that you were saying about yeah. experience. Oh, women respect experience. In fact, I saw on a TV show, and this was like 10 years ago, and I have no idea what the show was, but it was a show about, it was on Channel 4 in the UK, and it was a show about sex, and da da da. 85% of virgin women would rather sleep with a man who'd already had sex than a virgin man. Wow. A virgin woman doesn't even want a man with the same level of experience. You're, you're respected for your level of sexual experience. And women are naturally demonized for their level of sexual experience. And even the ones in the West who pretend that's not true, the ones who are fully psyoped, wait till they see a girl they don't like. What's the first thing they call her? She's a hoe. Whore, slut. First insult out their mouth is she's promiscuous. So they know deep in their heart promiscuity you see is bad because they call each other promiscuous when they want to insult each other. Yeah. So yeah, you absolutely need that experience to make sure you don't get wrecked and psyoped. But now, and just in my current dating life, and it's good that this is on this podcast, so you know the girls can still email me. It's nice to read, but sorry. I don't trust any of you. I don't trust any of you. you I don't trust anybody new. I have no new friends, no new girlfriends. Absolutely no, I'm not interested in any of it because what the things I value now are not the things I value when I was younger. My life was very, very different, but I'm glad I had that experience now so I can see who, who is lying and who isn't. I can tell. I can just instantly tell if they would lie or not. So let me, let me, let me kind of get to the point of what I was trying to say. I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, uh, more on your side, I don't have a Ben Shapiro story. But I think what happens is, is there's also risk for men to fear uh, because that could happen to me, so therefore I will never risk getting into a relationship yep. because of X, Y, Z. So Chelsea Handler, yep. he brings her up, right? Our initial reaction was, look at her, you know, she's doing yep. this, she's doing that. So let me look up what her life was like. And Mario Aguilar says, hey Pat, did you know her life? I said, I have no idea what her life was. So she's nine years old, her brother at 22, who was her hero, her first love, her first, you know, like yeah. her second father, loves him. He's going mountain climbing. He says, Chelsea, can't wait to come back and see you. Great, goes mountain climbing, falls, dies. She's nine. Yeah. She comes back, she says, the most painful time of my life, right? So then when she needs her father to be there for her, he's gone, yeah. he's devastated. They had six kids, I believe. Mom and dad were still together. Yeah. So they're married and they were doing okay, car salesman making money. And then she says, till today, I may be successful, and she puts the act in the book, I'm still in a lot of pain. She was being interviewed by uh, Howard Stern. Yeah. Got emotional, was talking about this. Okay, so we can sit there and laugh about it, but for men, similar thing happens as well. When I was, the girl broke my heart, dude, I will never, ever give this risk to that. I think there's also, as influencers, we have to also make sure that men know Look, just look at the stuff that you did wrong. Completely. Look at the stuff on how you repositioned yourself in the wrong Completely. way. Right off the bat, being too much of a this, this, that. Now, just when you go in, like the way you said, I love when you said, what are you doing watching this show? We don't watch this in this house. Yeah. We watch this. Now impose and have the, earn the respect to be able to impose your beliefs in a way where you can coach and lead. You nailed it. Because what did I say earlier about this podcast? How many times am I going to watch it back? 15 times. Yeah, because people, I live in experience and I analyze the experience and I draw every lesson from that experience. If you're a man who has a heartbroken, a lot of them are so stupid 
that they may revert to the mindset that you've said. They may say, oh, I don't want to have my heart broken again, but they haven't sat there and said, why did this happen? You have to know the why to prevent it from happening. You have mm -hmm. to analyze the scenario and learn from it. One thing I'll say about women that's fantastic. One of the best things women are, are one of the things women are best at is they're a fantastic mirror. Women are a reflection. If you have any weakness inside of you, or if you have any downfalls as a person, a woman's gonna show you who they are. If you're too emotional, if you're too easy to get angry, she'll teach you that. She'll teach you that you can get angry too fast. Piss her off. If your dick's small, she'll tell you. <laughs> she'll, she'll tell you exactly what is wrong with you when she is mad. She'll sit there and say, you got a short leg and your haircut shit. <laughs> get a new haircut. I hate your ugly ass. They'll tell you exactly what is wrong with you. When you look at your bad or your previous relationships with women that went wrong, you can sit there and go, okay, this all went wrong. What has she taught me? She taught me that I'm emotionally affectable. She taught me that if she ignores me, she gets more attention than if she's nice to me. She taught me, you have to sit there and analyze all the lessons and you have to implement them. It's the same with absolutely everything. But women are a fantastic mirror. A lot of these guys who resort to that are men who don't have the self-reflection to sit and say, okay, why did this happen? As a man, you have to be accountable for absolutely everything. Every single thing that happens is your fault. I didn't go to jail because of Romania. I went to, when I was in jail, it was my fault. I, even though I don't believe it was just, even though I do not believe it was fair, even though I know I am innocent, it is my fault. Because I didn't have to become so influential. I did it. But it's also, it's also my fault when I'm on the jet and, and living my perfect life. I did that. I did the good, I did the bad. You made her leave you. You did. Whether you like it or not, you are the reason she became so cold. You are the reason she doesn't listen anymore. You are the reason she's so arrogant all 100%. of a sudden. You are. You may not have identified why yet, yep. but if you identify why, then you get into your next relationship healed and understanding what you did wrong and learn from it. That's what you have to do, but most of these yeah, men don't that. want the self-accountability. I love that. And they want to blame the women. Yep. You have to blame yourself. I know exactly now how to keep a woman happy. So I ain't got nothing to worry about. I've learned my lessons. I know exactly how to keep a woman happy. I know when to set a boundary, when to be nice. I know exactly what to do because I've self-analyzed. A lot of these red pill guys, they want to do exactly like you said, just run around and just bang chicks because they've never looked in the mirror and go, why do these chicks not want to just love me? <laughs> why am I a fuck up? You're not perfect. God is perfect. Nobody is perfect. You need to analyze yourself. If you fix those problems, I'll give you an example. Even when I first start getting rich, I was, I never worried about gold diggers because I can't be gold dug, but I was always a bit like weird about if a woman wants something expensive that I was always a bit like, not because I'm tight, but just like, oh, we haven't been together that long. Why does she want such an expensive bag? Da, da, da. And over time I learned they don't want the expensive bag because it's an expensive bag. It's because my life is now so expensive and so grand. When I'm doing hyper expensive things, if I buy a $5 million car, I look like a dummy if I won't buy a $500 bag. I look, I look frugal and frugality is a form of fear and it looks fearful. I could say no to a $500 bag when I had no money to the exact same girl. But when you have a certain amount of money, it's not that they're gold digging you. It's just that to you, it's nothing. And there's a degree of gesture to it. And I also learned over time that, you know, the best way to get no, new beautiful women is for them to see your ex and how well she was treated. They love that shit. They love it. When they see all your ex, when, cause women will do that. Women stalk me. When I had Instagram, they'd stalk me and they'd see my, the lifestyle my girl lived. And as soon as I was single, they were like, hey, woo, they want to turn. So I was like, you know, I actually get a larger ROI, just be Mr. Nice, cool. It's also helped me in my current situation. I've never been mean to anybody. Please call him, no, he was nice to me, bye. There's a lot you learn, but you have to self-reflect and learn and, and pay attention to the mirror. These men who are afraid of commitment are not blaming themselves like they should. Because I actually truly believe, and this is never gonna be, make the misogynistic supercut of the BBC, I actually truly believe that women in their hearts, unless they're completely corrupted by society, women just want to love and be loved and feel safe. That's what they want. They want a man that they can look at and they truly know he makes the decisions and I trust him to make the decisions and I love him for that and I respect him for that. That's what they truly want. When a woman starts turning on you, it's usually because she doesn't trust you for some reason. She doesn't trust your judgment. And that's not always cheating. It can be other things. Doesn't trust your judgment as a whole, right? If she starts to doubt your judgment, how can she truly love you? You're the protector, you're the provider.
So if a woman's gone cold on you, you have to sit there and go, okay, she doesn't trust my Great judgment. Feedback. She doesn't trust my judgment. Yep. What have I done that yep. made her doubt me? Did I get my sixth booster injection like a dummy? No wonder she doesn't want dick. Because I keep injecting myself with poison because I'm an idiot. It's not her fault. It's your fault. Every single time a woman leaves you as a man, it is your fault. Always. Even if a richer, more successful, more alpha man stole her from you, it's still your fault because you need to be like him. It's always 100% your fault. These men don't take accountability. It's 100% their fault. I got one last topic, unless if you got a follow-up. No, keep going. Okay, so last topic here. Phenomenal way to finish that up because I think sometimes the messaging from that community is, yeah, no, it's just everybody is this versus no, you got to take some accountability. Sorry, before you go on, yeah. but that's, that's a fantastic point because people say to me, can you turn a hoe into a housewife? And I say, listen, I wouldn't want to, but I bet I fucking could. There ain't a woman in a life who's going to cheat on me. With who? With who? With who? <laughs> who's she going to cheat on me with? Look at the guy in Starbucks? Mr. KFC? No! She's with the top G. She's got all the clout. She's with the boss. She's in the five star on the Italian Alps. She's on the Gulf Stream. She's in the Bugatti. Everyone's jealous of her. Who the fuck is she gonna cheat with? Nobody. There's not a girl alive I couldn't get loyalty from. Now, would I ever wanna do it? Probably not. I like the idea of exclusivity. But once you get to a certain level, yeah. If you're that guy, you're that guy. Let me ask you a question. There's somebody that's single right now. You think you can turn her to be an exclusive to you? Her name is Kim Kardashian. <laughs> how, about, how about, I mean, she's, she's watching. You I know, wouldn't but... do that to Yeezy. I wouldn't do it to her. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't do it to her. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, he's sorry. married now. No, but, but you know what? This is actually another But point. by the way, I love what you just said right now. But I wouldn't. I love what you just said right now. We, we were having a conversation the other day uh, about the, the relationship with men, how it's supposed to be the boy, the, the man yeah. relationship. Just a fact, like I had a, a friend of mine, her ex, yeah. dropped it gorgeous. Yeah. Like when I tell you dropped it, I mean dropped it gorgeous. And everybody loved her. Yeah. And I, I could look at her and say, you're dying. Yeah. Her and her boyfriend broke up. Three years they were together. I get out. All she wants to do is talk to me. We're hanging out. Hey, how about this? How about that? I said, listen, there's no way you and I could ever be together. Yeah. No way. Because yeah. you dated the guy. That was my best friend. Yep. I like you a lot. You're beautiful. You're going to find somebody. It's just not going to be here. 100%. And she went a different direction. But that, that right there is the values that must be taught. 100%. Because I think the same way we have to teach the values of what it is to be running mates. Men, yep. hey, man, if you're in my circle, that's the expectation. Yep. But it's the same way that you have to also you know, lead your woman to say, if this is going to be a relationship, here's the standard as well. 100%. And... and, and you know what, maybe I'm getting a little bit sentimental in my old age. Here we but, go. But I am. Let's say I meet a girl, right? And she's 23, 24. And she's been with a guy for six or seven years. And he loves her with all his heart. And she, she's talking to me. Part of me feels bad. I'm like, this is just like shooting fish in a barrel. This isn't even fair. This guy's going to be heartbroken, man. He's going to be devastated when he realizes she's with me. He's going he's gonna, to, it's going to hurt him. Because he's going to know there is no chance at all. No matter what he types in that text, it's done. And I actually feel bad. And I'll say to chicks, you know what? If you break up with him properly, leave it a while. I'm getting to that point now where I'll be like, not while you're still, you're still kind of talking to him, no. I feel bad. It's too easy. I feel bad. So when I say I wouldn't do it to Kanye, I actually mean that. Pussy is not worth me. Her, I don't even know him. But just like he loved her a lot. I'd feel bad. I just couldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. I can't showing a soft side, Tate. I, 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 just would, I just wouldn't do it. But it's also an interesting point yeah. you say about friends. That's super yeah. interesting. I could leave any of my girls with my friends for 20 years in a jail cell, and they would never touch her. I know it. I know it. And I do believe that birds of a feather flock together. And when I've had a lot of guys email me as well, and they say, hey, man, uh, my friend slept with my girlfriend. Uh, you know, I don't know what to do about it. And I will say, that's because you're a bitch. You're a bitch. And I'll tell you why you're a bitch, because you're rolling with bitches, which means you must be one. Because I'll tell you what, none of my friends, nobody on my team would ever, ever do that to me, ever. If my, me and my girl split up, she is gone, she is done. They would never touch her in a million years, because that's the quality of man I roll with, because that's the quality of man I am. You become a better man, you'll get better friends, and this shit won't happen to you. If your own friends are snaking you for pussy, you're probably the kind of guy who snakes your own friends for pussy, so I blame you. It's your fault. You know, I saw a clip the other day. You know who Shannon Sharp is? Shannon of course. Sharp. I saw a clip from uh, Shannon Sharp the other day. He said uh, uh, he found the love of his life. He, he, she was married. He paid for her to get a divorce from him because she knew that was, he knew that was his. 
That's a such a weird angle. I don't know if you heard what I just said. Yep. So you're married. Oh, you're mine. I'm going to pay you to go divorce your guy to be with me. What do you think is going to happen later on to you when another opportunity arises? But again, social media is so open with influence that the, a, a boy or a man at the wrong time can see a message like that thinking that's what it is to be a man. And as a person that's got a lot of influence, some of these things need to be unpacked. Let's go to the last message here. Sure. So uh, uh, Mel Gibson just recently announced that he's doing a four-part documentary on the $32 billion pedophilia business. I don't know if you saw this or not. I did, yeah. This just came out yesterday. And we talked about BBC earlier, yeah. you know, and BBC and Philip Schofield and ITV and all these guys. Yeah. And they had another guy back in the days, Jimmy uh, uh, Savile, Savile yeah. you know, who yeah. there's a documentary on him. That guy's darker than a lot of these guys. And they knew and they kept him for a long time. And, Stories have been out there. Woody Allen, we talked about Woody Allen, we talked about a lot of different guys, and Woody Allen married the stepdaughter yeah. when she was yeah. five, yeah. six, seven years Something old, weird. ends up marrying her and says, hey, you know, he's one of the greatest such and such of all time. Um, and, and that whole industry of what it's doing. Some will say, well, you know, it's not really as real as people think it is. Some will say it is. Some will say, well, this whole movement is because of, because of that, you know, uh, you, LGBTQ, there's, that's taking place with kids, and it's a next step of what we're going to next. What are your thoughts with the, the topic of pedophilia? Yeah, okay. First thing, I would never kill myself. That's the first thing. Oh, Jesus. Right. I'm giving you easy questions. No, it's a soft topic. It's not like no, a heavy it's, topic. No, but it's true, but that's the final line of morality they're trying to pierce. Like I said, I have no problem with gay people. And then we talked about LGBTQ and how they're trying to mix it all together and take people who are on the extreme end of the spectrum with people who live fairly normal lives. You can be a gay person. This is another thing I want to make clear. You can be a gay person and, and live a very normal life. You can also be a gay person and be a degenerate. Deciding to get naked in front of children has nothing to do with your sexual orientation. That's just the fact that you're a degenerate person. It doesn't matter if you sleep with a man or a woman. The fact that you want to go and walk around naked in front of kids is degenerate behavior, regardless of sexual orientation. It has nothing to do with it. It's only accepted if you're a homosexual. If you're a heterosexual, it's a crime. For some reason, if it's a homosexual, it's not a crime, but it's the same act, and it's degenerate. It's the final line. The final line is children. It's the final line of sexual morality that they're trying to attack. They've attacked every other line. It's the final line they're trying to pierce. And I think a lot of this pedophilia comes down to, I think a lot of it comes down to control. So yeah, what Mel Gibson is doing is super interesting. It's super interesting that he's attacking the most liberal establishment on the planet. Super interesting that he's attacking Hollywood, which is obviously the heart of the liberal propaganda machine. And he's saying they're the worst people on earth. And I sit and say, well, if you take these people outside of Hollywood, would they matter? This is a really interesting point. You can actually, actually apply this to nearly any job. If you took you away from your sales job or took me away from my role or you away from, let's say you had a sales job, a specific company, you would still be a good communicator. You'd still know how to speak. You'd still have charisma. You'd still be a man of status. You'd still know how to walk. You still have a presence. You still, you still know how to behave, right? There are certain people in certain establishments where if you strip them of their title, they're nothing. If you took Harvey Weinstein away, or Weinstein, whatever his name is, away from Hollywood, he's just a fat, old, ugly dork. That's all he is. He's only something because of Hollywood. Outside of that, he's nothing. These are the people who end up using their influence in whatever sphere they're in to do negative things because outside of it, they ain't shit. If you're a real G, if you're a real man, if I was in Hollywood, I was a real man, I wouldn't have to use Hollywood to get girls, I'm fine. I think a lot of this stuff is run, I think a lot of these people who are doing these things are just not very good or very impressive people. I don't, oh yeah, you may be a big shot in Hollywood. Delete that from your resume, who are you? Oh, you ain't shit. Sit down and talk to these people. What have you even done with your life? You ain't shit. You made it to the top of Hollywood by what? Who even knows how you got there? Wink, wink. You got there through whatever. So I think that's what a lot of this stuff is. And going back to everything we've been saying so far, Andrew, how do you solve pedophilia? I think if a man has a healthy sexual relationship with women and has options and feels respected by women and enjoys the company of women and women like him and admire him and look up to him, he will have no desire to go down the route of sexual perversion and chase children. I don't think he ever would. Why would he? Right? What my cousin said was only a joke, but sometimes there's a degree of truth in the humor. He's a young, good-looking black guy on the football team. He gets girls. Why, why would he do this dumb shit? When you see some fat, overweight video game loser, they're the yeah. ones on the, on the TV yeah. doing it. So once again, like nearly any problem on earth, 
whether it's pedophilia, whether it's school shooting, whether it's men's mental health, whether it's women's mental health, whether it's female promiscuity, whether no matter what it is, whether it's crime, no matter what it is, how do you fix the problem? By building men of caliber, by building men of capability and status and honor and dignity, and by building men of ability to be good standing citizens who are respected by their peers. All of it comes back to improving men, all of it. Every single problem you can possibly name, even pedophilia, comes back to building strong men of capability who are respected. That's all, it's the baseline of humanity. Men always has been the baseline of humanity. And that's why nearly every problem we can name, whether it's pedophilia, whether it's anything else, school shooting, whatever, all of them are in a direct negative correlation with masculinity. As masculinity plummets, all this garbage is going up through the roof. Is that a coincidence? Absolutely not really not. It's, it's, you can literally see it with a graph and you can see it happening. Saving the way men think and operate, growing a new generation of men who understand they have duty to themselves, their last name and God, literally saves the world. All of it. And I'm telling you the reason this Hollywood garbage happens is because outside of Hollywood, none of them people are mildly impressive in any regard. And that's why they have to do the disgusting, heinous things they do. And that's why they're gonna attack me and pretend I'm a fucking predator and that I'm the bad guy, and that I'm dangerous to women, when truly people like Philip Schofield are the ones who are doing it, but they're part of the club. And that's what actually upsets me truthfully. I'm a difficult man to affect, and I understand that I'm in the middle of a war here, and I understand that one way or another, with God on my side, I will win. But it is extremely frustrating to have people who commit X crime with impunity accuse you of X crime. That's a very uniquely annoying scenario. When somebody who does something themselves accuses you of it when you're innocent. Not allegedly. They've been caught. caught. And they accuse you of it. Big and, difference. And then they sit there yeah. and go, it's a terrible thing to do. You do it. All of these liberals and uh, elites attacking me do it. And I don't. And I'm the one who's sitting in a fucking dungeon for it? It's insane. What should be the punishment for that? I think attacking innocence is the most heinous thing you can possibly do. Did you hear what DeSantis announced? No. Death penalty for that. Well, I think absolutely. They're, they're innocent. Attacking innocence is the biggest act of cowardice. It's cowardice. Attacking innocence is the biggest possible act of cowardice. Even, you don't shoot an unarmed man. Even in war, there's the Geneva Convention. There's supposed to be a degree of rule. Someone can't defend themselves. There's no need to hurt them. These people can't defend themselves. Attacking innocence is the most heinous of all crimes. And children are the absolutely most innocent thing on the planet. And I'd like to think that I'm rational enough that not much would drive me to murder, but I know it would happen if someone hurt my children. Should they be castrated? I, I think they should face an extremely heinous punishment. Now, the death penalty is fantastic. I also think, from what I've just been through, and it was only three short months, I think a nice long life of solitary confinement would do just fine. I, I really truly believe it. And I truly believe that we need to make that clear to the world. But the problem is the world we're living in, the people who are in charge of the world, have no, no obligation or no intention of stopping what's happening. They want to accelerate what's happening. That's what's scary. Because they could put punishments in place would genuinely stop this shit. And I don't think they are. In fact, they're promoting this shit and trying to say that you're born that way. Because when you're born that way, once again, you have no control. It's not your fault. It's not your fault you touched that kid. You were born that way. Not your fault you're fat. You were born right. that way. Not your fault you're a school shooter. You were born that way. This is why I have a problem with psychologists. Every single time you ask them anything, it's not your fault. It's something else's fault or someone else's fault. And I don't accept that. I accept absolute and utter ruthless personal accountability. Absolutely everything is my fault. Every action I undertake is completely my fault. If I do something wrong, it is my fault and I should be punished for it. Me. And that should be implied on every single other man on the planet. And the second we start doing that, dumb shit might stop. This is a powerful message. We're at the end of it, so if you got yeah. anything. Well, this is going to be more of a lighthearted question to end a, a, on a lighter note. But sure. it, but it, are you going to ask about who's a better actor, Al Pacino or Robert De Niro? Actually, a real that's question. That's your question. So yeah. I got a question. Do you, do you do you like both actors, One Pacino or De Niro? De Niro hates Trump, right? Yeah. Pacino's they both. Do. <laughs> they both. Do. <laughs> they both. Do. Oh, they both do. Yeah. Oh, fucking hell. So now you got to go on their merit. Uh oh. I don't know. Then they're both. Uh both on the wrong team. Scarface or Goodfellas? Yeah. So this is actually a funny question, lighthearted question, but it is about your legacy. Sure. I don't know if there's anybody in the world, when I say a country, oh, I'm going to this country, they say, well, you must be going to see Tate. Yeah. If I, I told my mom, we're not supposed to talk about this, yeah. hey, mom, I'm going to Romania, are you going to see Andrew Tate? Yeah. If I told that, hey, anybody, I'm going to see 
going to Romania, they're going to say, oh, you're going to go see Tate. Yeah. That's how synonymous you are with Romania. Yeah. The irony is that Romania is the country that's locked you up. There's one other person that's associated with the country. If I say the country, you know the name, they're not even a real person. And that person is from the country of Kazakhstan. Yeah, Borat. Borat. Yeah. You, I say Kazakhstan, you think of Borat. Yeah. Ironically, in a twist of fate, in 2006 when the movie Borat came out, they actually banned the movie. Yeah. They didn't want the people of Kazakhstan to yeah. see the movie. Yeah. Because it was uh, insulting. A great insult for yeah. the people of Kazakhstan. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, in 2020, after COVID, it became a global brand, Kazakhstan. Yeah. The, the tourism board um, basically created ads and embraced the, the moniker Kazakhstan, very nice. <laughs> as a way to drive tourism wow. to Kazakhstan. So in a twist of fate, they banned the movie. Yeah. 15 years later, they're embracing Borat. Yeah. So my question to you is, when you're innocent yeah. and you're scot-free, yeah. what will Romania do to make amends for what's happened to you? Will it be Romania? <laughs> what color is your Bugatti? Yeah. <laughs> what are they gonna say? That's a really good question because I, I, I love this country. I chose to live here. I think that they have done themselves a massive disservice, but I don't think it's Romanians as a whole. 99.9% .9 of Romanians I interact with apologize to me. Every Romanian I see says sorry. Even the police officers who come and check my house arrest apologize to me. There's a select few Romanians who have done irreparable damage to this country, and they're gonna have to deal with the consequences of that if they have a conscience at all. Most Romanians understand exactly what's happening and have apologized to me and are good people. I think I did a lot for this country in terms of tourism. I don't think it was mentioned much before me. Yes. And truthfully, it is a safe place and it is a beautiful place and you can carve a good life here. But I think they've certainly scared away a lot of high net worth individuals from ever moving here because they will seize all of their things and throw you in a jail cell. So we'll have to see how they try and recover from the mess they've made and mm -hmm. if the few people who have done this, and it's a small group, are ever gonna be held responsible. And if the country of Romania is mature enough, they will understand that it's a very small group of people who have made a very big mess. Last question. What source of power do you get from this? This is, a, this is actually a mudra from power, a mudra for power. I think it's, I'm not sure which yoga or Hindu or something it's from, it is a mudra from power, but my father used to sit and play chess like this. This is how he played chess. So I stole it. I stole it when I would be losing chess games in chess tournaments when I was a kid. I was like, shit, I'm losing. I need power. Shit, let me do like dad. Ah. <laughs> sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. But um, cool. I just adopted it because it was his hand symbol, so I just copied it. And I, there's a lot of theories online that, you know, it's a cultist this and a cultist that. I let the conspiracy theories run, but it's far more simple than that. There's lots of pictures of my dad doing it, and I copied it. That's all it is. Respect. So again, five hours felt like five minutes, just like last time. I can't tell you how many people last time said, Glad you, came, bro. you know, people wanted to watch every second of it. Thank you. This was great. And uh, we got a couple of gifts we want to give you. The audience that's watching this, there's a couple of things we want to do for you. We want the world to see this interview. And a lot of you guys will be part of history. Five of these hats, Future Looks Bright, will be signed by Tate. And on Twitter, we will pick uh, anybody that posts the interview there with hashtag Tate PBD for the interview when we release this. Five of you are gonna get these hats sent over to you for you to pick them up. And aside from that, I got a gift for you as well. Amazing. Let's start off with the first one. The first one is a Bible, okay? Okay. Now, whatever you choose to do with this, whether you give it to uh, Tristan or you keep it, yep. this is a special Bible because it's from 1870. Wow. Okay, this is not a newer Bible. It's 1870. We wanted to give you a, a gift that would have a lot of meaning behind it. We had to go look for this. Brandon worked very hard to find this. We finally found it. So this is a gift from us to you. Brother, I and absolutely love things like this. Thank you very much. And yeah. one of our uh, vice presidents in our company, Haz uh, Bozi, who is a Muslim himself, but yeah. we love this guy, respectable leader. Yeah. His family, we were calling around to get a high quality uh, Quran with a lot of meaning behind it. Yeah. The Quran that his mom passed down to them Wow. is the one he gave to us for us to give to you. Can we look for this all over the place? Brother, thank you so, so this much. is a gift to you as well. We know this is important to you. If you open wow. it up with the presentation in it, I hope you appreciate that. Um, How do I, here I think it's right there. So this is something that's been passed from family to family to family. It's incredible. We hope you appreciate that too. And then the last one is a book I read uh, years ago by a guy that's an interesting guy, C.S. Lewis. It's one of the best books I've read, Mere Christianity. If you've never read it, he's an interesting guy, Oxford professor who went from being an atheist 
to all of a sudden believing in God and his transition to it, it's wild. If you've never read it, highly recommend you reading that. I think you will enjoy it. This is incredible. I'm truly humbled. And uh, yeah, if they send me back, I have plenty to read. I'll take them with me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Plenty of reading to do once again, brother. Really enjoy this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minect is an application which allows you to take a minute to connect with influencers from all around the world. My name is Andrew Tate, and I'm available to speak directly to you on Minect.